Honourable members, the Speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. The Honourable Member for Fairfax. Mr. Speaker, I ask leave of the House to present the Finance Minute on Report 333 of the Joint uh, Committee of Public Accounts. Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Fairfax. I present the Finance Minute on Report 333 of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts, the sale of OSAP. I ask uh, leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with Leonard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. <coughs> I table uh, today, Mr Speaker, a Department of Finance minute arising from the Committee's Report 333, the sale of OSAT. The Committee's report stemmed from an audit report into the sale and contained four recommendations. These recommendations were aimed at ensuring and uh, appropriate mechanisms are in place to monitor the performance of obligations arising from the OSAT sale in the years leading up to the uh, termination of the telecommunications duopoly in 1997 and to draw lessons from the sale process to develop more effective procedures and controls for the benefit of future sales of government assets and business enterprises. I believe the committee's recommendations have made a valuable contribution in these areas and it is pleasing, pleasing to note the generally positive responses contained within the Finance Minute. I commend the Minute to the House. Clark. Government business, order of the day number one, telecommunications carrier licence fees amendment bill, motion for second reading. Honourable Minister for Consumer Affairs. Mr Speaker, I move that this bill now be read a second time. The purpose of this bill is to enable the telecommunications standardisation component of Australia's contribution to the International Telecommunication Union ITU, to be recovered through carrier licence fees payable by telecommunications carriers from 1 July 1995. The ITU is a United Nations specialised agency which is concerned with international cooperation in the use of telecommunications and the radio frequency spectrum. It establishes agreements and recommended world standards for telecommunications and radio communication services. Currently, telecommunications licence fees only recover the public interest regulatory costs incurred by the Australian Telecommunications Authority Austel, and the total fees payable by the carriers must not exceed the appropriation provided to Austel for the previous financial year. Carrier licence fees are payable on 1 July 1995. Inclusion of the ITU contribution in carrier licence fees is in addition to Austel's appropriations and will exceed the amount able to be collected under the current legislation. An amendment to the Telecommunications Carrier Licence Fees Act 1991 is therefore necessary to enable the full recovery of the telecommunications standardisation component of the ITU contribution from carriers from 1 July 1995. Australia's ITU contribution for a given calendar year is paid prior to the commencement of that year. The amount of the ITU contribution is likely to change every year. The amount to be recovered from carriers for telecommunications carriers for telecommunications sector activity will depend upon the level of the total ITU contribution, which is set in Swiss francs and is subject to exchange rate variation, and the share ascribed to the telecommunications standardisation sector of ITU activity. The bill provides for an amount to be determined under the regulations as a proportion of the Commonwealth's contribution to the total budget of the ITU for a calendar year that is attributable to matters relating to telecommunication standardisation. 
It is proposed to amend the telecommunications carrier licence fees regulations to prescribe a procedure for determining the additional fee before July 1995 in order for the ITU contribution to be included in the carrier licence fees due on that date and on the 1st of July of each succeeding year in respect of a general telecommunications licence or a public mobile licence. Financial impact. The financial impact of the proposed amendments on carriers will be to increase the annual amount payable in licence fees by a total of approximately $1 million. The cost will be shared by the carriers on the basis of their share of telecommunications traffic. I commend the bill to the House. The question is this bill will be read a second time. The Honourable Member for Goldstein. Mr Speaker, under the Telecommunications Carrier Licence Fees Act 1991, the total of the annual telecommunications carrier licence fees must not exceed the cost of running the industry regulator, Austel, in the previous fiscal year. This bill seeks to change the upper fees limit, allowing the government to also recover the costs of Australia's contribution to the International Telecommunications Union, the International Telecommunications Regulatory Body. In 1994-95, the cost of running Austel was $12.6 million, all of which was funded by the carriers, namely Telstra, Optus and Vodafone. The ceiling allows the government to internalise the costs of telecommunications industry regulation by making the carriers pay for the regulator, while preventing the use of carrier licences for the purposes of general revenue generation. The International Telecommunications Union is a United Nations body charged with prescribing telecommunications standards, radio communications planning and other related activities. Whilst Australian carriers currently make their own separate ITU contributions, the Australian government contribution to these payments to the ITU in 1993-94 were totalled uh, $4.86 million. Prior to 1991, Telecom, OTC and OSAT paid for the government's ITU contribution. Australia's contribution to the operation of the ITU is quite high relative to the size of our economy and the contributions of similar developed nations. The proposed amendment raises the ceiling on carrier fees so as to include the telecommunications standards component of Australia's ITU contribution, allowing the government to recover this outlay from the telecommunications carriers. Regulations will determine the size of this component. There appears to have been no official notification to the carriers that this bill was being prepared. The carriers, I understand, accept the general principle that domestic industry-specific regulations should be funded by the industry, but they are less than enthusiastic about covering payments to international bodies. The carriers have no official position on this matter due to the lack of warning of the bill being introduced. According to the explanatory memorandum accompanying this bill, the government intends to recover about $1 million of its contribution from the carriers in the coming financial year. There appears to be no provision for fee reductions in recognition of corporate contributions by the carriers directly to the ITU. Telstra will bear the cost of this measure, as it is by far the largest carrier. However, it is likely that it will offset this increased levy with a commensurate cut in its own ITU contribution. The net effect is likely to be a reduction of Australia's total contribution to the ITU. The bill is expected to reduce the burden on the taxpayer as it transfers responsibility for government payments to the ITU to the industry. The Coalition Mr. Speaker, will not oppose this bill, but we, I will take this opportunity to once again deplore the government's lamentable record in this portfolio. As we have seen in the past, the government is determined to blindly charge ahead with its own agendas with a total lack of consultation with those people who will be directly affected by the changes, the telecommunications industry. This lack of consultation is quite startling given the lack of any urgency behind this bill. The responsibility for making these payments will fall on industry, and while the amounts may not seem excessive, nonetheless the carriers should have at least been notified that the changes proposed by this bill were to be made. With this in mind, the Coalition will carefully scrutinise any regulations which come before the House under this bill. The proposed regulations will determine the size of the telecommunications standards component of Australia's ITU contribution, an amount which is payable by the government and recoverable by government from the carriers. It is to be hoped that some consultation, or at least some warning of the nature and scope of the regulations, will be given to the carriers. The question is, this bill read a second time. The Honourable Member for Coronella. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're here today to consider the uh, Telecommunications Carrier Licence Fees Amendment Bill of 1995. In 1991, the government introduced a package of legislation aimed at reforming the telecommunications industry. One of the provisions of the Telecommunications Act 1991 was to allow for network competition by giving the Minister power to licence Australian trading corporations as general telecommunications carriers. General carriers are the primary providers of Australia's telecommunications services. The Act also provides for a licensing regime for public mobile carriers to supply public mobile telecommunications services. The Telecommunications Carrier Licence Fee Act <coughs> 1991 provides that the holders of general telecommunications licences for public mobile lic or public mobile licences must pay a fee to the Commonwealth for the licence. Section 6 of the Act sets out the limit on total annual fees that become payable under the Act. The amount of the fees or the formula by which fees are determined is set out in regulations. According to the second reading speech for the 1991 legislation, and I quote, it is intended that the amount or the formula determined by the regulations should represent a reasonable estimate of the administrative costs borne by Austel in directly regulating the activities of the carriers. There is an upper limit on the total of the fees that may become payable under this legislation in any one financial year. This limit is the amount of Austel's appropriation from the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the previous financial year. The amendment proposed in this bill <coughs> would add to this limit an amount which is a proportion of the Commonwealth's contribution to the total budget of the International Telecommunication Union, the ITU. The upper limit will thus be fixed by a combination of Austel's appropriation plus proportion of the Commonwealth's contribution to the ITU. The amount of the Commonwealth's contribution to the ITU, which will be taken into account for the purpose of determining the limit on the total of annual fees, will be determined by regulation. The amendment applies to fees payable for general telecommunications licences and public mobile licences from 1 July 1995 or from 1 July on each succeeding year. As has been said by the uh, uh, Shadow um, uh, Minister for uh, Employment, uh, the member for Goldstein, uh, there is uh, broad support for this legislation across both sides of the House. But it is also an opportunity, I think, to reflect on what has been happening in the telecommunications sector in um, recent years. This government has uh, launched into a major reform in the telecommunications industry as an industry where there is uh, significant uh, potential export benefit, where there is scope for significant job growth and where, when we talk about the need for a smarter country, uh, an industry which fits into that with respect to the increasing levels of technology and development that are occurring on an ongoing basis. And as such, it's an industry that is crucial, I think, to the development of Australia's future. And I think that uh, we can be proud of what the government's achieved in this area <coughs> over the years in what has been an area of massive change on a continuing and evolving basis. With respect to what the government's done, there are a range of, um, of uh, facts I'd like to put on the table with respect to that. What we've seen is improved efficiency in customer service, and that's been a result of the telecommunications service sector making the changes that have to be made in the circumstances, and that's a great credit to the companies and their workers. When we look at today's prices, they are on average some 40 per cent lower for the long-distance international markets than they were five years ago. The reform that's occurred in the Australian telecommunications industry has become a model which is being viewed by many countries as a potential way forward for them in terms of um, adjusting their own status where they have monopoly providers and looking towards a more competitive and effective and efficient regime. And we have countries visiting um, here on a regular basis examining what we're doing, using it as um, a basis for what they look at with respect to change within their own society. Mobile phone usage in Australia is up. It's up from uh, around 650,000 users in 1992-93 to over 1 million users today. With respect to the industry itself, um, I was recently at a meeting with um, representatives of the Australian Telecommunications Industry Association. They had a particularly um, good story to tell with respect to this industry in Australia. It is a growing success story. With respect to their requirements, 70 per cent of their requirements are provided locally within Australia. Employment-wise, <coughs> they provide around 13,000 jobs directly. And that's not to count the question of indirect job creation as a result of their activities. With respect to investment in advanced manufacturing, we're talking about $100 million per annum. Their local sales within the Australian market and therefore avoiding the need for um, imports is around $4 billion per annum. Their export performance is growing 
and is now at around $800 million per annum. With respect to research and development, they're at the um, forefront there with the expenditure of around $180 million per annum. And they've estimated that um, the situation of value added per employee um, is up 40% over the last five years. So it's becoming a more efficient industry, a more effective industry and a more productive industry. And I therefore think embraces a range of issues that uh, both sides of the House um, seek to um, pursue with respect to uh, reform in the economy and in terms of building a more successful and a smarter economy. And I think they're getting the runs on the board on a continuing basis. With respect to the question of export um, activities, there are a range of um, examples on the export um, side which I think highlight just the, the depth of market penetration um, overseas in a range of different activities and in a range of different geographical areas. For example, switching cable and optical fibre contracts in China, submarine cable exports worth $250 million, data communications contracts in China, Europe, Thailand and Malaysia, cable contracts in Vietnam, rural telecommunications components in Indonesia, Thailand and Papua New Guinea, cellular equipment to South America. And 12 of, the, 12 of our telecommunications equipment suppliers are in the top 400 exporters. All of that, I think, points to the fact that we have a vibrant, developing and growing telecommunications industry. That industry is evolving and growing over time. And because it is a continually changing and evolving industry, the actual um, <coughs> regulatory um, framework that it works under has to adjust accordingly. This bill is a necessary, although small, I suppose, part of the necessary changes that have to be made to that overall regulatory framework. It's a bill that has bipartisan support and it's a bill that's necessary to ensure that that evolution occurs in a way which will assist the growth and the development of the industry. I commend the bill to the House. The question is that this bill read a second time. The Honourable Member for Boothby. Mr Speaker, in speaking to this Telecommunications Carrier Licence Fees Amendment Bill, uh, a piece of legislation directly involved with supporting the regulatory authorities of our telecommunications industry and telecommunications network. And no one would disagree with the speaker who has just uh, resumed his seat, the member for Leichhardt, in supporting the expansion of the industry in Australia and the, the improvements in its, in its efficiency and its particularly valuable involvement in our export industries through the development of higher technology and research in this country. However, I refer particularly to one uh, part of the telecommunications industry, and that is the mobile phone section, which is directly involved, uh, perhaps as far as the public is concerned, and more directly involved than any other in relation to the regulation through Austel and the application of the Telecommunications Code. And it is in this area I believe the government is deficient in that it has failed to provide uh, through the minister, as he is required to provide under the Telecommunications Act, a land access code. And as the Act has directed last year, I think it was, that he should do so, uh, I find it strange that he has not done so and that apparently there is no urgency in providing the code he has been directed to so provide under the legislation passed by his own government. But this only highlights the fact that when we have further expansion, as we do have, of the mobile phone system uh, and we enjoy, all of us here I expect, and so many more in the community um, on, a, on a monthly basis, uh, we must know that some people pay a price for the expansion of that system. And that price is the lack uh, or the, or the, diminu the diminish, diminishing uh, environmental enjoyment of some of the residents of our community who have to put up with the visual impact uh, of an increasing number of telecommunications towers and antenna. I raise this question in the debate of the budget and uh, I am still involved uh, as a representative of constituents with uh, very unsatisfactory procedures in relation to the installation of uh, antenna and uh, uh, broadcasting equipment to support the mobile phone system. And I know that other members too 
uh, have been involved in what they consider to be a very unsatisfactory uh, situation. Now, the basis of why it is so unsatisfactory is that the companies involved, the three existing telecommunications companies involved in the expansion of the mobile phone system, are operating under an exempt status in this community. And local government and state government authorities and uh, most Commonwealth authorities have no say, no particular authority, should I say, in where and how these uh, communications facilities are, are uh, installed. And I, again, only as one example, without reiterating my previous remarks in this House, indicate that the Telecommunications Code, whilst it has a broad range of activities that the companies must involve themselves in and so installing their equipment, there is, no, there is a almost total lack of effective involvement locally in any uh, disciplinary measures involved in those companies' activities. And, uh, in the end, it is only the Secretary of the Department of Environment and Austel who can have any particular influence on those installations. Now, I know those companies, Mr Speaker, are becoming more careful of their public relations in this matter, but I give this instance yet again of a defect, of a defective uh, system as it applied to a particular installation. The installation involved had been shifted around in the council area because of local uh, opposition to its particular sites that had been chosen. Eventually a site was chosen on the, on the roof of a theatre. The council was informed by the company of its plans and plans of a certain dimension were given to the council. The scale on the plans was wrong and uh, when applied to the plan itself produced the wrong measurements of the installation. The plan itself inherent in the plan that particular one was correct, but the scale applied to it, which people used to understand what the size would be, was wrong. The plan supplied to, to the owner of the building, who agreed to the installation and, will, of course, will receive some rental, was wrong. And the uh, actual installation is something like 35 per cent greater than the plan, bigger than the plan supplied to the building. The council was notified by the company which the company was obliged to, of course, so notify, and, and notified only one local resident. Because the Telecommunications Code, whilst it has all sorts of instructions to the company to notify uh, the council, has no imperative that the council should notify its own residents. And I have been told by a particular council officer in one other council that whilst they have been notifying residents, they have no obligation to do so. And of course, the basic uh, problem uh, that applies to that, that concerns the public is that companies that have proliferated from one to three are operating under exempt status. And as the telecommunications uh, uh, industry is further deregulated, we can expect, I believe, in 1997, many further entries or a number of further entries to the public to the mobile telephone network, and we can expect to find. Uh, possibly a half a dozen or more companies under the current attitude operating under an exempt status who can in law snub their, no snub the, uh, their noses if they so want to do uh, to the residents whose facilities they will, uh, whose uh, amenity they will impinge on. Now at a time when the whole of the community is, is looking to visually improve its uh, cities and uh, we in South Australia have a particular uh, government and local government attitude to get rid of unsightly power poles. We have companies who are exempt from the laws, the state laws and local council laws and planning. And uh, it is not possible, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, uh, for this situation to continue. And I, I understand that a review of the situation is to be made by Austel, and I hope. Uh, that it's most, most seriously in the reviews that will be carried out that the citizens of Australia will have their authority restored through their elected representatives to council and state governments and to other federal government bodies in relation to their environment and that uh, compensation which is allowed uh, and provided for, for the acquisition of land and physical aspects will be extended 
to the destruction of the value of properties by the loss of amenity visually, uh, which uh, happens from time to time. And uh, until this is done, there will be a continuing injustice to uh, an, an increasing number of people as more and more antenna uh, are developed. I looked at some statistics provided uh, by my colleague, the leader of the National Party, who sends out from time to time some very interesting statistics to his colleagues. I don't know whether he sends them to members of the government or not. But uh, he included in the one that came yesterday a reference to the installation or the, the use of uh, uh, mobile phones in Australia. And uh, in 1990-91, in there were 158 million calls. In 1992-93, there were 411 million calls. Now, those figures, of course, are far outdated because I guess they're the last ones available. But it's just some indication of the explosive use of mobile phones and phones in Australia, the explosive uh, new installations of towers to support them, and this, uh, this hiatus in the sense that the old rules that allow the companies to exempt, operate under exempt status will be quite untenable as companies reach out to make their multi-million dollar profits. They cannot expect, and I don't say that as an anti-profit uh, statement, a simple statement of fact, that you can't have private companies proliferating uh, able to install their installations with an exempt status in search of private profit. The power of local citizens must be restored in amendments to the Telecommunications Code. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Carrier Licence Fees Act 1991 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the House to move to the third reading forthwith? There being no objection, I shall allow that course to be followed. The Honourable the Minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye to the right. contrary. No, I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Carrier Licence Fees Act 1991 and for related purposes. The Honourable the Assistant Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask leave of the House to declare certain bills as cognate bills. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable the Assistant Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I declare that the following bills are cognate bills. Taxation Laws Amendment, Budget Measures Bill 1995 and Income Tax Rates Amendment Bill 1995. Clark. Government Business, Order of the Day number 2, Taxation Laws Amendment, Budget Measures Bill 1995. Motion for second reading. The Honourable the Assistant Treasurer. Thank you. Mr Speaker, I move that the bills be now read a second time. The bills will amend the taxation laws in a number of respects to give effect to certain announcements in the 1995-96 budget. Company tax rate change. The Income Tax Rates Amendment Bill 1995 will increase the general rate of company tax from 33 per cent to 36 per cent for taxable income of the 1995-96 and subsequent income years. The increased rate will apply to most companies, including non-resident companies that are taxable in Australia. The new rates will also apply to public trading trusts, corporate unit trusts and limited partnerships that are taxed as companies. The non-statutory fund income of non-mutual life assurance companies will also be subject to tax at the increased rate. The change in the rate of tax will not apply to certain classes of companies or incomes that are taxed at special rates of tax. The new tax rate will not apply to the statutory fund income or the superannuation business of life assurance companies or to pool development fund income. It will also not apply to the trustees of superannuation funds, approved deposit funds or pool superannuation trusts or to registered organisations. The concessional tax rates that apply to recognised credit unions for the income years up to and including 1996-97 are also not affected by the rate change. The change in the company tax rate will affect the operation of the franking accounts of companies. Changes to deal with the franking account, accounts matters will be provided for in an amendment bill to be introduced later this year. <clears throat> the change in the company tax rate will provide revenue gains in the order of $320 million in 1995-96, 
$1,570 million in 1996 97 $940 million in 1997-98 and $1,140 million in 1998-99. The Taxation of Friendly Societies and Other Registered Organisations. In the 1995-96 budget, the government announced a review of the taxing arrangements that apply to the life, assurance, life insurance business of friendly societies and life assurance companies. The government is concerned that the review not interfere with the conduct of life insurance business. Accordingly, the trustee rates that apply during the 1994-95 income year to the eligible insurance business of life assurance companies at 39 per cent and friendly societies and other registered organisations at 33 per cent will be maintained until the 97-98 year of income while the review is undertaken. The tax rates that apply to the life insurance business of life assurance companies and friendly societies will be aligned as an outcome of the review. Consequently, amendments in the Taxation Laws Amendment Budget Measures Bill will freeze the rate of tax imposed on the eligible insurance business of friendly societies and other registered organisations at 33 per cent for the 95-96 and 96-97 years of income. The rebate applying to taxable bonuses paid on life insurance policies issued by friendly societies will increase to 33 per cent from 1 July 1995 as scheduled and will be maintained at that level for the year beginning 1 July 1996. The cost to the revenue of the measures is expected to be $11 million in 95-96, $45 million in 96-97 and $22 million in 97-98. There is, is expected to be a revenue gain of $4 million in 98-99. Tax advantaged computer programs. The sales tax law contains a concession for goods containing computer programs on reprogrammable microchips. The concession was introduced in September 1992 through a Senate amendment. In effect, the exemption removed from the taxable value of goods the value of any computer program embodied in a reprogrammable microchip. This meant that a tax benefit could be obtained merely by putting computer programs on a reprogrammable microchip instead of non-reprogrammable microchips. The government strongly opposed the introduction of this measure, reflecting the range of drawbacks with it. The exemption has allowed some taxpayers to claim large reduction in their sales tax liability, and overall it is estimated to be costing the budget some $150 million per annum. Greater losses are anticipated as manufacturers switch to tax-advantaged computer programs. Apart from the fiscal costs, the exemption has caused a range of other problems, including the misallocation of resources by manufacturers using the more expensive reprogrammable microchips solely to get a tax exemption. There have been major problems for taxpayers and the Australian Taxation Office in assessing the value of tax advantaged computer programs. These have resulted in some manufacturers gaining unfair competitive advantages, and given the difficulties with valuing foreign sourced computer programs, it is likely that some Australian manufacturers have been disadvantaged. The Sales Tax Assessment Act 1992 is being amended to remove the concession in respect of computer programs contained on non-permanent microchips. This will arrest the significant loss of sales tax revenue arising from the imprecise nature of the exemption, remove anomalies that result in difficulties for taxpayers and promote equity in the marketplace. The treatment of computer programs will be restored to what it was before the introduction of the 1992 amendment. There will continue to be a reduction in taxable value for certain programs on microchips in cartridges. The amendment will take effect from budget night. The gain to revenue from the measures is likely to be $10 million in 94-95, $150 million in 95-96, $160 million in 96-97 and $170 million for 97-98 and $185 million for 98-99. Sales tax refunds. The sales tax law provides that refunds of sales tax can only be obtained where conditions in the sales tax law are satisfied. These measures provide a level of certainty for both taxpayers and the government in the treatment of claims for overpaid tax. However, common law Common law court challenges are seeking to bypass the specified conditions and extend the refund periods beyond the three-year limit in the sales tax law. If successful, these challenges could result in windfall gains to taxpayers of millions of dollars in cases where the tax was not borne by the taxpayer. 
Measures in these bills will prevent the extension of the refund period and the possibility of windfalls for certain taxpayers. These measures will take effect from budget night and it has not been possible to quantify the financial impact. Consequential changes. The Taxation Laws Amendment Budget Measures Bill 1995 also makes changes consequential on the increase in the rate of sales tax applying to non-luxury passenger motor vehicles and on the increase in the company tax rate. The Provisional Tax Uplift Factor. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll be moving amendments during the detailed consideration of the Taxation Laws Amendment Budget Measures Bill to give effect to the 8 per cent provisional tax uplift factor for the 95-96 income year as announced in the budget. The government had originally planned that this ch a change be included in a bill for introduction later in the session, but has agreed to a request from the Democrats to bring the matter forward for debate in the context of these bills. Full details of the amendments in these bills are contained in the explanatory memorandum circulated to honourable members. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. The question is the bill be read a second time. The honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr Deputy Speaker, no wonder the Assistant Treasurer ran through as quickly as he could that prepared speech, because this is a bill which completely breaks faith with the Australian people, completely breaks faith with Australian companies, completely breaks faith with the promises that Mr Keating made before the 1993 election. It is a downright taxation fraud. It is one of the great tax lies of the last election campaign. The first of the two bills being dealt with here is the Taxation Laws Amendment Budget Measures Bill of 1995. This, together with the Income Tax Rates Amendment Bill, amends income tax rates to increase the rate of company tax from 33 to 36 per cent. The bill is estimated to reap in an additional $320 million in revenue in 1995-6, $1,570 million in 1996-7, $940 million in 1997-8 and $1,140 million in 1998-99. This bill implements a decision which is a complete violation of the assurances that Mr Keating gave to the Australian people before the 1993 election. For this reason, the Coalition will oppose and vote against this bill. The Coalition will not be a party to, will, nor will it endorse, electoral fraud. And if this House exists for the purpose of representing people, and holding governments accountable, this House would be rejecting this legislation. If this House took its responsibility seriously on both sides of the House of holding governments accountable to the people of Australia, this would be rejected out of hand. The Prime Minister announced that the Labor government would reduce company tax from 39 to 33 per cent if re-elected on 9 February 1993. It was in his Investing in the Nation statement. On page 45 of the Investing in the Nation statement, it is said, to stimulate business investment, the government will lower the rate of company income tax from 39 cents to 33 cents for taxable income. On page 59, it said, the reduction in the statutory corporate tax rate to 33 per cent will provide Australian industry with a world competitive tax system. And during his investment in the Nation Address down at the National Press Club and in the following questioning from journalists, the Prime Minister put the hard sell on the cut in the company tax rate. The Prime Minister said, quote, we have decided that the simplest and most effective way to encourage Australian companies to work for Australia is to lower their tax burden. So under a Labor government, on 1 July this year, the company tax rate will be reduced from 39 cents in the dollar to 33 cents. This will make the Australian corporate tax system highly competitive with the OECD countries. He continued on, but I think perhaps more importantly, we will also be competitive with the countries in our region. Australian companies will thus be much better placed to trade with Asia, the region where it is going to matter most. He went on further and said the imperative is to be competitive now with Asia in the region, and the competitive rates are down around those low 30s. 
So that's why, if we want our dynamic companies to go out there and get it, to go out there and take their share of the world market for Australia, you've got to give them a chance. And the chance is at rates comparable with all of the other tax rates in the Asia-Pacific region and indeed the OECD. And that's why we take it down to 33 cents. To 33 cents. And here we are, back here in 1995, with a proposal from this government to reverse all of those highfalutin statements, all of those promises, all of those promises that were made before the election to try and garner in votes and to dash the hopes of Australian corporates who might have been tempted to believe the Prime Minister. How does he do it? How does he live with his conscience when he does this kind of thing? And he does it on a regular basis. What possible explanation could there be for the complete violation of all of those high-minded sentiments made before the election, but not even carried through for one term of the parliament afterwards? Not even carried through for one term of the parliament afterwards. I say to the Australian corporates and I say to the Australian people. You have seen him do it before. Don't trust him again. Do not trust this character again. He's got form. He's a recidivist. He's a repeat offender. He's somebody that's tried this trick over and over again. And no doubt before the next election, the great repeat offender will stand up and say, trust me one last time. Well, I say with people like that, you consider their history. You take into account <coughs> their behaviour and you judge accordingly. There is no basis whatsoever for any Australian corporate or indeed any Australian taxpayer to trust this Prime Minister on a tax promise ever again. However, even with the reduction, the much vaunted reduction, of the company tax rate from 39 to 33 cents, and remember now to be reversed back to 36, even with the much vaunted reduction, there was still a catch. With the announcement to cut the rate of company tax, the government decided to reintroduce quarterly payments of company tax to bring forward receipts to the government. For both 95.6 and 96.7, the government expected to match the revenue lost through cutting the rate of company tax by bringing forward company tax receipts. The government's announced increase in company tax in the budget is expected to increase revenue by $320 million in 95-6 and $1,570 million in 96-7. For both 95-6 and 96-7, the government has pulled off one of the most remarkable sleights of hand you have ever seen. By reducing company tax from 39 to 33 per cent and by bringing forward company tax receipts and then by raising the, re the company tax back from 33 to 36, the government will actually collect more revenue than if it hadn't lowered the rate in the first place. It will actually collect more than if it hadn't lowered the rate in the first place. According to the figures contained in the 93-4 budget, the government expected to fully offset the reduction in company tax from 39 down to 33 in 95-6 by bringing forward payments. In 95-6, the tax cut would amount to 1620 million and the new payment arrangements would bring forward an additional 1620 million it is a similar story for 967 the tax cut would be 1700 million but bringing forward of tax payments would bring in an additional 1690 million as a result as a result of reducing the rate to 33 cents but offsetting it completely by bringing forward the tax payments when you now take it back up again, you gain extra revenue. This was the tax cut that actually increased the taxes payable to the government. It was a tax cut that actually brought in more revenue. This must be one of the greatest tax cuts of all time for this government. As a result of this budget, the rise in the company tax rate will bring in, will bring in, in net terms, an additional $320 million in 95-6 and an additional $1,570 million in 96-7. The government has achieved a truly remarkable result 
from cutting the corporate tax rates from 39 down to 33 and back to 36, it will actually raise revenue. It will actually raise revenue. The simple fact is that companies would be paying less tax in 95.6 and in 96.7 if the corporate tax rate had remained at 39 per cent with the then payment arrangement still in place. The fact is companies would be paying less tax in 95.6 and 96.7 if the corporate tax rate had remained at 39 per cent with the same payment arrangements in place. Now, in his deficit Dalek speech last year at the MTIA National Annual Dinner, the Prime Minister posed the rhetorical question when discussing where the government might take action to reduce the budget deficit. He asked rhetorically, quote, are we to increase the rate of company tax when we have at last a rate that is competitive with our Asian neighbours? Well, on budget night, he answered his own question, yes, <laughs> yes. We are to increase the rate of company tax when we at last had a rate that is competitive with our Asian neighbours. And as I said, as a result of transitional arrangements in relation to payments, we have actually increased the tax burden on Australian companies in 95.6 and 96.7. Now, you recall that when the Prime Minister promised before the election, he's the real before and after man, this Prime Minister. Is the real before and after man. You know, there are actually intervening events that can allow you to assess after conduct against before conduct. And before conduct in the light of after practice is shameful conduct. The only thing that actually, the only thing that actually intervenes is an election. Once he's garnered in the votes, he starts garnering in the taxes. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Once the votes come in, the taxes come in as well. For business and for corporates, the taxes go out. But you recall that the whole expression of this promise, the before promise, was that we had to have a rate of corporate tax which would allow Australian companies to go in the Asian region, that we'd get a rate which was competitive with our Asian neighbours. Now, I'm not aware, and now, of course, we're putting it up, I'm not aware that any of our Asian neighbours have been increasing their corporate tax rate lately. I'm not aware that this is being driven by an increase in the region so that we can match it without taking a competitive disadvantage. The simple fact is they are not increasing their corporate tax rates. Some of the applicable rates in the region are 34 cents in Malaysia, 27 in Singapore, 30 cents in Thailand. So it's got nothing to do with the Asian region. In fact, if you measured the after conduct by the before promises, uh, all you'd have to say is that the Prime Minister is actually trying to make our rates uncompetitive with Asia. Yeah. I mean, that's, 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 the, that's the net effect. The that's the logical conclusion. If the whole thing was premised by this view of competitiveness with Asia, the only explanation as to the current arrangements is uncompetitiveness with Asia. It must be the logical conclusion. You must face that fact. Now, when the Assistant Treasurer came in, was there any explanation? as to why it was no longer necessary to have competitive rates with Asia? Is there any explanation as to why it was no longer necessary to have the rate that the Prime Minister had promised before the election? None whatsoever. You got the feeling the Assistant Treasurer was going to get this bill in here and get out of this place as quickly as he could. Of course he could. And of course he's run out of the chamber now. Who would want to be around whilst the logic of the utter, utter fecklessness of this Prime Minister with Australian corporates was discussed here in the People's Chamber. In order to obtain an understanding behind the government's true motivation behind the decision to increase company tax, it is also necessary to carefully scrutinise and sift through the words of the Treasurer. <coughs> in his budget night speech, the Treasurer said, now that the economy is growing strongly, it is appropriate that the corporate sector make a contribution to tightening of fiscal policy. Accordingly, the rate of company income tax will be increased from 33 per cent to 36 per cent for 95, 6 and subsequent income years. But let's again compare that language about contributions to tightening of fiscal policy 
with what the Treasurer was saying in the lead up to the budget. It reveals the sheer magnitude of the hypocrisy from a Treasurer whose utterances are increasingly intellectually bankrupt. In the 30th of November last year, in answer to a question on business tax concessions, the Treasurer said, quote, well, I don't want to comment on individual elements except to say this, that in that area of change to business tax, there was certainly a considerable concern to get the economy moving again, so it was done with an eye to cyclical improvement. But it was also done with an eye to structural change, and that is to provide some longer-term encouragement to investment. So I don't think it would be a case of simply saying, well, now the economy is growing well, we can rip all that away. We clearly have to bear in mind the sort of factors that we did take into account in making those changes, which were particularly the need to have a competitive tax regime for business. So what he was saying in November last year was that this was done with the eye to the long term for a competitive tax rate. What he was saying was that it was done with an eye to structural change, and yet in his own words, in his own budget, six months later, when he said it wasn't the kind of thing you could rip all away, what did he do? He ripped it all away. You know, a structural change which lasted all of six months. All of six months. You know, I'd hate to see a temporary change from this treasurer, wouldn't you? That's a, permanent. A, stru a structural change which lasted all of six months. Wasn't done with an eye to being cyclical, weren't going to rip it away if things got better, and yet he stands up here and he says, you know that tax rate reduction? It's all off. It's all off. Utterly intellectually bankrupt. Cynical. Just like with the Commonwealth Bank. The words, the intentions of the Treasurer in the prospectus amounts to nothing. The rise in company tax, let's face it, it's just a grab for cash. The government has shown that it is incapable of controlling the growth in its own purpose outlays, and so it's resorting to new tax hikes. On the revenue side of the budget, the government will collect an additional $14 billion, a 12 per cent increase on the last financial year. Included in this rise, Mr Willis and Mr Keating, will raise taxes by another $2 billion in 95-6 alone. An extra $17 billion will be raised in revenue as a result of changes announced in the budget over the next four years, and $15 billion of that represents the imposition of new and increased taxes. When one carefully analyses the budget, you can see that the Treasurer and the Prime Minister are blind on one side. The only side that they actually see is the revenue side. But I have to give credit where credit is due. The government undertook an extensive bid to try and soften up the community for this feckless repudiation of its election promise. It sank to new depths in relation to disinformation when people from the Treasurer's office were running around the press gallery saying that actually it was business that wanted a rise in the corporate tax rate. I mean, this, this rate reached new heights of ludicrous proportions, Mr Deputy Speaker, when the Australian Financial Review on the 24th of April carried a front page headline, Business Faces One Billion Tax Rise. The report said the government had won big business support for a 2 per cent increase in the company tax rate as long as dividend imputation remained intact. I remember uh, being asked about this by journalists, and I said to those journalists, if business wants a company tax rise, get one of them on the news tonight saying, I want my company tax to be put up. Later in the day, the Business Council completely denied the story. It revealed the story for what it was, a government-inspired story having nothing to do with business or, intent, or indeed business intentions. What it was was what we've seen so often in relation to the budgets brought down by the master deceiver, the Prime Minister, Mr Keating. The softening up of the public, the planting of press stories, the massaging of public opinion to try and pr provide a cover 
for the real intentions. And that was the real intention, to increase the revenue, having the effect of reducing competitiveness, to renege on an election pledge, to turn around a structural change because he's blind on one side. He only sees the revenue side of the Commonwealth accounts. The Business Council completely repudiated that story. And the opposition completely repudiates this bill. We are determined to make sure that this government is held to its promises. There are other parties in other chambers of this parliament that once used to say their role was to keep government honest. Here is their chance. Because to vote with the government on this bill is essentially to sanction electoral fraud, the dishonest breaking of election promises, the dishonest repudiation of tax reductions. And we in the opposition want to make this clear. We will not vote for tax lies. We will not vote for the repudiation of election promises. We will vote to make sure that the government is held accountable by this side of the House at least. Yeah. And for that reason, we will oppose the income tax rates amendment, which increases company tax to 36 per cent. The second bill, which is being debated cognately, is the Taxation Laws Amendment Budget Measures Bill. This bill has several dis different aspects which I would like to deal with in some detail, for the Coalition opposes some parts of the bill and will vote against some parts in committee. There are other parts of the bill which we do not oppose. Firstly, Schedule 1 of the bill makes consequential amendments in relation to the rise in the company tax rate. These consequential amendments are designed to ensure that the increase in the company tax rate will not apply to the concessional rates of tax that apply to recognised medium and recognised large credit unions for the 95, 6 and 96, 7 years of income. The Coalition has no concerns about this aspect of the bill because it would like to see those concessions restored. Of course, had the income tax rates bill, which puts up the company tax, uh, been defeated, we would have opposed this part. We assume, however, that the first bill increasing company tax will go through. That being the case, there is no need to oppose this schedule, which inserts the concession. We want to see the concession for medium and, recogni for medium and recognised large credit unions preserved. Secondly, Schedule 2 of the bill amends the income tax law to freeze the rate of tax imposed on the eligible insurance business of friendly societies and other registered organisations at 33 per cent for the 95-6 and 96-7 income years. In addition, the rebate applying to taxable bonuses paid on life insurance policies issued by friendly societies will increase to 33 per cent from 1 July 1995 as scheduled and will be maintained at that level for the year beginning 1 July of 96. The government has decided to introduce this tax freeze to enable a review of the taxing arrangements that apply to the life insurance business of friendly societies and life assurance companies. However, this review has been underway since 1989 and the legislation does not remove the legislated rise in the tax rate to 39 per cent in 97, 8 and later years. The Coalition opposed the increase in the tax on friendly societies and other registered organisations back in 1993. It was yet another case of the violation of the government's electoral mandate. So the Coalition will not oppose this freeze. The third part of the bill makes consequential amendments to the Sales Tax Assessment Act 1992 because of the increase in the sales tax applied to passenger motor vehicles by the sales tax exemptions and classifications modification bills. In his One Nation speech on the 26th of February 1992, the Prime Minister said, quote, from tomorrow the sales tax on new cars currently subject 
to the 20 per cent rate will be permanently lowered to 15 per cent. Permanently lowered to 15 per cent. Another one of these permanent structural changes that the Prime Minister used to talk about in his before manifestation, taken away in his after manifestation. The Prime Minister now dismisses all of those promises, hiking the increase in sales tax on motor cars. Again, another feckless repudiation of promises made in an effort to get votes taken away afterwards. The coalition has made it entirely clear, again for the same reason, that we will hold the government accountable for its promises. We will not sit by and let this Prime Minister continue to repudiate his assurances to the Australian people. The coalition opposes the increase in the sales tax on motor, ve motor vehicles because of that violation of the electoral mandate and, as a consequence, will oppose Clause 3, Part 1 of Schedule 3, Part 2 of Schedule 3 and Schedules 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 contained in this bill. The fourth part of this bill amends the old and new sales tax legislation to ensure that the only access to credits or refunds of overpaid sales tax is via the provision of the sales tax law itself. In other words, the government seeks to prevent common law claims for tax refunds outside the wholesale sales tax legislation. The bill amends the Sales Tax Assessment Act 1992 and the Sales Tax Amendment Transitional Act 1992 to ensure that refunds of sales tax may only be obtained through the procedures prescribed by the provisions of the acts themselves. The current sales tax law provides two grounds for the payment of refunds, refunds of sales tax that was legally payable and refunds of amounts paid as sales tax which were not legally repayable. The effect of the amendment is that claimants who do not satisfy the conditions of the two grounds will not be entitled to a refund. Both the current law and the former sales tax legislation contain three-year limitations on claims for refunds and a requirement that the person who bore the tax must actually receive the refund. The amendment will apply to liabilities to pay refunds arising after 7.30 on the 9th of May 1995 and liabilities to pay refunds arising at or before 7.30 on 9th May if legal proceedings to enforce payment of the refunds were commenced after that time. The Coalition believes that common law remedies should not be closed off and will oppose that part of the bill. I mean, common law remedies are entitlements under the law which apply generally. Why should they be closed off in relation to sales tax? This is law as found by the courts in accordance with the principles of our jurisprudence. And we can't see why the statute should close those remedies off. There are only remedies available at law, and the law should not be amended to close them off. We'll oppose it. The final part of the bill deals with removing the sales tax exemption for computer programs on reprogrammable microchips. The bill amends the Sales Tax Assessment Act to limit the tax advantage computer program concession. Since 1 January 1993, taxpayers have enjoyed a concessional taxable value on a wide range of goods, such as computers, mobile phones and white goods, which, are contained in, which contain computer programs housed in reprogrammable microchips. Reprogrammable microchips are microchips into which software is not embodied permanently, such as erasable programmable read-only memory and flash ROM. Software supplied on an erasable program read-only memory or similar device is totally erasable and can be replaced with new software. It has been alleged by the government that the exemption has allowed unexpected and large deductions in relation to sales tax. The government maintains that the concession was intended to encourage innovation but has instead encouraged wastefulness as manufacturers added non-permanent microchips to their goods in order to qualify. The coalition indicated at the time when this was put in the Senate and supported the proposal that it did so with some reluctance. We hear what the government says, that this has created an unforeseen anomaly. This is not the category of a promise which is a tax violation 
or a violation of Mr Keating's promises to the Australian people before the last election. We do not therefore put it in that category and vote against it. We do, however, say that it should be closely monitored. Uh, it should not be used to the detriment uh, if it should be having a wider effect than anticipated. But given the fact that the government maintains it is but an anomaly, we recognise the right of the government to close down anomalies which would otherwise open wide holes in the administration of the taxation system. The Assistant Treasurer has indicated in his speech that he will be moving an amendment in relation to the provisional tax uplift factor. Our view in relation to that provisional uplift taxation factor is the government has specified the wrong amount. I will put my case in relation to that when the amendment is moved. We will be making our own amendment to that. We will be voting against the government's tax lies and we will be opposing those sections of those bills which I have outlined in my speech. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Curtin. Uh, and a special thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, on two count. Mr Deputy Speaker, I was sitting here wondering who I would follow, and I find it's the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. And I remember the Honourable Member for Werriwera in here the other night telling us how we need sophisticated debate on tax legislation, which he didn't give us, incidentally. But I thought, my goodness, something's happened. He's not here this morning. The minister's not here to debate the issue. But nor is anyone else from the government side. Not one person listed to speak in defence of the of the tax imposition that these bills before us represent. Not one. Not one. But we look at the next item on the, uh, on the, of business, local government financial assistance. Gee, this must be a good area for the people opposite. They must see something in the budget which, uh, which they can sell, because there are five of them there, and they're coming into, uh, they're going to lord that. They, but they cannot. They can. They can. They can speak for their expenditure programs. They can speak for spending for for the largesse afforded by the government out of taxpayers' funds. But they can't come in here and explain to the people why they have to raise so much money. Why? Why there was a need to break those promises and tell those lies in the lead up to the last election. Not one person, that, some with a bit of a conscience, are so embarrassed that they can't find their way into the chamber to defend government taxation programs, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, these two bills, as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has said, are the latest in the 95-96 budget bills to be debated. They are much like all the others we have seen so far. What they have in common is that they all raise taxes. It's all about raising money. So what's new, some might be thinking. Well, it's true that uh, Labor's tax record is a disgrace. I mean, it's invented new taxes, it's raised existing taxes, it's brought forward the collection of taxes. But these take the biscuit in that they continue to represent the broken promises made by the Prime Minister in the lead up to the 1993 election. This is not the first time the, uh, or the first evidence of uh, the broken promises in the context of the 1993 election, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Dawkins horror budget, you'll remember that last year, the Dawkins horror budget, budget put paid to Labor's general promise on taxation and demonstrated then that the re-election of Labor was based on fraud. It was based on deceit. The Australian people were simply lied to. How different this outcome is from uh, the Prime Minister's words, Mr Deputy Speaker. On 19 November 1992, on Lateline, when he said, and I'll keep on repeating it, what I am promising, promising is not to put up tax. 
The Prime Minister has been untrue to himself, but more importantly, he's condemned the Australian people to pay for his inability, admittedly through a speech impediment, to get his tongue around the truth. President Bush, you'll recall, Mr Deputy Speaker, told the Australian people, read my, uh, told the American people once, read my lips, no new taxes. President Bush broke his pledge to the American people and he paid the price. The Amer American people threw him out of the White House at the first chance they got. Well, the Prime Minister better start packing his bags because the people are going to get the opportunity to deliver retribution in this country, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And they will toss, toss this man out of the lodge at the next election. Labor has broken its promises in terms of income tax, tax uh, company tax, indirect taxes and any other tax or charge that you can care to mention. We had income tax cuts which were legislated. They were LAW law. But the reality, Mr Deputy Speaker, is they were LIE. Lie, lie, lie. The government also goes some way to showing the increased confusion the government has in terms of establishing sound tax policy. The reality is that this government has no policies now. It, it simply has no policies, and it certainly didn't have at the last election. So a combination of lies, criticism, criticism, and even more criticism was all they offered to the electorate in the run-up to the 1993 poll. It's no surprise that after the election the Prime Minister called the departmental secretaries into his office and demanded they go back to their departments to produce policies which his government could pursue. That was after the election. So certain was the present Prime Minister that he'd lose in 93 after he fell over the electoral finishing line. He had no plans. He had no policies and uh, certainly no vision. Now he wants us to reveal our policies so he can pinch them. He's got Buckley's, Mr Deputy Speaker. Buckley's. The increase in the rate of company tax is a perfect illustration of the government lacking a policy direction. The government's rhetoric constantly alters, as you know only too well, Mr Deputy Speaker, and its policy positions keep shifting. So it's little wonder that the business community is banging its head against a brick wall under this regime. After all, business needs stability if it's going to undertake new investment and strive to compete in new markets. The Income Tax uh, Rates Amendment Bill 1995 amends the Income Tax Rates Act 1986 to increase the rate of company tax from 33 per cent to 36 per cent. This increased rate is to apply to most companies and extend to others which are taxed as companies. The amendment will apply from the 95-96 uh, financial year and to all years thereafter, unless Labor decides to alter the tax rate once again or unless we get a coalition government which will provide some stability and maintain a sense of direction for the taxpaying corporate sector. In 95-96, this will mean government revenues will benefit to an ex ex the extent of an extra $320 million. In 96-97, though, the, tech, the take increases to $1.570 million, $1.57 billion. $940 million will be the extra take in 97-98 and it's back up over the magic billion mark in 98-99 to $1.140 billion, Mr Deputy Speaker. The government claims the compliance cost is negligible, but I'll get back to that in a little while. In the 93-94 budget, the, uh, the government announced it was reducing the rate of company tax from 39 to 33 per cent, and how we all remember that. On the 9th of February 1993, the Prime Minister stated, we have decided that the simplest and most effective way to encourage Australia's, Australian companies to work for Australia is to lower their ta tax burden. Coming on top of the accelerated depreciation allowances announced in One Nation, this will make the Australian corporate system highly competitive with the OEC, within the OECD countries. But more importantly, 
we will also be competitive with our countries in the region. Australian companies will thus be better placed to trade with Asia, the region where it's going to matter most. Well, that was all fine and dandy and hard to argue with. Before the 1993 election, the Prime Minister also stated, as part of a dynamic East Asian growth region and uh, with increasing strength in education, training and research and development, Australia is well posed to take advantage of these trends. Our integration into the, Australian, uh, into the Asian regional economy, however, means that we need to compare ourselves not just with OECD members but with regional competitors for new manufacturing and large-scale processing facilities. Well, amen to that. The Prime Minister claimed that to aid this integration, the government would therefore cut the company tax rate from 39 to 33 per cent. He said this would encourage firms to invest out of increased retained earnings and improve the competitiveness of Australia's business tax regime compared with our regional neighbours. Well, we agreed with that. In response to a question by the member for uh, Coronella on the 18th of November 1993 about tax rates in the East Asian economies and whether Australia's company tax rate is competitive by the standards of the East Asian economies, the then Treasurer Mr Dawkins replied, as the Deputy and Acting Prime Minister indicated, the Prime Minister is on his way to APEC for APEC leaders' meetings, meeting which is evidence of the increasing economic integration of the nation's region and most particularly a measure of the integration of, of Australia with many of the countries in the region. It's for that reason that the government has been keen to compare the investment climate in Australia with climates which uh, operate in some of the countries of Southeast Asia. The question refers to, that, that I referred to is about comparable company tax rates in the East Asian area. Perhaps it's worth reminding the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, of what those rates are for a selected group of companies, admittedly, but the more advanced uh, industrial, nevertheless. For Japan, the company rate of tax is 37.5 per cent. In the Republic of China, on Taiwan, it's 25 per cent. For the Republic of Korea, it's 36.5 per cent. Thailand, it's 30 per cent. Malaysia, 34 per cent. Indonesia, 35 per cent. Singapore, 30 per cent. And the Philippines, 35 per cent. If one averages the rates that I've just mentioned, the unweighted average in these economies would be 33 per cent. That's precisely the rate which now applies in Australia and therefore clearly puts Australia very much in touch with these economies on a comparable basis. So what are we going to do? We're going to penalise that element of the price component and competition by adding another nearly 10 per cent to the company tax rate. If the words of the Prime Minister and the then Treasurer were true, why don't they apply now? It's a simple question. If their rationale is carried through, the are Australian companies now disadvantaged relative to neighbouring Asian countries? And if what they said in the first place was true and accurate, well, of course, the answer to the, the question I've just posed is yes. Why -E yes, yes. And how does the uh, government rationalise the increase, this increase in company tax? We oh no, it's about a grubby attempt to increase the revenue flowing into the Treasury coffers, but. Labor claims the increase in company tax is justified because the corporate profit share has returned to record highs. Companies have benefited from a number of tax concessions, such as investment allowances, accelerated depreciation, etc. And now the economy is growing strongly. It's appropriate the corporate sector should pay more tax. Well, the fact remains that profit share is, as a percentage of gross domestic product, has only just risen above 17 per cent. It is only just recovered to where it was in 1989-90. And if you examine company tax as a percentage of total income tax, the figure in 1988-89 was 17.2 per cent, 19.5 per cent in 94-95, and 19.8 per cent in 95-96. From 1990 to 1992, 
the figure was above 20 per cent. It's a fact that uh, when the economy dived into recession, it was business tax that took up some of the slack. It was business that was called on once again to make up for the errors of this government. It made a contribution then and is being asked to make another. The fact is projected company tax revenue in this budget is up by 15.4 per cent compared with an increase in total revenue for the coming year of 12.8 per cent. It's up 15.4 per cent in the corporate sector, and this at a time when the consumer price index, the measure of inflation, is projected to increase by only 4 per cent. That's a real increase of 11.4 per cent. In money, it is an increase in company tax of $2.29 billion. $2.29 billion out of the working capital, out of the cash flows of Australian businesses. Labor is yet again squeezing the business community to pay for its profligacy, Mr Deputy Speaker. Over the last 12 years of hard labor, while total revenue increased by 177.8 per cent, company income tax increased by 254.9 per cent, and total company tax increased by a whopping 370 per cent. That's the record of 12, 13, or 12 or 13 Labor budgets. And over the same period, the inflation will have risen by 68.4 per cent. Company income tax has therefore increased in real terms over the past 12 or 13 budgets, Mr Deputy Speaker, by almost 200 per cent, and all company taxes by 300 per cent or thereabouts. No wonder the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry I had to say on 9th of May, the rise in corporate taxation from 33 to 36 per cent will diminish corporate retained earnings and therefore reduce business expansion. It was a measure widely foreshadowed and one which was vehemently opposed by the business community. Higher corporate taxes will undermine business confidence at a time when confidence was already falling. This and other measures taken which will, uh, which will impact on, the business re on business revenues will undermine the recovery process. That was the Chamber. This increase in tax means one thing, Mr Deputy Speaker, there will be less investment. Not just because of the increase in the tax rate, but because the uncertainty about what the rate will be in 12 months, two years' time and so on into the future. Labor doesn't know where it's going and it hasn't demonstrated where it might like to go. The rise in company tax of 3 per cent will have negative effects on business and the whole economy. Will business be forced to put up prices or cut costs by laying off staff, Mr Deputy Speaker? What are the implications uh, of the tax rate increase for long-term inflation? All these questions have to be asked by people making decisions now about how to invest and what capital investments to make. Increasing tax burdens have a crippling effect on small businesses, Mr Deputy Speaker, at a time when the government informs us that unemployment figures are falling and that our economy is booming. The business community needs the government to fix a rate and stick with it. If long-term investment strategies are to be encouraged, then business must be able to reduce as many uncertainties as possible in its planning. The world is tough enough out there, the commercial world, without our government making things worse, Mr Deputy Speaker. With the original cut in the rate of company tax from 39 to 33 per cent, the government introduced a new quarterly instalment system. Now companies will be hit with a double whammy because they've still got to meet the accelerated payment schedules as well as now paying this higher rate of tax. The compliance costs in this country are and remain simply the highest by far in the Western world, Mr Deputy Speaker, with the possible exception of the United States. And these compliance costs are not only going to be increased by the increase in the company tax rate to 36 cents in the dollar, the compliance costs will also be higher 
because companies will have to maintain three franking accounts, reflecting the tax payable at the three different rates. As Mr Geoffrey Lehman stated in the Financial Review on 21 April, this will, take, this will make a complete joke of the government's so-called tax simplification projects. Labor promises tax cuts, lower compliance costs, ta uh, compliance costs and simpler tax law. What it actually delivers is the opposite. Is it any wonder that the cost of compliance continues to have a dampening effect on the spirit of innovation and competitiveness of small businesses in this country, Mr Deputy Speaker? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has indicated we will vote against the bill. We will also, uh, we will also uh, in response to the Assistant Treasurer's uh, advice that they are going to legislate by way of amendment uh, later an increase of the uplift, uplift factor to 8 per cent. We will also oppose that and, and propose alternatives. But let me say about the uplift factor at 8 per cent, it is passing strange that it should be at 8 per cent when we have an estimated inflation rate of 4 per cent and allegedly a growing economy with the implied increased corporate tax and business tax take that implies. So why we need it to be at 8 per cent is beyond me. If it has to be at Order. anything, it should be around 4 per cent. The honourable member's time has expired. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The honourable member for McPherson. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you. I'll only make a, a short contribution to this. I think the uh, the subject matter has been well and truly covered uh, already. I just uh, perhaps may, maybe pick up on uh, what the honourable member for Curtin was saying towards the end of his contribution about the uplift factor. I, I actually regarded this whole concept of an uplift factor as objectionable uh, right from the start. Um, in fact, because it makes certain assumptions, I suppose, about business uh, profitability that, that just don't stack up out there and uh, to make some assumption on uh, some ad hoc basis, as it obviously is, that uh, because the business profits were X at, uh, uh, last year, that they're going to be X plus 8 per cent uh, in the ensuing year is just uh, is of great concern, and particularly um, because, as the member for Curtin uh, pointed out in his, uh, the, towards the end of his contribution there, um, that in fact uh, there's no firm basis for that 8 per cent. There's no apparent justification for it in any case because uh, one of the government's uh, great achievements, it qu keeps telling us, of course, is a, uh, is a low uh, underlying rate of inflation, um, something uh, in the order of 4 per cent. So um, there's certainly no justification that we can see um, for maintaining um, that uplift factor at, uh, at 8 per cent um, for 1995, 96 and 10 per cent for later years of income. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there's been a lot of debate in this House um, this week about uh, tax, and our fundamental objection to these proposed changes uh, is simply that they renege on promises that were made that, uh, before the last election, and ironclad commitments to the contrary. And what we are being asked to come in here to do uh, today is uh, apparently to vote in favour of uh, changes to taxes uh, which were uh, contrary to what we were told prior to the last election. Now, I think it's become evident to everyone in Australia, hopefully by now, that this government was largely re-elected on the basis of, uh, of, of fraud. And uh, we had ironclad commitments from the Prime Minister that there would be no increases in taxation. Now I don't know how you how you interpret that. I'm not sure what the people how the people of Australia react to that. But there, there was quite clearly, he said unequivocally that there would be no tax increases, and uh, of course now we're faced uh, somewhere down the track with significant tax increases. And there, there might be all sorts of justification for that. The treasurer comes in and tells us that this is all part of a, a, of a necessary uh, fiscal tightening. And, and I can accept that argument because I understand entirely and support that the government has a, a role in implementing an appropriate fiscal strategy uh, at, uh, at each budget session. Um, but the point here that is objectionable is that this option was cut off by the Prime Minister prior to the last election, and he used it to great effect. Uh, in my view, he made political points 
um, and, and, uh, and they obviously were effective in that he, in, in that he made the point that uh, there would be no tax increases. And in fact, not only did he make that point, but of course he also went uh, further and, uh, and made a great fuss about the fact there were in fact going to be tax decreases in, uh, in uh, personal income tax. Now we now see, of course, that that turned out to be um, uh, a fraud, and and I hope that, that uh, we've, in the in the course of this week, in the debates uh, on uh, these taxation issues, have made the Australian people aware that there's a real credibility problem here for the prime minister and the government, and that's what these debates have been about. Not not about not about the essential nature of changes to the tax regime, because I'm sure that any government of the day, and certainly we on this side, um, would have to uh, have to consider. Uh, acting in a fiscally responsible way, at, uh, depending on the time. But this, this debate and these debates have been about credibility. And what we've attempted to highlight in the contributions that we on this side have made to the debate is that we were promised otherwise. Now, now when, when, what's the difference between a broken promise and a lie, Mr Deputy Speaker? I submit that there's, that there's nothing. There's nothing. And what, and what are the Australian people to make of promises that were made to them before the last election that there'd be no tax increases? What, and, and dealing specifically with company taxes, we are here this morning. Uh, what, what are we to make of ironclad commitments by the Treasurer that this was to be a permanent reduction from to, to 33 per cent? This was, this was a major plank of the government's uh, policy in the lead up to the last election. I, I think in fact it was it was a it was a it was a brilliant move um, to come out very close to the election and, and announce a decrease in the company tax rate from thirty nine to thirty three per cent. In my view it was a, it was a very good political move and of course it was welcomed and, and the rationale for it was absolutely right that it was aimed um, to make us more competitive uh, internationally, and of course uh, that's one thing that Australia um, desperately needs to be, and that is more competitive on an international basis. And, and that did achieve that purpose. The rationale for it was to bring our company tax rates more into line um, with those uh, of some of our, uh, our, tax, uh, our, our uh, trading partners. And the Treasurer at the time, when he was asked, I believe, uh, said clearly that this was to be a permanent reduction, a permanent reduction. Now, that, there's nothing equivocal about that. There's nothing ambiguous about the word permanent, as far as I can understand. And, and, and of course, that's, that's our objection, is that in the context of an election, these things are done with, uh, for whatever, for, for good reasons. And I, I admit that. I mean, I support that. I supported that move, and I thought it was a very good political move. Um, but, uh, but in the end, of course, the word permanent apparently doesn't have that meaning as far as this government's concerned, and they can come in here, as the Treasurer did the other day, and uh, in answer to a question, attempt to uh, weave and duck his way around the meaning of the word permanent. Now, he made the point then, which I don't have any problem with, that the government has the right to, to change its uh, taxation regime from time to time to make it relevant and to, and to meet the, the demands of a particular uh, circumstances. And it may well be that the argument uh, does hold water, that uh, the reduction was to achieve a purpose at a point of time, and it may well be, although I don't accept that it is, but it may, it may be in some people's minds now uh, justifiable to, uh, to put those rates up again if the objective for reducing them were achieved. Um, but the fact is, and, let's, and this is the bottom line for all of these debates about tax, is that we were told that it would be otherwise, that it would be permanent, a permanent reduction. And uh, that's our objection as much as anything um, to the way these changes to the tax regime have been handled. It boils down to a debate not so much about tax and technical aspects of, of uh, taxes and, and our international competitiveness. It boils down simply to a, to a question of credibility and I don't see, and we didn't see the other day when we were debating tax, many of the government members coming in here um, to, to debate this issue with us. There's none here now. There is only one government member in this, in, in this uh, chamber at the moment, and that's the parliamentary secretary sitting at the table. Now, the people of Australia listening to this debate outside don't realise that, but I make the point 
that none of, us, none of us will come in to debate these issues with us because they know that they can't, they can't win technically um, because if you want to debate on a technical level, if you're talking about putting up tax, company tax, uh, then I don't think the circumstances have changed. Uh, Australia still needs to be internationally competitive, more so than ever, and, uh, and that was the reason for bringing company tax rates down to 33 per cent. In my, in my uh, estimation, it's an argument for bringing taxes, company tax rates down further rather than putting them up. Um, but, but in the end, of course, where we have the government totally over a barrel here is that this ultimately is an argument about the meaning of words. Uh, and uh, in our case, we are debating that we were told by the Prime Minister there would be no tax increases. We were promised tax cuts. They haven't been delivered. No matter how you, I mean, you can, you can duck and weave around that one as the Prime Minister does, and any government members, when they do dare to come in and debate this, try and duck and weave around that. But the fact is, the promised tax cuts, the legislated tax cuts, have not been delivered. Uh, some aspects of them were brought, part of it were brought forward, and now some has been deferred, to, to, or at least not even deferred, really, now changed totally in, in the way that they're going to be delivered in the uh, form of uh, contributions towards superannuation somewhere way, way down the track towards the year 2000 somewhere. So the debate ultimately is, is about the credibility of a government which uses or goes into an election campaign promising certain things, making certain statements. We had the same debate about the Medicare levy, where we'd been told uh, six months ago by the Minister for Health, no less, there would be no increase in the Medicare levy, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, I mean, there wasn't any equivocation about it. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't a door left open, as there might well have been. I mean, there can be arguments for why it should be increased. I suppose if you want to be really technically correct, it probably could be increased or ought to be increased to, to, to pay for the cost of, uh, of health care. I know we've had that debate, but the point is in this context we were promised that there wouldn't be an increase. Now we turn around, there is an increase. And so um, today, in dealing with the increase in company tax, uh, I could easily make a case for why uh, we should be uh, retaining it and for why it should be being reduced. But in the end, our fundamental reason for voting against this the reason for voting against it um, is our objection to the fraudulent way uh, in which these tax changes have been brought in. And, we, and we're voting against it to highlight um, that particular fact so that uh, people can be, uh, Austra the Australian people can be aware that we will not be a party um, to, a gut to uh, this sort of practice. If, if we'd have uh, had before the election a different approach, uh, and a, a responsible approach where this, this, wasn't, uh, this wasn't a matter of uh, promises being made and broken, then we may well have accepted, we may well have accepted that and, uh, and, and agreed uh, with the government that, 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 that there was some uh, fiscal reason for changing these tax rates. So um, we're going to oppose the rise in company tax rate because it's a breach of Labor's promise at the election not to increase taxes, and we intend to keep the Labor government, if we can, uh, both here in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, we intend to keep the Labor government to their election promises. Uh, they closed the door. They shut off the options for electoral purposes, and, uh, and they need to, uh, to, to pay the price. And the Australian people need to be aware that, for the purposes of this government getting re-elected last time, a fraud was perpetrated in terms of the commitments that were given and the actions that were taken by the government uh, to cut off those options. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, for the same reasons, of course, we're opposed to other tax increases, all of the tax increases, um, because the option is not there in our view in view of the promises were given to the government. Now, I have in my electorate um, a tourism-based economy. Most of the people who are contributing so much to a vibrant tourism industry are small businesses. And, uh, and of course, for that reason, I am opposing per se the tax increases, uh, the company tax increases, the increases in, uh, in uh, taxes on cars uh, and motor vehicles because they're such an integral part of the tourism industry. Um, and I am also opposed to uh, and, and violently opposed, I suppose, if you like, to increases in, uh, in indirect taxes on building materials, maybe mainly because the, this is the 
and, and joinery, because that actually, uh, well, I mean, we haven't got the answer to questions about how that's going to be handled yet. The amazing thing my, my, my friend uh, reminds me, of course, is that the government rushes into these things so often uh, in a half-baked way, and the taxation department, when it's phoned, of course, as, as now our constituents are phoning for, for some guidance from the tax department about how these increases in sales tax are to be applied, they don't have the answers. And of course, there's, there's chaos out there in the building industry while someone tries to sort out um, what the answers are. So I think it's ex it's most objectionable that we are to have uh, these increases in indirect taxes, which amount to a, a GST. Because once again, as a matter of credibility, the government's whole election strategy prior to the last election was to point to uh, increases in tax in indirect taxation and condemn us for them. And now we see, of course, the government doing that very same thing and, uh, and underestimating the impact into the bargain, as we've pointed out in question time. The budget papers say and provide for uh, an increase in the cost of an average home of around $400. Well, we've clearly demonstrated that vastly underestimates the cost and uh, the cost of an average home. Uh, well, certainly an average home in most cities of Australia is going to be something uh, much closer to $1,000 or in excess of $1,000. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I won't delay the House any further. I just want to take the opportunity of putting on behalf of my constituents uh, our strongest objection to these increased taxes, N not necessarily though we can argue against them per se, but because the credibility of the government here is at stake. We were promised no tax increases. We have tax increases. The question is the building error the second time. The honourable member for Dawson. Yeah, Mr Deputy Speaker, I certainly join with the uh, member for McPherson when he uh, talked about the low base on which the tax debate in Australia is taking place. The students up in the gallery at the moment would be expecting that there should be a debate somewhere in Australia about taxation. And yet we have a bill going through this parliament uh, at the, uh, opposed by uh, the coalition but where there are no government supporters. I just asked the question, Mr Deputy Speaker, are the members of the government so embarrassed? Were they taken so little into account in the formation of this uh, budget and these tax increases that they're not prepared to come here and uh, defend the government in this regard? I've got news for them. When they go back to their electorate and try to defend the budget, the budget increases, which were in direct contradiction to what the promises made by uh, the Prime Minister were at the last election, how they come to account for the fact that the, they are now imposing these tax burdens on people, on all Australians, and uh, there's none of the tax debate that some of the people of the visitors to this House would expect. And uh, there's, no re there's no doubt uh, why the embarrassment is there, uh, particularly when you take into account comments by the Prime Minister at the time just prior to the last election, and I just uh, mentioned this in connection with uh, uh, the uh, company rates of taxation, he said in, uh, on the 9th of February 1993, just one month short of the last election, that uh, we have decided that the simplest and most effective way to encourage Australian companies to work for Australia is to lower their tax burden. Coming on top of the accelerated depreciation allowances announced in One Nation, this will make the Australian corporate tax system highly competitive within the OECD countries. And he went on to say that, uh, more importantly, we will also be able to compete with countries in our region. Australian companies will thus be better placed to trade with Asia, the region where it is going to matter most. Quite significant. And the comment was made in a desperate grab to uh, outmanoeuvre uh, the uh, coalition with its fight back package. And uh, unfortunately, outmanoeuvre uh, was the manner in which it was done. And so, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I, I believe that in other respects of this bill, the sales tax component also, is that the, uh, the government and the Prime Minister particularly have reneged on so many things. And uh, the truth is now evident. It is now another Keating lie. Uh, the promise made at the last election was another Keating lie. Uh, could I just mention some others that uh, uh, have to be inclu included yes. in this. He said there'd be. There was a point of order. The withdraw those. The other will withdraw. No, I, I did not call the prime minister a lie. I just said it was a lie. 
and I believe that is parliamentary. parliamentary. I wasn't describing any person. I just said it was a lie. Well, it has upset some people, so I would suggest the honourable member withdraw that statement. Right, and uh, due to the sensitivity of the uh, only government member in the House, I withdraw it, and uh, I say that people will know in Australia who to trust at the next election when promises are made. Because I want to draw that analogy further. The uh, minister at the table encourages me to do so. Let's talk in terms of the personal tax breaks that were made law through this parliament prior to the last election. In this respect, you must spell law L-I-E, because they never eventuated, and they won't eventuate. And this budget does nothing to make them eventuate. Let's talk in terms of the Commonwealth Bank. The Treasurer quite categorically stated at the first issue of the, uh, of the shares in the Commonwealth Bank that there would be no reduction under the Commonwealth's 51 uh, per cent ownership. This budget sells the rest off. Uh, we also have the Medicare, uh, Medicare levy, a categorical promise made by the minister that there would be no increase in the Medicare levy. And there it is. We can talk about the GST. There would be no GST, even in spite of the fact that the Prime Minister thought in 1985-86 that it wasn't a bad idea. And at the moment, we have the worst and most pernicious form of indirect taxation in a huge increase in the sales tax. And uh, as I understand, since uh, that opposition to the GST in uh, 1993 by the Prime Minister, that the sales tax in Australia has more than doubled. And this uh, particular uh, budget increases sales tax by a massive 22.3 per cent. And as I say, it is the worst form because it is a blow to small business. And so all of these, uh, I must confess, Mr Deputy Speaker, referring again to the sensitivities of the, uh, uh, of the minister at the table, that there is no reason for the Australian people, small business, the taxpayers and the battlers of uh, Australia to trust the Prime Minister, irrespective of what he says or does by way of uh, the next uh, election. Uh, could I just go back to the announcement I read out first? Significantly, it was a decision, a policy decision made by the uh, Prime Minister on the 9th of February 1993. And here he is, coming to this uh, House with the audacity, both here and in the press, to demand of the, uh, uh, of the coalition that it produces its policies now. There we are, one month before the last election, his tax policy emerges, and now he has the hide to come and ask us to do better. And uh, I must say that the policy that I'm going to the next election on, and I believe it's the one that will win, it's a policy to get rid of Labor and the corruption that they've spread in connection with this budget and the manner in which they have spread the uh, deliberate misrepresentations and what they intend to do. When you look at the uh, whole aspect of the budget, uh, as far as the tax is concerned, they have just, again, as we have seen what they did in the last election, it is obviously what the Prime Minister is trying to do at this uh, time is make an issue by reducing interest rates. And uh, that's the target. And he's already achieved it in a uh, temporary, short-term reduction in interest rates. But uh, the question has to be asked, how in a budget that has fudged so much of this to arrive at a surplus is this going to happen? And this $320 million for the uh, company uh, tax alone uh, is just one of those fudges that he was able to bring that budget into uh, surplus. But I believe the, uh, the question has to be asked, and particularly in connection with companies that we're dealing with. Are Australian companies now better placed for the Asian trade to be able to afford a 3 per cent increase in uh, taxation? Could I uh, read from a media release from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, where uh, they had this to say, that the government's tax grab in lifting company rate, rate, tax rates by 3 per cent to 36 per cent is a shock for the corporate community. We all expected company tax to rise, but 3 per cent is totally unacceptable increase and will not assist companies in their efforts to continue the recovery from the recession. In addition, the new company rate tax puts us totally out of whack with Asia, where Singapore's corporate rate is 27 per cent and Indonesia's 30 per cent. And you don't have to be blind Freddy, they said, to see that this hurts our international competitiveness and our chances to attract overseas investment. 
This is particularly difficult when these economic economies are booming and providing extensive investment alternatives to their home countries. This makes the tax disadvantage against a country like Indonesia exactly 20 per cent. And uh, they uh, just went on to say they couldn't agree with it. Now, I think that's a, a damning indictment as to where we stand in trade uh, comp competition in trade with our Asian countries. Singapore 27 per cent, Indonesia 30 per cent, we're now 36 per cent. And uh, I know that you'd be very interested in this, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, for a, a person who uh, believes that Australia is way out of its economic problem at the moment, is through trade. We are disadvantaged once again, particularly in this investment area. Uh, could I uh, just say that companies not only have to bear this increase, they have to bear the continuing compliance cost on uh, other Commonwealth taxes, uh, capital gains, fringe benefit tax, uh, absolutely unintelligible in its present form, the, uh, guar the superannuation guarantee levy. And the other thing I must mention too, in the last uh, 10 years, this government has made an art of accelerating the collection of taxation from where it was at that time 10 years ago. They are now able to get into their coffers much earlier to uh, maintain this uh, fudge uh, surplus, as I say, taxes that wouldn't have been collected in arrears for about another 12 months, and yet they're in this uh, taxation uh, pool. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the other thing that uh, they're going to be faced with a headache is the uh, yet-to-be-announced manner in which the computation of dividends will be handled. Uh, it looks like we'll be having three regimes—39, 33, 36—an uh, allocation of uh, profits will have to uh, be separately, uh, separately kept, perhaps, but that is yet to be announced. It would uh, certainly help, I believe, the companies of Australia if they knew where they stood in this at the moment. And the other point that uh, was—I'm not sure whether it was an unintended consequence—certainly uh, it, was it wasn't highlighted during the budget, but these company rates of tax for a company that has a closing year uh, prior to the 30th of June is uh, likely to be paying the, 39 cents in, uh, the 36 cents in the dollar as from the time of their last closure of accounts. For instance, if it's February or March, they're now paying the full rate of 36, pence, uh, 36 uh, cents, and I believe that is retrospectivity. That is taxation by stealth. Uh, if we look at the budget itself, uh, and I'm uh, trying to uh, indicate that the uh, budget itself uh, is a uh, fudged uh, surplus, and I think it's easy enough to get to the actual amount if you uh, start with the basis that the actual deficit of this budget is $8.232 uh, $8 billion. Uh, you take off that the asset sale, which is uh, selling the, uh, the Australian family jewels, uh, $5.35 million, repayment of estate debt, to which my own state of Queensland was hap happy enough to oblige, $2.22 billion, an ABS adjustment, $1.378 and lo and behold, you get an implied uh, surplus of $718 million. Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm afraid I'd have to tell the government that there's no person outside in Australia that trusts this government to, uh, to understand that there is a real surplus there. They know we're in debt, they know we're in trouble, and uh, as I say, the improvement in the interest rate, I believe, will be very short term. Look at other aspects of the uh, budget. The uh, Treasurer has said this is a, uh, an expenditure-cutting budget. Could I just tell you, take you to the real figures before you reduce it by asset sales? 5.3 per cent increase across the board uh, as against an inflation rate or whatever you might want to compare it with of 2 or 3 per cent, a 5.3 per cent increase in uh, expenditure. And where does, uh, where does this get paid from? Companies are going to pay 15.4 per cent more, $17.14 billion this year. Sales tax, as I've already said, is going to collect a massive $14.16 billion, 22.3 per cent increase, and the total indirect tax rise is uh, some 13.4 per cent. So, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that's where the real deficit is, and that's how it's been arrived at. Uh, and as I said, the call, of course, will be to get the interest rates down. Uh, what it doesn't take into account is that real budget deficit. What it doesn't take into account, the current account is going to grind along 
and continually to produce outcomes of uh, more deficits than what Australia can afford. That will have an effect on the interest rates and the exchange rate, as pointed out here the other day by uh, the member for Parks. Over the last five months, the Australian dollar has fallen 8 per cent against the US dollar, 10 per cent against the US pound, 11 per cent against the New Zealand dollar, and uh, that's a, an economy that's booming across our way and could show us a few lessons if the government cared to look. Uh, 16 per cent against the German mark, 22 per cent against the Japanese yen. And uh, in amongst all of this, of course, we have the growth of the foreign debt. So uh, I can see uh, the manipulation of this budget for one reason only, to try to get interest rates down for a sufficiently long period to go to an election. But could I say that there's nobody out there believes this government in uh, anything that will happen? I know there's a still a huge hesitancy on the market as far as buying of houses are concerned, compounded by this uh, budget measure to increase joinery uh, to uh, put 12 per cent on uh, building costs or some building costs, and it's going to uh, cause a further hesitancy in that market. Mr uh, Deputy uh, uh, Speaker, all I can say is that the uh, Prime Minister's broken promises, after, in view of all his broken promises, that there will, there will be a false dawn on uh, falling interest rates and the reality will come later on. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, could I just speak in uh, terms of the uplift factor? Uh, I understand that we're going to have an amendment to this legislation. I believe this to be pernicious. It is also the means in which this government accelerates the payment of uh, its taxation, uh, in this case by a provisional tax and the uplift factor. It would be interesting to uh, find out the, uh, what, what is going to be the real case on this, because there are still a lot of people out there in small business that this provisional tax factor is going to hurt a lot. Finally, uh, could I uh, just read into uh, Hansard a, uh, the value of some research showing the uh, difference in uh, taxation between two classes of Australians, a single person as against a, uh, a family uh, taxation. And these figures go back to 1966-67, uh, appropriate because that was a change from the decimal currency. And the uh, particular uh, uh, schedule shows that tax as a, and we're dealing with uh, those two groups and I believe that the family is uh, where there's only one income earner and two dependent children. And the uh, survey shows this. Tax as a proportion of income has increased over this time for both groups, with that for the single person increasing by 15.5 per cent to 23.7 and for the family increasing from 5.9 to 16 per cent. The increase has been much greater for the family than for the single person. The family is now paying nearly two and three quarter times the proportion of income in tax than in 1966-67, uh, uh, while the single person is paying one and a half times. In 1988-89, peak year for tax as a proportion of income, the family paid three and a third times the uh, percentage in 1966-67, compared with one and two thirds uh, time, times for the uh, single person. The uh, marginal uh, tax rate has generally increased over the period. The family from 22.1 cents in the dollar to 36.9 cents. The single in, uh, person from 27.8 cents to 36.9 cents. For both types, the rate peaked at 47 cents in 84.85 and 85.86. The portion of the family's tax to the single income increased from 38% in 66.67 and peaked at 75% in 88.89 and has dropped back to 67 per cent by 93.94. Uh, the schedule quite clearly shows that those people who take the option, uh, those families that take the option uh, of having a parent at home to look after the children uh, have increased their uh, rate of taxation in comparison to the uh, single income from 38 per cent in 66.67 to 67.4 per cent now. Now, I believe, uh, Mr uh, Speaker, that the uh, whole budget, uh, and they're the people that might have been helped if it wasn't for uh, what the, uh, the government has deliberately done to defranchise single income families from the benefits that I believe they should, uh, uh, should be getting but are being denied by uh, excessive uh, taxation. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I believe that the next election will be fought on issues such as this. Promises made, promises not kept. An excessive ability of, by this government to fudge the figures 
and accelerate the uh, collection of taxation. It doesn't matter where it comes to. But I just call back on those members of the government who aren't in here debating this, that when they go back to try to explain to uh, their constituents, as from the 1st of July, why the cost of their houses are going up, why uh, their motor car has increased by 5 per cent, uh, the, uh, the, the cost of their motor car, and uh, also that 1 per cent silent factor across all uh, uh, sales tax increases that will eventuate on that 1st of July. And out of all of this, the promise of that tax deduction of uh, 1993 uh, that has not been forthcoming would have been most welcome. Now, you can't expect uh, Australians to providing savings when taxation is denying them the ability to save. You can't talk about savings in the form of superannuation because it's a very limited form of saving and doesn't flow back into the economy in producing the small businesses and those other uh, resources that are so ne are necessary for us to uh, really go ahead. And could I just mention once again the perniciousness of a sales tax that has to be borne by a small business and uh, when we're competing overseas with that uh, rate of uh, indirect taxation built into our costs, there is no wonder we are becoming uncompetitive with our Asian neighbours, with our European countries and places like that that do have a VAT arrangement that reduces that taxation from the uh, component of what it is. And uh, when we talk in terms of our proposed FBT of 15 per cent, uh, our uh, GST of 15 per cent, the government overlooks completely the compensating factors of the reduction of so many of their other taxation measures and the increase of pensions to compensate for that. They quite conveniently forget to say anything about it. So, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I'll be opposing the, uh, the bill, as the coalition is, and uh, I just believe it is food Order. for thought for the people of the Australia. The honourable member's time has expired. The question is that the bill be now read the second time. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, I was very surprised to hear the GST uh, mentioned there. I thought the Shadow Treasurer might have gone over and tapped you on the shoulder and said, listen, don't mention that one again. It's like the old Monty Python uh, sketch where he said, don't mention the war. I thought you'd be uh, exactly Foldy Towers. Foldy towers. <laughs> I stand corrected. Foldy Towers. Don't mention the war. Don't mention the GST. Well, look, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, let me just say this. I'd like to thank all those who participated in the, in the debate. I am aware of the opposition's position uh, on this bill, but of course we believe that the budget bills that we bought in this year are responsible. They achieve the government's objectives of, uh, of um, putting downward pressure on interest rates, sustaining the recovery into the future. And there were a few points uh, made in the, um, in the debate that I want to respond to. I think the uh, shadow treasurer asked us to have a look at this government's history on taxes, and I'm very happy to do that. I mean, we didn't have much to beat. When we, came, when we became the government in 1983, we had a taxation system that, that royal commissioners said of it, not the government or the opposition, but royal commissioners said of it, that there was optional tax for the rich, that the fastest growing industry in Australia was tax avoidance. I mean, that's where we started from in 1983. And it was left, left to this government to put some respectability back into the tax laws introducing things like a capital gains tax. I mean, Australia was one of the few countries in the world that didn't have a capital gains tax, and we saw what happened without one. I mean, the bottom of the harbour schemes, the money laundering schemes of the, uh, of the 70s and 80s only happened because we didn't have a capital gains tax. And we had to bring that in with uh, opposition from, uh, from the Liberal and, and uh, National parties. The fringe benefits tax, once again opposed, but an eminently fair measure which was opposed by the opposition of the day, but, of course, looking back on it now, you wonder how we got by without it. What that's allowed us to do is to drop the company tax rate, oh, sorry, the top tax rate under Mr Howard from 60 cents down to 47 cents and the bottom tax rate from 30 down to 20, uh, 20 per cent. Now, there's been a, a, a few words uttered about the company tax rate. Well, once again, let's have a look at our record on that. When we became the government... Break the promise. 46 per cent. 46 per cent. Never admit. Never admit anything. 46 per cent. I, t I, I get lessons off Wilson. 46 per cent uh, it was when we became the government. We dropped it down to 30, 33 per cent. It's going back to 36 per cent. Once again, as I said, because this is a responsible budget and there was a need on the fiscal side to address 
uh, address the parameters of the budget. So it goes back to 33 per cent. But what did the opposition say at the last election? No, we're going to have 42 per cent. We're still 6 per cent lower than they were with full dividend imputation. I mean, back in the good old days, we had, uh, we had uh, company tax rate under Mr Howard at 46 cents and the profits were distributed and taxed once again. And if you were a top marginal tax taxpayer, you were charged 60 cents on those dividends. I mean, what sort of investment, what sort of incentive for investment was that? Nowadays, 36 cents, full dividend imputation. One of the few countries in the world that's got it. But of course, we hear about all these comparisons about the tax rate with, uh, with our neighbours, and of course, 36 cents is still competitive. But there are other factors that go into making business decisions about where you're going to put your business. Things like having an educated workforce, about the cost of doing business in Australia, which is a fraction that of what it is in some of the countries that have been mentioned in this debate, having infrastructure in this country that can handle the investment that's being made of it. This is particularly the case in tele telecommunications. The living environment for the executives of these companies is a big factor in where some of these companies put their investment. And of course, the political stability of this country, all of those factors, as well as the tax rate, go into making uh, Australia a very attractive uh, country in which to, uh, to invest, and we're seeing that investment. In fact, when we're talking about regional headquarters, we see regional headquarters being um, established here in Australia over and above the, uh, the countries mentioned by some of the speakers in this, in this debate. Now, the other point that's been made in this debate that we've We've relied too heavily on the taxation side, but not on, on cutting spending. Let me just say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that cutting spending is not a one-year exercise. You don't do it every year and, and come up with big figures. Now, let me just give you a fact. The fact of, fact of the matter is, when we talk about spending cuts, if we were spending money at the same rate as John Howard was when he was Treasurer, we would be spending an extra $17,000 million this year. That is. Since 1983 to up to today, we've cut $17,000 million as a percentage of GDP out of outlays. Now, when, you start cut, when you've made cuts of that magnitude, it's always harder to make more substantial cuts. In fact, uh, I was told out of Treasury the easiest way, of course, to uh, make cuts is to stop indexation of Social Security benefits. That'll raise you a couple of billion dollars a year. And, of course, that's what the previous government did. Uh, previous uh, government did when it was uh, previous the present opposition did when it was in government. What they did was not index eight, not index pensions. It saves a couple of billion dollars a year in today's dollars. But of course, the people who underwrite that are the people who can least afford it, and it's nothing that a Labor government would do. Now, in the debate, also, I'm told that uh, sales tax refunds uh, featured. The government is of the view that sales tax is not paid by the uh, retailer. It's paid by the person who is buying the goods, to the, to, to the, extent, to the extent that— uh, to the, to the, to the, no, well, do, you, do you understand how business works? I know it's pretty hard for lawyer, but wholesale himself. sales tax is usually passed on to the consumer. And what I'm saying is the consumer who pays the tax, it's the wholesale who collects it. Now, we're agreed on that, aren't we? We're agreed on that? And, and, and we are agreed that it's a consumer tax, are we? We're, we're agreed are you that saying it's a consumer tax? It. No. Mr. Speaker, is, is he taking Will a point of order? Your seat, please. We're the agreeing the consumer chamber, pays, don't we? The chamber yeah. does not allow. We're agreeing the consumer pays. Yeah. Who do you think time. pays the tax? This is a novel view from the shadow treasurer that it's the wholesaler that pays the tax. Of course, it's not. The, the minister wholesaler... would be well advised to cease replying okay. to interjections. It's very hard, I know. But no. And the honourable big fopa. The deputy Listen, leader of the opposition. I'm trying to, I'm trying to educate the shadow treasurer about how the things work in the real world. The wholesale sales tax is passed on to the consumer. Do you agree with that? So, therefore, if there is an overpayment, who should, uh, who should get the benefit of that overpayment? Should it be the consumer who's paid the tax, or should it be the wholesaler who's collected it? I mean, that's the central point. And what we're saying is that, by and large, it's the consumer if you can identify them. Because there is one case, or there has been one case, where we could identify the consumers, and that's when swimming pools, when there was a tax on swimming pools which was found to be unconstitutional. The consumer was able to be identified, and we didn't pay it back to the person who put the pool on the ground. We paid it to the person who purchased the pool. Why should we pay it to the person who put the pool on the ground? All he did was charge the end consumer. So, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, that's the, uh, that's the uh, thrust of the bill. The fact is, if we were to give it back to uh, retailers, it's just a windfall for them. 
So in this bill, we've, uh, we've made sure that they don't get that windfall, and that's the way the uh, legislation is framed. There are a couple of things that I'd just like to finish on. The reprogrammable chips, I'm, I'm happy that the opposition is supporting the government on this. And it just, just show, not, opposing. not opposing. Well, I'm glad they're not opposing this, because when it was foisted on us in the Senate, I mean, the point was made back then that it was going to cost the revenue. It would, it would influence the way in which businesses carried out their operations. I mean, obviously, if you've got a, a, a programmable chip on which there is a dedicated program, and you can put that same program on a reprogrammable chip, and there are different tax rates for both of them, of course manufacturers are going to go for the reprogrammable chip. Why wouldn't they? They get a big tax break. Now, the sort of things we're talking about here, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the importation of portable telephones, where, where the importer was actually taking these telephones out of the boxes, out of the plastic, taking the backs off these telephones, putting in a reprogrammable chip, putting them all back together again just to get a tax break. Now, is that good business? And it's costing the revenue $150 million a year. I mean, the Democrats should be exposed on this one. They were told at the time that this would happen. It has happened. We've gone uh, in this bill to remedy that, but we should never forget that it was the Democrats, aided by the opposition, I might say, who foisted this amendment on it, uh, uh, amendment on the government, and it's cost us $150 million. $150 million. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm glad that the opposition is not opposing this. In actual fact, they should be supporting it. I mean, it's, uh, it's a sign of the way the opposition conducts itself around this place that you can't get a decent commitment out on, on anything. If there's a fence to be sat on, they'll sit on it. Finally, uh, the last speaker talked about what the next election was going to be fought on, as always, about a vision for the future on jobs, on education, on health, and, might I say, on the Republic might have a, might have a say or two as well. But one thing we can be sure of. The government has a proud record on tax, a proud record on tax, and we're happy to stand by that record. My question is: the bill be now read a second time? All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes. The taxation laws amendment, budget measures, bill 1995. The budget bill. You're not going to put. Can I just clarify? We've been debating two bills cognately, um, and I'd like to. Uh, deal with the two bills separately when it comes to committee consideration. We are now going to move reading. on to consideration of the bill in detail. Right. Now, it's the budget measures bill that you're mm -hmm. putting. Is that right? Yes. yes. Okay. The House would now consider the uh, clerk, sorry. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation. The House would now consider the bill in detail. Clauses one to three is that the wish that they be taken uh, by leave together. It is. Uh, the question is that the clause be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Schedules one and two is the wish of the House that they be taken by leave together. It is. The question is that the schedules be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Schedule three. The honourable member for Higgins. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I indicated uh, in my speech at the second reading stage, uh, items in Schedule 3 uh, are the consequential amendments uh, to the government's fraudulent increase of sales tax on motor cars in breach of its election program. As a consequence, uh, we oppose those consequential measures. Uh, I move that in Schedule 3, page 5, omit item 3, and in Schedule 3, page 6, uh, omit part 2, items 5 and 6. The question is that the items proposed to be omitted be so omitted. I'll put the question. All those of that opinion say aye. To the country, no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. A division required. Ring the bells.
Yeah. Real thing, that's it. Lock the doors. Order. The question is that the items proposed to be omitted be so omitted. I appoint as tellers for the eyes the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina, and for the nose the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 60, noes 72. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. Will I go on? Yes. Will I go on to it now? <coughs> the question now is that the schedule be agreed to. All those that have opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the no's have it. Oh, I think the eyes have it. And the eyes do have it. Sorry. Do we wait? Schedules. Four to nine. Is the wish of the House that they be taken by leave together? It is. Uh, the Honourable Member for Higgins. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, oh, members who do not intend to stay for the debate, please see the chamber. I should really move that they be omitted, shouldn't I, rather than opposed? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I've already outlined uh, in the second reading speech. Uh, the coalition opposes uh, those schedules um, 4, 5, 6, uh, 7, 8 and 9. Uh, that, uh, a number of those schedules are in fact uh, consequential amendments to sales tax provisions to implement uh, the government's tax fraud by increasing uh, sales tax on passenger motor vehicles. The coalition opposes those, obviously. It also opposes uh, the amendments relating to refunds of sales tax, which deny common law rights uh, to persons who should be seeking reimbursement uh, in accordance with law. The question is that the schedules be agreed to. All those that have opinion say aye, to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. <laughs> now you're on this side.
<laughs> and I want my Lock the doors. Order. The question is that the schedules be agreed to. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide as teller for the eyes, and the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina as teller for the nose.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 70, noes 62. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. We come now to new schedule 10. Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the government amendment uh, circulated in my name. The question is that the schedule proposed to be added be so added. The honourable member for Higgins. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the amendment circulated in my name. The government's amendment attempts to implement the budget announcement to set the provisional uplift tax uplift factor at 8 per cent for 1995-6. Those that do not have tax deducted under PAYE and pay provisional tax either quarterly or in one instalment will under the proposal put forward by the government be assessed for an increase in their income at the rate of 8 per cent. The government's proposal assumes that all those people who pay provisional tax will have an 8 per cent increase in their income in 95-6 over 94-5. They are required to pay tax on this assumed increase. I have moved an amendment on behalf of the Coalition which will set the uplift factor at 6 per cent for 1995-6. In doing so, the Coalition is acting on our commitment to small business and self-funded retirees. There are around 800,000 small businesses and investors who pay provisional tax. They are hit by this budget Order. measure. There is far too much noise the coalition in the believes that the uplift factor should be set at a realistic level, which is more consistent with expected rates of income growth and inflation. Headline inflation for the year to March is 3.9 per cent. Why then assume an average income for a provisional taxpayer will rise by 8 per cent? The government refuses to nominate the factors other than the inflation rate which are taken into account in setting the uplift factor. Of course, at the end of the day, a taxpayer pays taxes assessed on assessable income. If a provisional taxpayer's income will not rise by 8 per cent, they can apply for a variation. But this is an administrative, additional administrative burden and carries with it some risk. If they estimate uh, not within a 15 per cent band, they can be liable for additional tax. Uh, alternatively, they pay it and can claim a credit when they file their 95-96 return. But the effect of that is to give the tax office the tax in the meantime. The tax paid eventually is evened out, but the cash flow advantage under this flows to the tax office. The cash flow penalty pays to the taxpayer. An inflated uplift factor is a direct assault on small business. Small business has a difficult time as it is trying to survive. This is not as good as it ever gets. It can get much better. And we, as part of our commitment to make it much better for small business, are therefore seeking to reduce the provisional tax uplift factor to 6 per cent. By maintaining such an unrealistic uplift factor, the Labor government is causing unnecessary cash flow problems for small business. Now, the provisional tax uplift factor has been the subject of much discussion and criticism. Currently, there is a reference before the Senate Economics Committee. Many groups have given, com given compelling evidence for the uplift factor to be examined and reduced. The Australian Society of Certified Practicing Accountants gave evidence it is hard for their members and advisers to, to tell small business that the rationale behind an 8 per cent increase is an assumption of 8 per cent increase in their income. Everybody would be happy with an 8 per cent increase in their income. The fact is that most do not find it the reality. The Society gave evidence that if there is an uplift factor, it should be in the order of the current level of inflation. The Taxation Institute gave evidence to the same effect. The Printing and Allied Trades Employers Federation uh, said that the low inflationary environment of recent times and the determination of monetary authorities to maintain inflation below 3 per cent has made a mockery of the federal government's refusal to reduce the provisional tax uplift factor. Now, we warned at the time of the budget last year that unless the government could come up with some sensible and coherent reason why this factor should be set at 8 per cent, we would be opposing it this time around. They might say that inflation and allowance for real growth means you should have a margin on top of inflation. But we would be prepared on that to allow generously 6 per cent. 8 per cent 
is just plain greedy by the government. 8 per cent is just plainly punitive on small business and retirees. Our amendment seeks to reduce the uplift factor to 6 per cent. If that fails, and I hope it doesn't, we would be forced to vote for the government's amendment because that's the only way we could get 8 per cent. If nothing goes through the House, it would actually go back to 10 per cent uh, as a consequence of the way in which the government has structured it. But I call on those in this House that support small business, those in this House that support the self-funded retirees, those in this House that believe in taxation, equity and freedom, to support a 6 per cent uplift factor to make sure that the government doesn't get the benefit of the cash flow and to make sure that small business is not penalised by greedy government in this country. Deputy Speaker, I want to support in the strongest possible terms uh, my colleague, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. It is outrageous that small business in particular, but business in general, should be uh, confronted with an uplift factor, pulled out of the hat, as it were, uh, set at 8 per cent, when uh, the government, in its own budget forecasts, anticipates an increase in the consumer price index of 4 per cent. This, is, uh, this uplift factor by the government at 8 per cent is proposed at the time when it's crowing about the increased share of business profits that it's been restored to something like uh, what it would see as desirable. Now, while I and I'm sure my colleagues on this side don't agree that that is the case, it is nevertheless another reason for, uh, for opposing this grubby little tax grab as represented by a proposed uplift factor. In fact, I think the uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition on behalf of the Coalition is being unduly generous in suggesting that it be at 6 per cent. I mean, it is, it is very hard to justify that the, an uplift factor being in excess of the anticipated rate of inflation for the coming year. Now, we've got the, 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 share, the profit shares up to a level which uh, get the government excited, at least in its rep rhetoric. But you've got to look into this, and uh, you've got to look at this uh, with the background knowledge that this government has, has not only increased taxes consistently over the years. I mean, something like 300%, uh, more than 300% increase in uh, in company tax during the period of its incumbency. That's not a bad effort, and that's in real terms because total business, the total business tax take over 13 Labor budgets will have increased by something like 370 per cent. Now, if you're just for inflation, if you take that, uh, inflation away from that, it's uh, around the 300 per cent that I've just mentioned before. And on top of that, of course, they brought forward collections. That's the most insidious of all tax grabs under this government. And uh, we, we now know that uh, quarterly uh, tax uh, instalments have been brought forward at every opportunity and on more than one occasion so that they're getting the absolute maximum but that, that they possibly can. But the real problem with that, the real sin in all of that is that it has made grave inroads into the working capital and into the cash flows of businesses. You cannot underestimate what this has meant in terms of raiding the ability of businesses to continue to expand and to continue their efforts to improve performance and to become more competitive, as would seem to be the objective of the government, but which in effect is entirely counterproductive. Now, the honourable member for Higgins, the deputy leader of the opposition, has made it clear that while you can, of course, apply for a variation of your provisional tax bill, uh, you do run a grave risk. And uh, whilst not many would be that far out, it is not many that will take the risk of being outside the, uh, outside the uh, tolerances allowed by the Australian Taxation Office. And if they happen to go out, uh, fall outside those, uh, those uh, tolerances allowed, they incur very, very savage penalties indeed. 
to the extent that they are punitively, uh, punitive and excessively punitive, Mr Deputy Speaker. I simply want to be on record as supporting 100 per cent the amendment uh, moved by my colleague, the Deputy Leader, and, uh, but I do have this one small qualification. I think he's being unduly generous in, frame, in, in putting that up, his proposed amendment, at 6 per cent. At 6 per cent. And, uh, well, no, I think, uh, I think you've seen me trot to the other side when it's, uh, when it's been warranted, uh, I say, to the honourable member for Wills, and I certainly don't think it's warranted on this occasion because, amongst other things, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is demonstrating the commitment of the Coalition to the interests of small businesses in Australia in particular, but more generally to the business sector. And, of course, in that he and we have impeccable records. Um, the question is that the amendment to proposed Schedule 10 be agreed to. All those that opinion. Yeah, it's your amendment. Be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. <coughs> Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Chair about three times. There you go. You
lock the doors. Order. The question is that the amendment to proposed Schedule 10 be agreed to. I appoint the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina as tellers for the eyes, and the honourable members for Fowler and uh, Port Adelaide as tellers for the nose. Charles Halverson Woolridge. Talking and you may be waiting for you. We're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for Order. The result of the division is eyes sixty three. 
noes 70. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. Would members resume their seats, please? Would members hasten to resume their seats, please, or else leave the chamber? The question now is that the schedule proposed to be added be so added. All those that have been say aye, to the contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. The bill as amended now. The title. All right. The question is that the title be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye to the country, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill as amended has been agreed to. Minister? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the I think the ayes have it. I heard a couple of no's there. Reading a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation. Order the day number three, income tax rates amendment bill 1995. Motion for second reading. Minister? I move that this bill be now read a second time. The question is the bill be now read a second time. No. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. No. Those? The House will divide. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide as tellers for the eyes, and the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina as tellers for the nose. Order. The result of the division is eyes 72, nose 60. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Clark? A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation. Is it the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith? It is. Minister? Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Oh. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those that have been to say aye to the country, no. I think the ayes have it. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation. Order of the day number four, local government financial assistance bill 1995, motion for second reading. I'm not sure where we're writing out. The Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Local government is close to the community it services, has a wide range of representative, representational, executive and community service functions which impact on the quality of life of all Australians. 
Local government plays an important role in achieving a range of national priorities in the areas of microeconomic reform, urban reform, regional economic development, environment and social justice. In recognition of the importance of local government, the Commonwealth currently provides in excess of $1 billion in grants to local government. These grants are untired, allowing them to be spent by individual councils in accordance with the priorities they determine. Mr Speaker, this bill provides for the continuation of these untied grants to local councils and for continuation of their annual escalation formula. The bill also includes important reforms in relation to the transparency and accountability for these grants, including outcomes achieved by local government bodies. I should emphasise that the bill does not impose conditions on the way in which local governing bodies can spend their grants. Rather, it requires that information on the distribution of Commonwealth grants and the performance of recipient local government bodies be available for scrutiny by this parliament and the people of Australia. The need for these reforms arose out of studies undertaken as part of the Australian Urban and Regional Development Review and extensive consultations and discussions with state governments, the Australian and State Local Government Association and individual local government, uh, government bodies. Untired Commonwealth funding to local government has been provided under various acts since 1974. Although the actual arrangements have been subject to various amendments since that time, all Commonwealth governments, no matter what their political persuasion, have recognised its importance to local government and agreed to the funding continuing. Under the existing Act, there are two components to the untied funding. The first is a general grant component, which represents around two-thirds of total financial assistance grants. This funding is allocated between the states and the Northern Territory on a per capita basis, with the intrastate distribution being undertaken primarily on horizontal equalisation basis. That is, the funding is provided on a basis that ensures that each local governing body in the state or territory is able to function by reasonable effort at a standard not lower than the average standard of other local government body, governing bodies in the state. The second component, making up the remaining untied funding, relates to identified local road funding. Prior to 1991, uh, <coughs> funding for local roads was delivered under tied arrangements. In 1991, this government amended the existing Local Government Financial Assistance Act 1986 to give effect to the 1990 Special Con Premier's Conference decision to untie local roads funds and pay these via general purpose grants. These funds are allocated amongst the state and territories on a historical funding basis, with intrastate distribution being made on a road needs basis. This bill maintains all these features in the current, in the of the existing Act, but removes the provision in the current Act which would see local road funds being absorbed in general grants with effect from 1995-96. The bill gives effect to the Premier's conference decision of the 11th of April 1995 to continue to distribute local road funding on the basis of historical shares rather than having absorbed into local government general grants and distributed on a per capita basis. Absorption of local road funding into the general grants would result in a distribution among states resulting in significant funding reductions to Western Australia, Tasmania, the Northern Territory and Queensland, and would also lead to changes in the interstate distribution of these funds in all states which would disadvantage rural and remote areas. The continued separate identification of local road funds has strong support from local government and from all state and local government ministers. Escalation of local government funding is determined by the Treasurer in consultation with the responsible minister, having regard to the level of assistance grants and special revenue assistance paid to the states each year. This linkage means that the escalation factor for local government financial assistance grants takes account of inflation and population growth. The bill provides for the development of national principles applicable to all states and Northern Territory governing the intrastate distribution of grants. National principles in lieu of bilateral principles provide the nationally consistent and transparent basis for allocating funds to local government bodies. 
Application of common principles should ensure, subject to the particular methodology of the State and Territories Grants Commissions, that similar councils receive similar grants, at least in relative terms. National principles will be determined after consultation with the States and Territories and the Australian Local Government Association, with a view to receiving a common view on their, com on their content. Where there are disagreements, the Commonwealth has undertaken to seek the views of the Local Government Minister's Conference. Allocations among local government bodies will continue to be made by local government grant commissions. The bill contains major enhancements to the accountability arrangements. The Minister will be required to present an annual report to Parliament, replacing the current requirement, which only requires presentation of the various state territory recommendations. The new national report will include information on the grants to individual councils and the categories of councils. It will report on State Grants Commission's methodology in relation to both equalisation and local grant, grant, road grants, on achievement of horizontal equalisation amongst councils and on council efficiency and effectiveness. The report will also provide information on the operation of the Act in relation to service delivery to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. I'm sure that honourable, honourable members will welcome the opportunity to being kept informed about the funds paid to local governments and their electorates, and recognise that local government efficiency and effectiveness and service delivery to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are important and legitimate national priorities. Reporting on services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, of course, will not be a simple task. The Commonwealth does not hold most of the information and we'll need to work hard and cooperatively to ensure data are comparable and meaningful. In this regard, the Commonwealth is pleased to note that local government shares the national objective of ensuring that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities have equitable access to services. The Commonwealth particularly welcomes the resolution of the Local Government Ministers' Conference, including the Australian Local Government Association, in April this year concerning services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. The Commonwealth will consult widely and fully with local government and states in developing data. The bill provides for the Act to be reviewed prior to 30 June 2001 and establishes particular issues that such a review must examine. The aim is to ensure that the Act is delivering the intended reforms. In developing this bill, I have also taken the opportunity to address a number of administrative matters. The monies under this bill are appropriated by the Department of Housing and Regional Development and paid by that department to the states. This replaces the current provision under which the Treasury makes the payments and is aligned with the principle that the department administering the legislation should look after the funding. Payments to the Australian Capital Territory included for the first time in line with the requirements to treat the ACT in the same manner as all other states in the Northern Territory. Previous local government funding to the ACT was by way of analogous payment, estimated using the same factors as were applicable to the other states. This change does not affect the grant outcomes for the state and territories. The bill provides for an earlier announcement of the estimated funding levels for the coming financial year. This has been done to facilitate announcement of funding in May rather than the August budget. The change responds to requests from some states for an earlier announcement to allow for individual council distributions to be included in council rate setting assessment for the coming year. In order to allow for early announcement, an estimated entitlement for local government funding is determined at the time of the Commonwealth budget based on the estimated growth in state general purpose funding. Once estimates have been produced for budget purposes and conveyed to state governments, no further adjustments will occur until the year following the year of the payments. Adjustments of these estimates would be done when providing estimates for next year's budget, with the final entitlement being established when the last payment is determined for state general payments, that is, by the end of June in any year. <coughs> Mr Speaker, this change is necessitating altering the formulas included in the bill, but the final funding to local government is still the same as it would have been under the current legislation. The advantage is that local government will know much earlier the level of funding they can expect in the coming year. 
Transitional provisions are included to ensure that changes to new legislation will create as little disruption as possible to council distributions. Distributions for 95-96 will occur as if the current legislation was still in place. The bill also provides that the minister may determine, if necessary, and on a state-by-state -state basis, phase in arrangements to take account of the impact on councils of the new national principles. Mr Speaker, I commend this bill to the House. The question is that the bill be read a second time. I call the honourable member for Maranoa. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I welcome the opportunity to participate in the consideration by the House of the Local Government Financial Assistance Act of 1995. This is probably the most important piece of legislation affecting local government to come before the House in many years. The bill replaces the Local Government Financial Assistance Act of 1986, under which the federal financial assistance grants were provided to local government. The bill continues current arrangements under which the federal assistance grants is provided in two separately identified categories. The first of these is general purpose grants, which are paid on a per capita basis to each state and territory and distributed between councils on a horizontal equalisation basis. The second category is identified load, local roads grants, which are distributed between the states and territories according to an historical formula based on their relative road needs. There are indeed a number of useful features of the bill, which are an improvement on the current arrangements. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to see that councils will now be receiving early advice on their annual allocations, which can only assist them in forward planning and framing their own budgets. And it's a particularly important point for many local councils out there at a time when they're trying to become more efficient with their ratepayers funds to know well in advance of their own budget considerations what assistance will be coming from the Commonwealth. So this reform is long overdue. The introduction of national principles to govern the intrastate distribution of financial assistance grants is a welcome attempt to introduce more consistency in the intrastate distribution of financial assistance grants. The draft principles, which may or may not be the version finally declared by the minister, do seem, however, to have been framed with a view to ensuring there is as little change as possible in the current distribution of funding. Now, while this has the support of, st of the states and local government, it does appear that the national principles are just a continuation of current arrangements with just a little window dressing. For the first time, funding for the Australian Capital Territory will be included in the local government financial assistance arrangements. Now, this will replace local government type funding for the Territory currently provided through other legislation. And it, it continues the process of putting the Territory on the same footing as the Commonwealth funding purposes as the States and the Northern Territory. And I'm, it is a welcome move. Now, I commend the Minister for his confidence in the new Liberal administration of the Chief Minister Kate Carnell, which, he has, taken, which uh, has taken, in the AC, or taken office in the ACT. So it is a, a step forward, and we do commend the Minister for his, uh, his confidence in the new Liberal administration here in the ACT. I'm also pleased to see that the minister has seen the light and decided not to <coughs> propose the absorption of the untied local road funds into the general purpose assistance grants. Absorption of the local road funds, which will automatically occur under the current legislation, would have meant that for the first time interstate distribution of road funds would have been made on a per capita basis. Now, this would result in major reductions in the proportion of local road funding provided to Western Australia, Queensland, Tasmania, the Northern Territory and the Australian Capital Territory.
territory. Now, the Minister has obviously accepted the advice of the recent review of Local Government Financial Assistance Act of 1986, which found that absorption of local roads grants into the horizontal equalisation process would cause major disruption. The review favoured the continuation of, funding of the uh, current funding arrangements. Mr Deputy Speaker, while recognising these positive aspects of the bill, the opposition does have serious problems with a number of its key aspects. These concerns reflect the opposition's broader concerns about the government's approach to local government issues generally. The absence of any real funding commitment to local councils, the shallowness of the government's record of consultation with local government and its brazen disregard of, <clears throat> of agreements reached with the other two levels of government are squarely exposed in this bill. It is also apparent in the bill it is also apparent that the bill will do remarkably little towards achieving its stated objectives. Now the minister's second reading speech is long on rhetoric, but when you read the bill you quickly discover that the cupboard is bare. A major a major failing of the bill is that it continues the perilous level of funding for local councils that local government have become used to. In 1983, when the government came to office, the federal general purpose assistance grants to local councils comprised 1.03 per cent of total tax Commonwealth revenues. By 1995-96, this year share will have declined to 0.67 per cent. Now, while total tax federal revenues increased by 29 per cent in real terms over this period, the real level of financial assistance grants fell by 3 per cent. The fundamental problem which confronts Council is, is that the present government has built into the budgetary framework a level of funding for local government which will be difficult to retrieve in the short term. Although the government has foreshadowed a real terms per capita maintenance of local government funding commencing in 1997-98, this has not been enshrined in the bill. The impact of, fund, of the funding decline is most felt by rural councils, which struggle to be able to provide the essential services that their ratepayers come to expect. The worsening condition of our <coughs> local road network, declining standards of health care and rising property rates are all consequences of the federal government's shabby treatment of Australia's third tier or third sphere of government in this nation. Other federal programs which assist local government in carrying out its functions, such as the Road Safety Black Spots Program and the urban, Federal Urban Public Transport Program, have been abolished since the, since the uh, Labor Party have come to power. The various state local government associations have written to all federal members of parliament to voice their concerns about the bill. According to councils, and I urge every member to think carefully about the issues raised in these letters by the councils, and that is their concern is that the bill is seriously flawed in a number of respects. Local government and state and territory governments have also made known their disgust at the way in which this bill ignores key agreements reached between the three levels of government on how the new local government funding arrangements would be implemented. Now, the opposition share these concerns, and I would now like to address the particular aspects of the bill with which we have on this side take issue. They include, Mr Deputy Speaker, the failure of the bill to require the government to consult with local government on the preparation of the national principles for the interstate distribution of the financial assistance grants. 
And secondly, <clears throat> the absence of any parliamentary oversight of the federal minister's power to declare national principles for the distribution of financial assistance grants. And thirdly, the failure of the bill to require the minister to consult with the states and local government in the preparation of the report to parliament on the operation of the legislation. Mr Deputy Speaker, I foreshadow that at the detail stage of the consideration of this bill, I will move amendments to remedy these defects. A major feature of the bill is the inclusion for the first time of specific objects. These objects include improving the provision by local councils of services to Aboriginal communities and improving the efficiency and effectiveness of local councils. Now, no member of this House could disagree with these aims. But when you read the legislation to try to discover how these objectives will be achieved, you are left none the wiser. The bill provides no strategy to promote the achievement of these objectives. However, the minister will be required to report to parliament annually on how councils have met these objectives specified for them in the bill. For the first time, in relation to local government payments, the federal minister will be required to table in parliament an annual report on the operation of the financial assistance grants legislation. This will include the extent to which the funds have been allocated on a horizontal equalisation basis and on the performance by councils of their functions, including their efficiency and provision of council services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. The Australian Local Government Association and the state and territory ministers believe the government has breached a firm undertaking that any reporting arrangements are to be made to the local government ministers' conference. The federal government had agreed that reporting on council's performance would be dealt with under the auspices of the regular local government ministers' meetings, rather than to parliament in the first instance. There has been no agreement on the form which the report should take or on the detail of the benchmarking arrangements to be implemented. These issues were to be the subject of further investigation by officials and advice to ministers next year. Mr Deputy Speaker, I give notice that I will move an amendment requiring the federal minister to consult with relevant state ministers and local government in the preparation of the report to parliament. In relation to the issue of improved services to Aboriginal communities, the local government ministers' conference decided that agreements would be negotiated between the states, territories and state local government associations and the Commonwealth on how best to deliver improved services to Aboriginal communities. These agreements would involve complementary action by other spheres of government where necessary and additional assistance provided to councils identified as needing to improve their performance. None of this, however, is reflected in the bill, which puts the onus on councils to redress problems of many years standing without one cent of additional federal funding. It is tragic, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Deputy Prime Minister has sought to pass the buck in this way on such an important and a problem that the nation must address. The problems faced by Aboriginal communities require an expanded whole of government effort. Local government does not have the capacity to do a great deal more without, substantially, <clears throat> without substantial additional funding, none of which is provided in this bill. It is also not appropriate to focus on one disadvantaged group in the community. Other groups with special needs could have been singled out for attention, such as migrants from non-English speaking backgrounds, people with disabilities, people in remote communities, the unemployed and so on. 
This bill also runs the risk of compromising the whole basis of federal local government funding. Federal grants to local government are currently untied. The principle has always been until now that what councils do with the money must remain a matter for the democratic process at a local level. Instead, this bill in effect converts the general purpose funding into tied funding rather than establishing a targeted program to achieve the sensible objectives specified in the bill. To quote, quote the Australian Local Government Association, this aspect of the bill seriously undermines the con concept of untied general purpose grants. The opposition does not intend at this stage to move amendments remedying these aspects of the bill. The question of services to Aboriginal communities can only be addressed through a coordinated program which will require the assistance of and action on the part of many government agencies at state and federal level. As I said earlier, the objectives are fine, but the bill on its own cannot provide the solution. The broken promises I have referred to above cast a poor light on the special agreement between the federal government and local government sorry, between the federal government and local government, which is supposed to be heralded and has been heralded by the Minister as a new Commonwealth local government accord. It is ironic that in the same week the Minister announced its intention to develop the accord, local government was telling the world that the government had broken key agreements on the content of this legislation, including failure to incorporate key consultative mechanisms in the bill. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is really symptomatic of the Minister's whole approach to his portfolio. On so many issues of concern, to Australia's 741 municipalities, the government's promise consultation is revealed as just empty promises. On this issue, like so many others, where fine words fail to translate into action, the Minister for Housing and Regional Development is an emperor embarrassed by his nakedness. For when it really comes to the crunch, the government's so-called commitment to consultation with local government really is just a sham. According to the Australian Local Government Association, the bill fails to implement agreements reached at conferences of local government ministers, including the Australian Local Government Association president. So we've had these agreements between state ministers. We've had these agreements between the Australian Local Government Association, which was a representative body of local governments right across this country, and now we've got and the, the minister going around the country saying we're going to have this new accord with local government and everything is fine and rosy and we're going to get on so well as this great big family all working together and this third sphere of government in this country is going to be on side with the government all the way and we get this bill into the House and what do we find? That he's reneged on some of those agreements that he made with the ministers, that he made with the, at, the, uh, at the meetings with the Australian Local Government Association. So, uh, and, and of course, more importantly, with the, the president of the Australian Local Government Association. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, uh, the so-called accord uh, so quite clearly is something of a smokescreen which is broken down before it even begins. It would be bad enough if the government's dismissive treatment of local government were confined to this bill but it's just one of a long series of occasions on which the government has ignored or disregarded the interests of local government. I note that the proposed accord is likely to address local government's role in progressing national competition policy, for instance. It seems to me that the government's position on this issue is pretty well fixed and local government does not fare well. Local government has not been included in the system of competition payments agreed, to, agreed at the Council of Australian Governments. 
Moreover, the intergovernment competition principles agreement does not provide for state and Commonwealth business enterprises to pay local government rates and charges. The threshold problem is that the government refused to allow the Industry Commission to investigate the extent of local government contribution to the benefits flowing from the competition policy reforms or to examine the impact of the reforms on local communities. And, and, uh, and, uh, uh, why, why would the government refuse to allow the Industry Commission to investigate the impact of a national competition policy on local government? Why? We'd love to hear the answer from the minister. It is also reflective of the shallowness of the government's commitment to consultation that local government had an enormous battle just to gain representation on the intergovernment working party set up to progress the mechanisms to implement the Hilmer reform. And at this point, it wasn't until the meeting of the Council of Australian Governments meeting in Darwin that they got one, one representative on that uh, working party. So, so much for this great accord, so much for this great partnership. Uh, they have one voice and they have to fight tooth and nail to be acknowledged as, as a partner in governance and a part that they would have to play in national competition reforms, which they are happy to play a part in, they, and they believe they have a, a, a fair case that they do need to be heard far more on the concerns that they have in terms of progressing national competition uh, uh, policy. I note the belated announcement this week by the Assistant Treasurer on this issue in response to the opposition's pressure that he will seek a parliamentary inquiry into how community service obligations can best be continued under the Hilmer regime. Now, this is a sign that the government is starting at long last to listen to the concerns of local, particularly rural communities, and their concerns on how the benefits of national competition reform can be most fairly distributed. So I welcome the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Assistant Treasurer's uh, reference to that Banking, Finance and Public Administration Committee this morning. I understand that they have accepted the, uh, the guidelines and the, uh, and the references that he has made to that committee. But at long last, and only with the pressure that's come from this side of the House, are we going to see some progress in that area? Uh, and it's a very, very important uh, area. As the, uh, as the member for uh, Riverina interjects and says, uh, as he knows, well knows, out there in the Riverina, the, uh, the concerns that are being voiced at a local level and particularly at a local council level. Now, the government would have been better advised to have consulted with local government much earlier about the Hilmer reforms, and this could have allayed some of the anxiety felt in local communities, particularly those in rural areas. And it quite, quite clearly, it's this side of the House that understands the concerns of the people who live and work and generate wealth and jobs out there in rural Australia, because this is where the pressure has come from on this issue, and at long last the government is showing some signs of having listened to our, our voice from this side of the House. What about a better country town program? Oh, well, as a member for Red River Inu, what this about a better country, country town? Uh, we, 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 that's another long debate. Uh, so I would inform the member for Riverina. With this background of official neglect, Mr Deputy Speaker, councils could be forgiven for being more than a little cynical about the minister's wish that the accord establish common ground between the Commonwealth and local government on competition policy. Mr Speaker, one of the difficulties faced by the opposition in considering its approach to this legislation is the complete lack of any explanation provided by the minister on the rationale of many of its provisions. The whole question of federal funding for local government was addressed in two recent reports by the Australian Urban and Regional Development Review, namely financing local government and local government funding methodologies. These reports made a whole series of recommendations, some of which have apparently been adopted by the minister, many of which have not. This is more than of academic interest. At the local government minister's conference last year, the deputy prime minister was advocating arrangements to encourage and improve local council efficiency 
which were very different to the damp squib he's presented in this bill today. These recommendations flowed out of the first reports I've mentioned. However, the Deputy Prime Minister was comprehensively rolled by the states and local government on these proposals and they have since vanished without trace and without any public explanation by the Minister of Why. While on this point, the government has had before it for more than 18 months now the findings of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on road funding to which it has still not provided an official response. This report, titled Driving the Road Dollar Further, was prepared by the Standing Committee on Transport, Communications and Infrastructure. The report made a number of recommendations about federal untied local road funding, most of which have not been incorporated into the, into the, by the government in this bill. In the unforgivable absence of any government response to this report, we are none the wiser as to why the government has done what it has done. This is public administration at its sloppiest. I understand that primary responsibility for tabling the government's response rests with the Minister for Transport. Our advice from his department is that he does not have time to attend to the report given other matters that demand his attention. And we know what those other demands are. Once again, I call on the Deputy Prime Minister to prevail on the Transport Minister and get him to do his duty by this House and table the government's response to this report. Yeah. At the very least, the Deputy Prime Minister should outline his response to the issues addressed by the committee within his, within his own portfolio responsibility. The opposition is also concerned at the apparent fragmented nature of the government's, of the, uh, government's local government assistance program. I commend the Minister for incorporating a number of these programs into the local government development program, but the cost has apparently been a substantial increase in staffing levels of the Office of Local Government. Scarce local government resources should be devoted to providing services at a local level, not expanding a Commonwealth bureaucracy. And perhaps uh, the Minister might explain whether this is a more efficient bureaucracy is going to have with an expanded one or whether it is really necessary to expand it uh, at the Commonwealth level. Some, some local government associations have expressed the view that this represents a further attempt by the Minister <coughs> to further extend his control over the activities of local government. Now, the opposition finds it very difficult to agree with local government's assessment on that issue. We also have concerns about the local government development program itself, which, as it is funded under a one-line entry in the Appropriation Bill No. 1, is administered with very little parliamentary supervision. It is not clear why the funding for and administration of this program would not be more effectively dealt with in the local government financial assistance legislation, and this is a matter I intend to pursue. The opposition has asked a number of questions on these and other issues in the context of the Senate estimates, which are intended to assist its consideration of this bill. It is to be regretted that the answers to these questions have not been available by the Minister's Department in time for this debate. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting the following words. Whilst not declining to give the bill a second reading, the House condemns the government for failing to honour its agreements with the states, the territories and local government relating to consultation on the operation of legislation and on the need for a coordinated approach to improving the efficiency of local councils and the delivery of services to Aboriginal communities. Is the amendment seconded? Amendment seconded, Mr Speaker. The original question was 
that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the honourable member for Maranoa has moved, as an amendment, that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Corio. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to rise in the House to support the uh, government's local government financial assistance bill 1995, which has been brought into this place by the Deputy Prime Minister. And I would like to acknowledge uh, before the House the interest and the contribution uh, to local government in this country uh, by the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, he's always seen local government as a very important and significant level in Australia's democratic structures. Uh, he has worked tirelessly to encourage uh, better planning and urban renewal in local communities. Uh, he's seen local government as an appropriate vehicle for the expansion of community services. Uh, he has uh, gone to great lengths to encourage local government to take a proactive role in the economic development of their regions. And of course, he's uh, encouraged them very much uh, to take an active role in local environmental affairs. And I think his uh, record before this House on, uh, on supporting local government in Australia is second to none. Now, I listened with uh, great interest uh, uh, to the comments by the member for Maranoa. And um, of course, uh, the member for Maranoa would have been a great supporter of Fight Back, and I think it was that document that sought to slash and emasculate federal government uh, funding to local government in this country. Now, I don't know how that particular view stacks up with his criticism of the, uh, the present government on its funding arrangements for, uh, for local government in this country. And he, and he has a, a lot to say about consul consultation with local and state governments on these issues. Now, I don't know where he's been in this parliament or around this place, but the Deputy Prime Minister, more than anybody else in this place, has an excellent record of consultation not only with his own caucus, not only with his own ministerial colleagues, but with local and state governments over these sorts of issues. But we know how the Liberal Party, who the uh, honourable member uh, represents here in coalition. We know how they uh, approach the consultative process when it comes to local government. I'd like to invite him to come down to Victoria and see what the Kennett government has done as far as consulting uh, uh, local government goes. I mean, what the Kennett government has done is take the meat axe to local government in the state of Victoria. It's basically imposed its commissars its commissars to run, not commissioners, commissars to run local government in the state of Victoria without consultation with local communities. And of course, that is why in the Liberal and National Party heartlands uh, you are losing so much support and that those communities are turning in droves to the government. Because the Liberal and National Parties refuse to consult treated treated uh, local government just, just like a, ba a bag of spuds. Open it up, rip the bag open and tip the spuds out on the ground. You don't really care about consultation, so don't come into this House preaching to the government, least of all preaching to this minister, about consultation. Now, I would have thought a funding commitment of in excess of $1 billion was significant, and I would have thought attempts that are being made in this this uh, particular act to uh, bring local government uh, into the transparency and accountability fold would have been an appropriate course for a federal government allocating these sorts of monies, Mr Deputy Speaker. But that doesn't seem to have impressed the member for Maranoa at all. The opposition has consistently walked away from the issue of microeconomic reform, not only in local government areas. They walked away in transport. They've walked away in uh, the provision of many other services. And of course, now they want to lecture the, uh, the government on one, our commitment to local government, and two, our attempts to achieve greater efficiencies. Now, let me tell the member for Maranoa that on this side of the House, uh, there is a very deep and strong support for local government structures in this country. 
I happen to, Deputy, Mr Deputy Speaker, just have a flick through the parliamentary handbook. Some 20 members on this side of the House have had experience in local government, including yourself, Mr Deputy Speaker, and including myself. Now, I don't want to mention all the members, but uh, the member for Calaire, uh, Werriwa, Hunter, uh, Herbert, Dixon, Newcastle, Chifley, Hughes, uh, and even the Speaker, your, your senior, Mr Deputy Speaker, has had experience in local government. So we, don't take, uh, we take ra rather great exception on this side of the House to the charges by the member for Maranoa that this government does not uh, have a great deal of sympathy for this level of government. We know where your sympathies lie. Your sympathies have always lied with state governments, never with local governments. It has been federal Labor governments that have shown the care and the concern for the real development of uh, governmental structures at the local level and improving this uh, level of government as a deliverer of service, uh, services to ordinary Australians. Australians. Mr Deputy Speaker, when you examine the range of linkages uh, between the federal government, federal Labor government and local government at the moment through various programs that we administer, I think it gives you a fairly comprehensive idea of how important the federal government takes this strata of government. Uh, the uh, member for Maranoa mentioned the local capital works program, a, an astounding initiative in one nation that not only achieved great infrastructure improvements at the local level, but they also were employment creating program. It was an employment creating program as well. And there was a, a great sigh of relief when One Nation was announced and the government committed over $400 million in direct funding to local government so that local communities could be improved. We have linkages through the Land Care and Environment Action Program LEAP, through uh, a myriad of labour market programs and, of course, as far as infrastructure development is concerned, the Building Better Cities program, which uh, works in partnership not only with local government but state government, has been a resounding su success. Some $800 million that the federal government made available primarily to local governments has called forth an investment of some $2 billion, an extraordinary result in investment terms, but far more important to local communities in uh, what has been achieved. And in my community, in uh, Geelong, the Building Better Cities money has been used to finance the redevelopment of the Deakin Wool Stores, an a, uh, urban renewal project in uh, the north of Geelong in Nor Lane, and of course the building of the Geelong Transport uh, Interchange. All key catalytic uh, developments in uh, the city of uh, Greater Geelong, and which have called for substantial investment and which have improved the infrastructure of our region. But our linkages with uh, local government don't end there. As far as economic uh, development is concerned, uh, I congratulate uh, the Deputy Prime Minister in the way in which uh, he has crafted the regional development program and uh, uh, initiated the, involvement, the greater involvement of local communities in their own economic development. Of course, if we go to environmental programs, uh, in the budget there was $8.5 million provided to assist local governments primarily, primarily to deal with planning issues related to the environment or the coastal environment. As far as general planning issues are concerned, the ILAC program provides a good linkage. Community service, the provision of community services. The federal government is, uh, is uh, involved in the HAC program to, an, uh, to an, uh, a very large extent. The provision of housing in local communities. We are involved with them in the provision of community housing. If these uh, range of programs are being accessed by local government, Mr Deputy Speaker, then the federal government, in partnership with local government, is having a very real impact on the lives of ordinary Australians. Hardly, hardly the programs and the action of a government that doesn't care about the partnership with local government. If we go and look back at the historical perspectives, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's important to appreciate that local government existed long before federation. Indeed, local governments in my state of Victoria were established in 1842. Uh, these local structures grew up under state jurisdictions 
and it is state legislation that primarily governs the functions and the powers and the structures of local government in the state of Victoria. The Australian Constitution does not specifically mention local government, and this has led to some attempts in the past by the federal government of the day to increase its constitutional status. But it's the, the Labor governments who have done that, not any coalition governments that have attempted to elevate local government structures in the Federation. They opposed it. You opposed the Whitlam government. Don't shake your head. You opposed the Whitlam government referendum in 1974, which sought to give local government a greater say in the affairs of the nation and attempted to allow the federal government to directly fund. So then you come into this house and lecture us about our commitment to local government. You've got to be joking. As far as local government is concerned, uh, if you look at those functions that it performs, they are very, very important to local communities. As far as the provision of local roads, uh, some of those uh, uh, communities are involved, local government structures are involved in the provision of water supply and sanitation. Uh, but more uh, extensively now in modern times, we've seen local government involved in the provision of cultural and recreational activities and, and the extension of their activities into the provision of community and welfare services. And who has stood beside them as the, they have moved into these areas, these critical areas of development? State governments or federal governments? Well, I can tell you what the state government in Victoria has done, nothing like the federal Labor government has done for local government. Now, if we look at the financing of local government, Mr Deputy Speaker, we see that uh, local government largely uh, raises its revenue through uh, three mechanisms. It does it through taxation and the levying of rates, it does it through borrowings and it does it through grants which are provided by the federal government. And that brings me to the substance of the bill that we are debating here today. Uh, if we look down the, uh, the history of local government uh, funding in Australia and the role of the federal government, uh, it, uh, I guess, began with the uh, Grants Commission Act in 1973, uh, which uh, directly led to the funding of local government. Uh, and I commend, uh, moving a bit further in, uh, along the time scale, the Fraser government in 1976. That was a Liberal government which provided for personal income tax sharing by local governments in the Local Government Personal Income Tax Sharing Act of 1976. In 1986, the Hawke government introduced the Local Government Financial Assistance Bill, and um, that really outlined a program for growth in local government funding and it introduced a system of state allocations on a per capita basis, uh, the principle of horizontal equalisation. That was amended in uh, 1991, which provided uh, Commonwealth funding for local roads through that Act. And of course, um, we have a range of amendments here today uh, which extend that 1986 Act. Now, the new bill before this House uh, provides. Uh, uh, several objectives for the government in, uh, in allocating that $1.1 billion uh, of uh, federal monies to local government. Uh, the government has an objective of seeking greater efficiencies in the use of that money and, of course, greater accountability in the allocation of funds. The bill seeks to achieve this through the introduction a new, of a new method of national reporting on local government expenditures. It does it through establishing a more consistent basis for the allocation of funds between municipalities. It provides a means by which local communities can achieve those greater efficiencies and, of course, it continues the separate identification of road funding in the bill. Now, I don't want to deal with all of those provisions. I'd like to, Mr Deputy Speaker, just to pick up on a couple of aspects and, no doubt, of speakers who will follow me on the government side will pick up on the others. As far as the national reporting mechanism is concerned, there is a necessity to provide greater transparency and accountability in funds distribution. I don't think that would be disputed by the honourable member for Maranoa. Uh, the bill uh, the before the House requires the minister to provide a detailed report to the parliament on expenditures and, uh, and especially the outcomes of those expenditures. The important thing about this report, Mr Deputy Speaker, will be that it will provide an impetus 
and a focus for the further collection of essential data relating to local government areas throughout uh, the length and breadth of this country. Much of that data is already in existence, but it needs extension. We need to be able to get the best possible snapshot of what is happening with those <laughs> expenditures and the outcomes that are being achieved. And I think the, uh, the fact of the national reporting mechanism will impose its own discipline over local government bodies. There will be an incentive for them to improve their, their performance. Now, I know there will be difficulties in obtaining agreement from local and state governments uh, on, on what constitutes uh, good performance and uh, establishing relevant criteria. It's a hard job, but it can be done, and it can be done within a consultative framework. But it will provide the federal government in the end with a better statistical base and a better, a better indication of how that enormous amount of money is being effectively spent. And it will give the citizens of Australia a better, a better chance to evaluate the outcomes of their local government bodies. That first report will be made and published uh, in the National Parliament in 1996 and 97. As far as the efficiency of local government is concerned, well, of course, um, I think it's important for the national government to pursue the microeconomic reform agenda at the local government level and to, uh, to achieve better internal e efficiencies in local government. Now, I think uh, local and state governments are already well down the way of developing benchmarking te techniques, performance measures and, and other elements of the, uh, the, the micro-reform agenda. For our part, the federal government has committed uh, some $2 million over five years to assist uh, local governments to disseminate best practice uh, uh, through, their, through their council networks and, of course, to, to develop the national benchmarks, which will give us some idea of their performance. So, in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, as my time runs out in this debate, let me just uh, challenge the opposition once again. When the opposition gets up in this place and seeks to lecture this government on local, uh, on, on local government matters, bear this in mind. You have always had your focus directed at state governments and not local governments. You have uh, consistently, down through history, opposed the attempts of Labor governments to elevate the status of local governments in the Australian constitutional context. And if you go to the one state where we can view the Liberal Party in operation, we see that what, what the Liberal Party has done in Victoria is one of the most despicable and undemocratic things that, had, that we have seen in this country. You as a political party and a coalition have demonstrated your utter contempt for consultative processes. You have demonstrated your utter contempt for local government structures. So when you come into this place and seek to lecture the federal government on what it ought to be doing with local government, then you are really skating on the thin ice. And for, me and for great measure, the honourable me member for Maranoa ought to remind the House that if he was on this side of the House, already now local governments throughout the length and breadth of Australia would have had their financial innards slowly ripped out as the squeeze in fight back as would have come on the, the funding arrangements between the, the federal and the state governments. You do not consult. You do not fund. You do nothing to elevate the, uh, the status of local government in the Australian constitutional uh, context and that simply writes you out of this debate. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for Lyon. <coughs> Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Well, it's always interesting to, uh, to be present in this chamber and get lectured by members of the other side, and I suppose that the uh, members of the other side can also say that about members on this side, but we've just had a bit of a lesson from the member for Cryo about uh, some recent activities in, uh, that have taken place in Victoria, which have uh, had uh, extensive ramifications as far as local government is concerned. But I might just take the House back, seeing as we're talking of uh, we're dealing in some histrionics and debating this bill today, to the early 80s in New South Wales, when we had the, uh, the massive amalgamations of local government. And I presume that's what the member for Cryo was relating to 
uh, we're talking about in Victoria at the moment, the massive uh, uh, amalgamations of local government bodies, a lot of them contrary to the recommendations of all those local government bodies in New South Wales, under whose stewardship the, uh, the Minister for Local Government at the time was one Harry Jensen, the member of the RAND Labor government. And that was in uh, 1981. Now, uh, you know, he, he spoke about lack of consultation in Victoria at the moment. Well, that may be the case, but uh, certainly there's a fair bit of blame that we can level of the other side of politics as well in that process. And over the years, the, uh, the number of times that different governments in New South Wales have meddled with the Newcastle City Council, as you would well know, Mr Deputy Speaker, and the Sydney City Council and the South Sydney City Council as far as local government is concerned. So the Labor Party in Australia can certainly, certainly not without blame, and they shouldn't stand inside this glass house and throw those sort of stones at the coalition with regard to uh, the way uh, the re reform has taken place and the effects of that reform on local government in Australia. The, uh, <clears throat> the financing process of local government in Australia is a very, very, very important element of uh, our federal way that we run this country. And uh, it's, it's interesting to listen to some of the comments, and uh, you know we still hear two and a half years later about some of the elements of, uh, of fight back, even though you know that manifesto is uh, dead and buried, and the uh, the Labor Party is very very concerned, and they're they're uh, chomping at the bit to have a crack at um, the uh, the current the the, uh, the policy that we will go to the next election with. Well, they're just going to have to wait a little bit longer, and uh, it certainly will be a comprehensive policy. But we. Uh, on this side of the House, but on a personal note, certainly acknowledge the very important existence of local government in the three-tiered system in Australia, and one that, um, and it's a level of government that we certainly cannot take too lightly. Over the years, we've seen a, um, a diminution of the recognition, I believe, of local government. I know that there was a uh, there was a referenda question as far as constitutional uh, recognition of local government at the, uh, was concerned. And at the time, I was a member of local government and not a member of this place, and uh, certainly was concerned personally that that, uh, that referenda question didn't get up because local government in Australia deserves constitutional recognition. Local government in Australia is absolutely important to the well-being of uh, the, uh, the taxpayers of Australia and the ratepayers in local government areas, and uh, they are the people that provide a lot of the daily services that we as citizens of Australia require, need and uh, expect on a daily basis, and do it, I would dare say, at the, in the most efficient manner uh, of any level of government. And, um, and I know I draw a bit of criticism on that point, but I, stu I do believe that that is the case. Now, as far as um, this, uh, the, the Local Government Financial Assistance Bill 1995 is concerned, this bill replaces the Local Government Financial Assistance Act of 1986, under which federal financial assistance grants (FAGs) are provided to local government. Under present arrangements, FAGs are provided in two separately identified categories: general purpose grants paid on a per capita basis to each state and territory. The funds are distributed between councils by local government grants commissions uh, on a horizontal equalisation basis. Uh, secondly, identified local roads grants. These funds are distributed between the states and territories according to an historical formula based on their relatively relative road needs. Until 1991, these grants were in the form of tied grants for local roads and were channelled through the transport, for, port, for, transport portfolio. The local road funds were untied in 91-92, but they remained separately identified. The intra-state distribution of these funds is carried out by the uh, local government uh, grants commissions and uh, according to principles which vary between states but which generally reflect to a greater or lesser extent factors such as road length, population and maintenance requirements. Under the new legislation, this bill we are debating today, the general purpose and roads grants will continue to be separately identified, that is the method of interstate distribution will not be affected, however their intra-state distribution by state local government grants commissions will be performed on the basis of national principles declared by the federal minister instead of according to different principles in place in each state and territory. You go back uh, in history, Mr Deputy Speaker, to um, that period uh, prior to 1991 where there was an element of road funding uh, channelled directly from the Commonwealth to uh, local authorities. Uh, 
um, under uh, a number of different programs. One that, that immediately comes to mind was the Australian Land Transport Program, which I know in the council that I was a member of at the time was used very efficiently and effectively in upgrading our, uh, our network of uh, economically important road infrastructure in that area. And, uh, we were able to take every single dollar that came through that program from the Commonwealth and apply it directly to road improvement. And we managed to get many hundreds of kilometres of very, very important road infrastructure in our council area improved to the level where it, it uh, only needs minimal maintenance today. And uh, it was, I would uh, stand, I, I wouldn't stand corrected because it was a very, very important program, one that was uh, recognised throughout local government as being a very, very good program. And so, you know, on that basis, and it's been interesting recently that. Uh, as a member of the Public Accounts Committee, we've, we are still conducting an inquiry into the relationship between the Commonwealth and states as far as special purpose payments are concerned. And um, there's been some criticism of the Commonwealth in, in, in the growth of SPPs uh, and um, you know, the, the concept that that may be moving to more of a centralist position rather than a federalist position. Well, in this particular area, that of road funding, I, to a certain extent, take, and this is a personal view, a, a centralist view in that I, I believe that some of the benefits that were attained back in those days, pre-1991, are not being attained today. We're not achieving the dollars in real terms on our roads. In, uh, in rural Australia, the, the inventory of bridge infrastructure is, and the state of that bridge infrastructure is absolutely appalling. And the, uh, I don't know where the money is going to come from, but ultimately uh, it, it's got to come from the Commonwealth as the, the prime taxing body in Australia. The money has got to come from the Commonwealth to, uh, to provide ultimately to local government to, to renew or to renovate that bridge infrastructure in rural Australia because it is just unbelievable. The, uh, they're getting to an age now, a lot of the, in the, those. Um, those bridges, particularly in my area, are getting to an age where they're 60, 70, 80 years old, all of timber construction, and local government just does not have the wherewithal to provide the funding to replace those bridges. And uh, there was, I know that there's been a number uh, uh, in my area that recently received funding from the, uh, the former government in New South Wales uh, using new technology uh, as far as um, uh, stress, stress, laminate, uh, stress laminated uh, Panelling is concerned, putting new decking on bridges, and they've done a good job. Some have had to be reconstructed, and I know recently the Hastings Council had negotiated uh, to make funds available to uh, repair the Kindy Bridge in the Upper Hastings area. But there are hundreds and hundreds more, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that are not going to get funding from that area because the local government does not have the resources. This tier of government, the Commonwealth, collects. Uh, that enormous amount of revenue from uh, fuel taxes, up around $10 billion, uh, of which we see less than we're seeing this year. I think it's about $865, $867 million spent back on the roads in this nation, and it's not really good enough. And the point that I'm making today is that um, we're fiddling around the edges here. Uh, I would like to see a little bit more attention paid by the Commonwealth um, back on that crisis situation. I mean. If, if you look at, at uh, the inventory of road infrastructure in a local government uh, area in the city, I mean the, the KNG is in. There's a blacktop on there. Everything's done. You know, it's just maintenance programs. We've got roads that are of vital importance in, in rural and regional Australia that are in deplorable state, gravel surface, and councils can't afford to resheet and roll those roads. Uh, and if we had a, uh, a fair dinkum program where we saw a continuing injection of capital going into, uh, into local government, it would certainly improve that situation. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, it was interesting. I got some correspondence from the Australian Local Government Association with regard to this bill, uh, highlighting uh, some areas that they believed it was de deficient. And I might just um, refer to that briefly. Uh, and it goes, Dear Member, on May the 10th, the Minister of Housing and Regional Development introduced the new Local Government Financial Assistance Bill to continue the payment of untied Commonwealth grants to councils. We welcome much of the bill and acknowledge the extensive consultation which has occurred with Local Government during drafting. 
the minister has responded positively to a number of local government requests, and that, that needs to be put on the record. I mean, I, I uh, probably concur with, with the comments that are being made by uh, the, uh, David Plumridge, who is the signatory on the bottom of this letter. But he goes on to say, regrettably, however, the bill is seriously flawed in a number of respects. It fails to implement various agreements reached at conferences by local government ministers held in October 1994 and this April, and contains provisions which are inconsistent with a, with a system of untied general purpose grants. The sections of the bill causing concern are dot point one, section six, which sets out the procedure for establishing national principles to guide the allocation of grants amongst councils, section 16, which requires annual reports to parliament, section three, which sets out the intended objects of the legislation. Under the subheading national principles, local government ministers, including the Commonwealth, agreed at the conference that the national principles should be formulated in consultation with state ministers and the Australian Local Government Association and also take the form of a disallowable instrument. The bill fails to implement this agreement. This is no reference, there is no reference to consultation with the Australian Local Government Association and the minister can simply formulate, revoke or vary principles in writing. There is no requirement for consultation at all when the minister revokes or varies principles. Annual report, section 16, uh, subsection 2, subsection C, goes beyond the agreement reached with respect to reports to parliament. State ministers and the Australian Local Government Association took the view that reporting on the performance of councils should be to the local government ministers' conference, not parliament. There has been no agreement as yet on the form uh, which such reports should take, and the issue is to be the subject of further investigation by the officials and advice to ministers next year. The provisions of the bill are therefore at best premature. The objects, sections uh, 3, 2, D and E, are inappropriate in the context of legislation for untied general purpose grants. The purpose of the grants is to enhance the capacity of councils to provide a range of services to communities in an equitable manner. Decisions as to precisely how funds are to be spent must remain a matter for each council. Specific references to improving efficiency and services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are inconsistent with the horizontal equalisation and effort neutral approaches set out in subsequent sections. This association is in no way opposed to steps being taken to improve the efficiency of councils and services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. In fact, agreement was reached at the April Local Government Ministers' Conference on programs of activity to achieve both these objectives, both those objectives. There is simply no need for them to be raised in the bill. In the case of the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, it was agreed that one of the national principles would refer to their particular needs. To go further and make the improvement of services a specific object of the bill can only raise unsustainable expectations that such improvements will occur. This is a dangerous and potentially divisive course of action, especially given that the bill does not and cannot provide any special funding for that purpose. Only a tiny fraction of the grants received by councils relate to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, and it has never before been suggested that general purpose grants to councils are a significant part of the solution to the very real problem, uh, problems of our Indigenous people. The substantial additional resources and concerted action by all three spheres of government are required to achieve better outcomes. Our underlying concern is that once this Act refers to one particular group with special needs, others will inevitably seek similar treatment. Local government has broad social, justi social justice responsibilities, and it is wrong to focus so strongly on just one section of the population, albeit arguably the most disadvantaged. The Australian Local Government Association wrote to the minister, I presume, seeking amendments to address these concerns, but our, our approach was rejected. Uh, details of the amendments we now propose are attached. And it, it goes on to say, and I'll have to put this on the record, I wish to acknowledge the valuable assistance received from the office of, of Mr Bruce, Scott MP, Shadow Minister for Local Government, in drafting those amendments. Uh, we would greatly appreciate your support. Ha ha having been, Mr Deputy Speaker, having been a, um, a very, very committed uh, member of local government uh, for a number of years, the, uh, as was the member from Macquarie in the chamber now, I know, um, we both regrettably had to resign from local government uh, on that fateful day in uh, 1993, and it was a sad day for me because um, uh, it was a great learning experience and a great, uh, great time of involvement in local affairs. Um, you know, we have got to, you have got to recognise and uh, 
take on board some of the comments that that peak body has, um, has uh, given the minister. And certainly, uh, th that body acknowledges the consultation that the minister gave them. And obviously, it's the minister's prerogative from that point onwards in drafting this legislation uh, what elements of uh, their recommendation that he takes on board. So, okay, we, we acknowledge that it, that it is the minister's prerogative to do that, but we don't, <laughs> certainly don't have to agree with it. And uh, so I just thought that it was important that um, that correspondence and those sentiments from the Australian Local Government Association be put on the public record. Uh, and, I, and just in, in closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I just want to go back and reiterate some of those comments that um, I made with regard to local road funding and, uh, and flag to the government that it is not a problem that is going to go away. It is not a problem that I believe that we can palm off to state government. It's something that must be addressed, that we must face up to, and the Commonwealth, as the, uh, the body that uh, receives the majority of the revenue income in this nation by way of taxes and other, <laughs> other uh, receipts, should address the problem that um, is, is growing at a rapid rate in rural and regional Australia, and that is of our roads. And uh, As I say, it certainly won't go away. And we certainly have to pay attention to that. And some stage in the future, either this government or a future uh, coalition government is going to have to address that, either by way of SPPs directly through state governments that are, uh, that are earmarked to go to local roads, or whether we end up going back to that system that was in place um, uh, prior to 1990-91, where there was uh, funding directly from the Commonwealth to local government. And, and I have absolutely no problem with that. Because as a member of local government at the time, I believe that the people that paid those taxes that were ended up back in local government got the best value for their dollar from local government on those roads. Now, I know that some of my colleagues on this side of the chamber might not necessarily agree with that, but that's my personal view. And if we, uh, if we end up in, back in that situation, I believe we'll get more kilometres of road sealed. But certainly if, if a government in the future decides that it's by way of SPP through uh, state governments, that's fine. But the issue of, of rural and regional roads is not going to go away, and this is the forum that really has to address it. And this is the forum. It's this Commonwealth government that has got to provide, ultimately provide the funding to address the, those uh, very, very serious uh, infrastructure issues in uh, rural and regional Australia. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The honourable member for Macquarie. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to speak on this bill because, uh, like so many other people in this chamber, as the member for Lyons just said, that. Uh, a number of us did serve some time with local government. In fact, a few of my colleagues were chatting in the caucus room the other day and uh, working out how many of us had been in local government, and uh, there's quite a few. So uh, I think that, that says a lot. Maybe it's a good grounding for, uh, for the federal parliament. But uh, also, I think it's an extremely important level of government because, uh, in many ways, well, practically, it is the closest to the people. And when you're a, an alderman or a councillor, I started off as an alderman, but they're now councillors. Uh, your, your home is your office, and uh, people get in touch with you at uh, six o'clock in the morning or eleven o'clock at night when they've got a problem, whether it's a, a, a mad dog that's just jumped their fence, or a pothole in their road, or uh, uh, the gutter that's given way, or whatever. Uh, so it's certainly very close to the people, and I think it gives a great opportunity for people in local government to really get to know their people, get to know the issues. Uh, and it also takes the wind out of your sails if you feel a bit high and mighty and you think you're just going to be a policy person. You've got to be a very practical person in local government. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that experience. Uh, during my period in local government, I also chaired my council's uh, finance committee and being thrown in at the deep end uh, with my first budget, it was, uh, that was a pretty traumatic experience. And I come from an area which has uh, a fairly low rate base, uh, doesn't have a lot of large industry, and uh, looking at creative ways to, to raise money, looking at uh, maximising the grant dollars, uh, was always a big challenge. I also had the privilege of, uh, for a while, chairing the Western Sydney Regional Organisation of Councils. Uh, so I got a broader view in my region of, of the issues. And uh, I will talk, as the member for Lyon did, about, uh, about roads, because I think they're extremely, uh, extremely important. I welcome this bill because it does give greater recognition by the federal government uh, of, um, uh, of local government. And uh, I'm very sorry that uh, the opposition saw fit in uh, 1988 to, uh, 
uh, work at knocking off that referendum question which would have given constitutional status to local government. Uh, you may remember there were, I think, four issues at the time which I think started off with bipartisan support and uh, everybody thought they would get up. They all seemed very uh, straightforward motherhood, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, items. Uh, but the opposition decided that they would then um, knock them off uh, based on uh, some spurious argument that the, uh, giving freedom of religion to Australians would mean that the federal government would stop funding uh, church schools. And I think uh, the member for Flinders came to prominence in that campaign. And I'm afraid uh, the member for Flinders, as far as I'm concerned, has absolutely no credibility on anything he does now because listen to him raving about those particular issues and he effectively knocked off uh, that, that referendum and knocked off local government having constitutional recognition. So local government, as we know, now exists at the whim of state governments, and we've seen what some of the state governments have done. Yes, on both sides, definitely. Uh, but um, they, they, if, with a higher status, with a higher recognition, I think there would be better quality coming out of some councils where there has been, have been problems. And certainly this bill goes a long way towards improving that. Not in my part of the world. I don't know. Well, somebody saw fit to, fit to put a bomb on my council door one night in the middle of a meeting. That wasn't too joyful. But um, so I think that uh, you know the, the opposition can't uh, crow too much, as the member for Carrio said about how they feel about local government. They certainly would have supported that referendum question. Um, one of the things that I know it's not part of this bill, but I think it's worth alluding to is the. Uh, additional grant funds for local government projects in this year's budget, an extra $48 million over four years, and putting the grants together rather than in a whole lot of different categories, I think has given a lot more flexibility to local government. And I know certainly from the point of view of, of the two local government areas prominently in my area, they depend very heavily on those grants because, as I've said, they have a very low rate base. Um, I'd like to take issue with the member for Maranoa about uh, the supposed lack of consultation, and I'm thankful to the member for Lyon for reading that paragraph from the Australian Local Government Association letter, and I'll repeat it. We welcome much of the bill and acknowledge the extensive consultation which has occurred with local government during drafting. During drafting, not after it was all happening, the minister has responded positively to a number of local government's requests. Now, I think that says very clearly and I know it was the case that there were extensive consultations with the associations and, uh, and their input went into the bill. Now, okay, in this letter we've all just received, they disagree with something, but that doesn't say that there were no consultations. Uh, the end result of consultation isn't always that everybody's going to get everything they want. And I've stood up in this place a number of times and, and talked on bills where the opposition and various interest groups have said, oh, we weren't consulted, we weren't consulted. And you talk to the ministers and you talk to their officers and you know that extensive consultations happen. So that one is an absolute furphy. Um, the national reporting, I think, is an extremely important part of this bill, and I think it goes a long way to what I was saying about making uh, local government more responsive, making their actions more transparent. And again, I have to emphasise that this is not something that the federal government is going to get and hold to its bosom and do nothing with. Uh, it's going to go to the local government ministers' conference, and, and it'll be all of those state and federal ministers that will be looking at this national reporting. So everyone will have a chance once again to have an input. Uh, so I think th those issues are, uh, are very important. Um, it's, some councils, as we know, work extremely efficiently, and others uh, get a bit slack. And uh, I think having that national reporting, uh, having the efficiency uh, measures, the benchmarking, I think is going to go a long way. Uh, towards uh, getting those go local government uh, authorities that have not been so efficient uh, into line and getting, as a result, a better product for their, their ratepayers, uh, for their local residents. And we all know that local government is a sort of the level of government people love to hate the most. Uh, local papers, certainly like mine, are full of criticism. There's occasional praise, but when something good happens, they very seldom give you a pat on the back. Uh, but they're into you like, uh, like Flynn if you, uh, if you haven't done something they want. Um, so I think better reporting, better benchmarking will be a step forward. Now the, uh, the road funding, I think, uh, and I agree entirely with, uh, with you, Mr Deputy Speaker, on that, on that issue. Um, like you, my electorate is, uh, a lot of it is rural, probably not to the same extent as yours, but um, particularly in the Blue Mountains part of my electorate, there were lots of developments, housing developments, before 
uh, the Section 94 contributions were required that were put in curbing and guttering roads and so on. So the government has all the, the local government authority has always been behind the eight ball in, in sealing those roads. And because uh, the Blue Mountains and the Hawkesbury in my electorate are environmentally sensitive areas, um, not having roads sealed is detrimental to the environment as well as a great inconvenience to the residents. And uh, we were fortunate in getting uh, a $10 million grant from the last state government. And I uh, don't mind giving some praise to uh, a Conservative government that did that. And it was uh, to the credit of our then uh, city engineer who, who browbeat and, and got that, that grant. Uh, over a number of years, um, and uh, trying to work out which roads were going to be sealed first is a job that I would not like to have had. But uh, the engineers did that. But constantly, people were coming to us as councillors and saying, uh, "Look, when is my road going to be sealed? It's in a dreadful state." And one I will never forget. It was on a steep hill uh, with the uh, the sides falling very steeply away, so you couldn't park a car. Uh, where old people had to wheel their, their uh, garbage bins up to the top of the street because the garbage truck couldn't get down there. And I lobbied extensively and got that brought up the list. But having brought it up the list, some up, someone else was dropped down the list. So uh, roads are certainly a, a very difficult problem. I also agree, as I think a number of members in this House do on both sides, um, that the road funding uh, principles that were changed in uh, 1992 uh, uh, perhaps haven't helped, uh, where the federal government is now giving the money to state governments untied, and I know that that, that money has not always gone into roads. I think the arterial road program, the rural roads program, and the black spot program were were excellent because they were able to target those areas of the greatest need. Uh, so keeping the road funding separate under this legislation, I think, is very important because it highlights uh, the great need for for road work. And uh, like the member for Lyon, I look at those metropolitan councils and see that their roadworks are, are just repairs and resealing, whereas uh, in rural areas we're trying to do it from scratch. Uh, so I welcome that, uh, that part of the legislation as well. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I won't say any more on this legislation because I think a lot has been said already and I want to give the opportunity for more speakers to make their contribution. But I commend uh, the government for the bill and I commend in particular the Deputy Prime Minister for his uh, commitment to local government and his dedication in bringing this legislation forward. Thank you. The question is that the words proposed to be admitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to be able to speak on this bill because it gives me the opportunity to speak on local government in Victoria and just what's happening to local Mr. government Mr. there. The, uh, the main uh, local government body in uh, my electorate is the uh, city of Frankston. I don't agree with Geoffrey Kennett on many things, but I did agree with him on the fact that there had to be an amalgamation of local councils. I was sorry that uh, the uh, state government, Labor government at the time, didn't do it. However, I don't agree with the way he's gone about amalgamating these local councils or who he's put in charge. At the moment, he's appointed three commissioners to the city of Frankston. These three commissioners are all paid-up members of the Liberal Party. They're not ex-members, they're not former members or party friends. They are actually present, paid-up, card-carrying members of the Liberal Party. And that's where my problem starts. Because of this fact, recently uh, they actually put in the— if you have a look in today's age, you'll see that that's also mentioned there. Recently, in a local magazine, the Frankston uh, City Council put out well, Frank, it's got Frankston, Your City Guide 1995. Nowhere in it does it give the list of members of parliament. It gives community organisations, playgroups, progress associations, schools, lists no member of parliament. However, it does list political organisations. It's got five headings here. It's got Australian Labor Party, Liberal Party, Frankston Heights branch, Liberal Party, Seaford branch, Young Liberals, Mount Eliza, Frankston. And then it's got something quite strange. It's actually got the Dunkley Federal Electorate Council. If you were just a person out in the community and you wanted to ring up the Electoral Commission, you would probably ring that number. And when you ring that number, you get a very strange reply. Uh, when you ring it, you find out that the F Dunkley Federal Electorate Council, which is 
up the top of this pile of political uh, parties is actually the campaign office for my opponent. The campaign office for my opponent in Dunkley. However, there's even and this has all happened uh, in a book that has been spread all over the city of Frankston. The way it works is the campaign office for my opponent is actually here's one of his uh, bit of propaganda he puts out is actually at two campaign office is two Heritage Avenue, Post Office Box 560, Frankston 3199, phone number 7831140. However, when you uh, ring this particular uh, number, it goes to his campaign office. If you look in the uh, book here, it says Dunkley Federal Electorate Council, 76 Old Mornington Road, Mount Eliza, Mr J August. So obviously you think you're going to ring Mr August, but you don't. His private phone number is 97878095, and when you ring that particular number, uh, it gets transferred to 7831140. And if, you, if my opponent isn't there, you get uh, some, an answering machine that says this is a campaign office of uh, the uh, candidate for Dunkley. Now, if this is the sort of tricks the council are going to play, putting it in, distributing all over. Uh, the city of Frankston, well, I'm afraid they'll have to play politics with me. So I've tried to get on with them as best I could in the last uh, six months, and uh, now I'm afraid the time's come where I can't get on with them. So let me give you a little bit of example of what it's cost the people of Frankston for those commissioners who are undemocratically elected, who are appointed by Geoffrey Kennett. He could have put Adolf Hitler or anyone in there, but he just plugs these people out of the Liberal Party, puts them in this position, pays them huge wages and to do what? To stifle democracy. I really think that the people of Frankston should go back to uh, in the old days where there was that saying, no representation, uh, no taxation without representation. Now, I think we should be pushing this sort of line and not paying our rates. Naturally, I couldn't do that sort of thing as one of the leaders of the community, but maybe someone else might sort of go for this line. Unless we have democratically elected councillors, why should we pay our rates? Let's have a look at what the commissioners are getting. They've got salaries, $200,000. On costs, probably about $15,000. They've got expense allowances, $15,000. They've got vehicles, $60,000. They've got additional costs for a chief executive officer. These are people who have been appointed after these commissioners. They've got a new city logo that's been designed. That costs $22,000. The consultancy for appointment of the new chief executive officer, ten thousand dollars. They've got a seawall that they're paying for that's not even in the Frankston Shire boundaries anymore. That's sixty thousand. Full page advertisements for the announcement of the appointment of the commissioners, a couple of thousand dollars. Newly employed public relations officer, thirty thousand dollars. All in all, so far the commissioners of Frankston have cost the people of Frankston round about four hundred and forty five thousand dollars. That doesn't include, of course, the mobile telephones, the consultancies, the uh, office equipment, etc., that goes with it. Now, what's happening? Where are they getting this money from? Well, they're cutting it out from uh, you know, uh, the staff who work for the city of Frankston. In the chief executive offices, office, they've appointed about four people. Uh, in the economic development section of the council now, they've appointed another three people. Business support, they've appointed another three people. Adds up to about 25 people. However, they've announced that they're going to reduce 51 staff. That means that uh, these positions will be lost. Now, where are these 51 positions coming from? They're coming from health officers, immunisation, home carers, drainage maintenance, plant operators, street sweepers, building inspectors, caretakers. Preschools, cemetery, nursery, litter collection, parks, gardens, family counselling and support and youth services, childcare. That's where the jobs are going to be lost, not out of all the executive staff, but where the real workers are, where the coalface is, where the people who work for the community are placed. They're all going to be sacked to make up this phony amount that Kennett sort of set on these governments that they've got to save. So those people are going to be sacked any minute now. We've actually had um, information that it, it could happen very soon. What else has this council uh, cut? Council grants slashed by half. 
And if you have a look at the areas they've cut, community houses they've cut, um, MS self group, uh, self help group that's been cut from a thousand to a seven hundred dollars. Biella Peninsula, this is for helping uh, disabled youth, seven hundred and fifty to zero dollars. Seaford Junior Library, seven hundred to four hundred and fifty dollars. The list just goes on and on, page after page. They're just a few examples, and that's where these appointees of Geoffrey Kennett are going to make these tremendous cuts to affect the whole of the community. They'll be looked after very, very nicely, sitting on a fat wage, getting a car, telephone, all the perks and lurks that go with it. As I said at the beginning, I uh, did not intend to attack the uh, commissioners of the city of Frankston, and I've played it pretty straight with them up until now. They've done this to me by putting in the name and the campaign office of my opponent in an actual magazine that goes throughout the whole of community, and that's playing dirty pool as far as I'm concerned. We have a look at the uh, Liberal Party up here in relation to uh, local government. They usually get their uh, orders from um, Des Moore, who uh, is a member of the uh, who, who works for the IPA. The IPA re recently uh, announced that they're going to uh, have an audit council. This is in the, some summary of. Uh, uh, the Commonwealth budget that he put out, and you, the Liberal Party have picked this up and they're going to have this audit if they ever get into power. So you can take the IPA, IPA backgrounder as being fairly accurate, uh, as it came out on the 10th of February 1995. If you have a look at what uh, Des Moore says in it, assistance for local government. There is no case for the Commonwealth to provide funding to local governments, which are a creation of the state's and whose functions are distributed as between state and local levels differently among the states. So this is what, if the Liberals ever got into power, what they intend to do, cut out local government. And if you look at the amount that's uh, involved here, it's 152 million. Can you imagine what would happen uh, to local government if uh, John Howard and uh, Geoffrey Kennett ever got in at the same time? That would be slashed, destroyed, and uh, all that good work that is done by local government councillors would be lost. It's all right for us up here, and we're away from home probably six months out of the year, but it's the local councillors who looked after local issues. The main issues I look after now are local government issues—roads and drains and dogs barking, trees and all that—because the people of Frankston have nowhere to go to. They can't speak to the commissioners. They can always ring me up and speak to me, and I can fire off a letter and try and get some sort of answer from the uh, commissioners of the city of Frankston. Democracy has been denied in Frankston, in Victoria, and it's about time people all over Victoria stood up and realised what's going on. As I said before, I believe that we should, someone within our community, not me, should take the lead and say, no taxation without representation. Get rid of these appoint Kennett appointed members of the Liberal Party and put in people who are democratically elected. Order. The question is that the, uh, the words proposed to be admitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for Werriwa. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm pleased to uh, speak in support of the legislation before the House. Even though compared to federal systems internationally, local government in Australia does not represent a large proportion of the public sector, the impact of its services is significant. Australia's 800 councils spend approximately $10 billion, or nearly 2 per cent of GDP, on a wide range of economic and social services. Improvements to the de development approvals process, for example, are an essential microeconomic reform. Investment in land and building development accounts for approximately 14 per cent of Australia's GDP. It is estimated that uh, $1 billion in costs could be removed from the business sector if councils lifted their performance in development approvals to best practice standards. And I know the, the, the minister is keen to see those best, standard, best practice standards produced across the local government sector. Just as much, Mr Deputy Speaker, local government discharges a growing set of responsibilities for quality of life programs. It is little understood in Australia's federal system of government how, among the five community services from which young people derive their lifestyle opportunities education, childcare, recreation, cultural pursuits, and libraries, all but education are provided by local government. In any practical assessment of social justice and equity issues in Australia, 
local government bulks large. The quality of life in Australia depends substantially on the services and opportunities which the community provides from the combined resources of government. Inequality depends as much on where people live and their access to basic services as their access to satisfactory incomes. Less privileged areas are particularly affected by the lack of resources available to local government. In affluent areas and regions, high personal incomes can secure access to a range of services otherwise provided by local government. If residents purchase for themselves uh, books for their, their own library, recreation facilities, childcare and opportunities in the arts, the need for councils to provide these services is substantially reduced. Private affluence replaces public necessity. Conversely, the extended quality of council services are much more important for the quality of life in low-income areas. The federal government has an equity role to play in closing the gap between municipal responsibilities and municipal finances in disadvantaged local government areas. The traditional role of councils as providers of civic infrastructure and property-related services is not as important to the creation of a more equal society as quality of life services. In disadvantaged areas, progress is more likely to come from quality libraries and learning and recreation and cultural development than roads, drainage and waste removal. Unless local government plays a strong role in lifestyle opportunities, rewards and progress in our society will continue to be founded more on where people live and the wealth and privilege of families than on merit and equal opportunity. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Local Government Financial Assistance Act 1986 provides for federal untied financial assistance grants to be paid on an equal per capita basis to each state and territory. The amount of uh, financial assistance grants and road funding aggregated comes to approximately a billion dollars each year. Section 9 of the 1986 legislation sets out the basis of horizontal equalisation. The Act also requires that no council receive less than it would have received if 30 per cent of the total funds in each state had been distributed on a per capita basis. Horizontal equalisation in the main Act means equalisation of the capacity to provide services, not equalisation of outcomes for the quality of life in each local government area. That is, grants are allocated to achieve, state by state, a certain standard of service with insufficient regard for social need and the demand for services. Only by gauging the capacity of areas to provide services from personal incomes and assets can governments target the benefits of public resources and services. The funding formulas in each state give too much weight presently to equalising the standard of services and not enough to equalising their impact, their social impact, in the community. As a result, grants are not necessarily targeted to areas of highest social need. This shortcoming was well exposed by data presented in the discussion paper Financing Local Government, produced last year by the Australian Urban and Regional Development Review. The paper presents a correlation between the allocation of financial assistance grants and the ABS 1991 Census Index of relative socio-economic advantage and disadvantage. The index scores each local government area in Australia according to a range of socio-economic variables such as income, education levels, unemployment rates and home ownership. The data, which I would seek to uh, have incorporated in Hansard as Table 1, reveals a series of inequitable outcomes. There is only a loose correlation between socio-economic need and the scale of grants. In Victoria, for instance, the most disadvantaged 25 per cent of councils average grants of $47.77 per capita in 1991-92, while the second most advantaged quarter of councils received over $56 per capita. In Western Australia, the second quarter of councils received substantially lower per capita grants than the, most affluent, the more affluent third quarter. In Tasmania, the second quarter received substantially higher grants than the, mo the more advantaged first quarter. At a regional level, even more inequitable outcomes are common. Table 2, which I would also seek to incorporate in Hansard, using eight councils on Sydney's urban fringe, shows how levels of so social advantage and disadvantage are unrelated to the size and scale of financial assistance grants per capita. These correlations and inequities can be linked to two inadequacies in the 1986 Act. First, the methodologies adopted by the state local government grant commissions allow substantial variations from a national approach to needs-based funding. And I congratulate the Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, for seeking through this legislation to ensure that national principles 
based on equity, based on efficiency, are incorporated in the allocation of financial assistance grants to local government. Mr Deputy Speaker, the core methodology for rev revenue raising capacity in each state relies heavily on property valuations and rating bases. Standardised expenditures are determined mainly by cost differentials such as location, distance and the sparsity of population. More, most significantly, no state includes in its funding formula a reliable measure of socio-economic advantage and disadvantage. While for many years these statistics and indices were not available, the ABS and Australian Taxation Office now have devised a series of worthwhile measures, excellent measures suitable for national standards. There is no longer any reason why the funding formula should not take prominent account of the social need for municipal services. The principles set out in the 1986 Act and formulas devised by the State Local Government Grants Commission and subsequently approved by federal ministers to this point ensure that any correlation between the distribution of grants and socio-economic need has virtually been coincidental. Virtually coincidental. The high priority given to revenue raising capacity means only that only when revenue measures coincide with community needs will a local government area receive an equitable share of funding. In the western and southwestern suburbs of Sydney, for instance, land values and rate revenue are artificially inflated by Sydney's expensive property market, yet disposable family incomes are relatively low. As a result, councils receive per capita federal grants based on distorted measures of revenue raising capacity rather than the capacity of the community to provide services for itself. Second, the equity of grant allocations is heavily distorted by the requirement for 30 per cent of funds to be distributed on a per capita basis. This guarantees each local authority in Australia access to federal grants. On a needs-based assessment, however, not every local government area requires special assistance to service its community. Indeed, if the full logic of horizontal equalisation is followed to its most equitable outcome, levies should be placed on relatively well-endowed councils to help finance grants for the less well-endowed. This policy has been used in some European nations to ensure the success of horizontal equalisation, irrespective of the provision of general revenue assistance from other levels of government. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, assuming the absence of intra-local government redistribution and adequate federal funding to achieve full equalisation to the highest standard, two models of equalisation are available to the federal government. First, full equalisation to a standard determined by available funds, and second, partial equalisation to a higher standard. The 1986 legislation uses the latter approach with the further restriction of the 30 per cent per capita threshold. By uh, applying the conclusions of the 1985 self report on disability measures, where 22 per cent of councils would not be eligible for funding under full equalisation, applying those conclusions to the 1991 ABS census index of relative socio-economic disadvantage, it is possible to approximate the funding in each state which is needlessly allocated to affluent local government areas. $130.1 million of federal grants in the mainland states would otherwise be available for distribution to more disadvantaged local government areas. This represents 18.2 per cent of the federal allocation for 1993-94. The self-report in 1985 calculated this amount at 20 per cent using a comprehensive model of disabilities. It can therefore be seen, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Minister has a task ahead in determining the national principles to ensure the most equitable allocation of funds. Further, Mr Deputy Speaker, equalisation can be enhanced by abolishing the per capita component, as the self-report concluded at page 253 of its deliberations, and I quote, if the same order of funds is made available as at present, 70 per cent of authorities would be entitled to equalisation grants and these grants would be sufficient to raise each of these authorities to, in, to within half a million dollars of the average disability. Without the per capita constraint, nearly 80 per cent of authorities would receive grants sufficient to raise them fully to the average disability." End of quote. I would make the additional point, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the reallocation of local government funding in this fashion is not only, uh, can not only proceed on the basis of social equity, there is also an important employment consequence. That is that the councils which would receive the extra funding, by and large, uh, are part of low employment, low growth regions. And as uh, Bob, Bob Gregory in, in his, his research has pointed out, this is largely a product of economic restructuring, 
the loss of uh, relatively low-skilled work in some of the manufacturing and government sectors has led to above average rates of unemployment. Uh, the restructuring of the economy has also meant that uh, jobs uh, of, uh, of a non -traded, uh, in the non-traded sectors are, uh, are being predominantly provided in high-growth, high-consumption regions with the outsourcing of household functions. So, Out of this uh, proposal for a redistribution of local government funding, it's not only on social equity and social need, but there is an outstanding employment consequence to provide the sort of relatively low-skilled, non-traded work in regions with, uh, with low employment and to bring down their rates of unemployment. So I recommend also uh, that proposition, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the formulation of the national principles. I now turn to the question of road funding, which is dealt with in this bill. State commissions have always included an assessment for roads as part of their determination of financial assistance grants. This role is now duplicated by identified road grants with formulas that vary substantially from state to state. At Table 3, which I will seek to have incorporated in Hansard, uh, I present a summary of the state formulas, and, hi and this highlights the absence of a national approach to local road funding. The weakness of these grants is the way in which they distort the principles of horizontal equalisation. Grants are allocated between the states according to past patterns of expenditure instead of per capita funding. These imbalances are aggravated by inequities in the road funding formulas in some states. Again, I congratulate the minister for moving towards national principles, not only in the FAGs, the financial assistance grants, but also the road funding allocations. Moreover, local road grants have become a substitute for other sources of local government revenue dedicated to roads. Most councils have a road allocation target or precedent in their annual budget, which is set with little regard for the size of federal grants. As the self-report concluded, and I quote, road grants to local government are very close to general purpose assistance, especially since nothing is done to counter substitution effects at the local government level and assure that the money actually leads to increased spending on roads. In the longer run, it would be desirable to absorb the federal grant for local roads into the program of general purpose assistance, unquote. The main argument presented against this recommendation is that it is not supported by a majority of councils. This is simply a case of the beneficiaries of inequity outweighing the lobbying capacity of the disadvantaged. Local road grants have become an addition to the overall <laughs> financial capacity of councils without any link to social need or horizontal equalisation principles. At Table 4, I give a guide to their impact in each state. The current allocation of uh, road grants provides a significant funding share for affluent, affluent local government areas. Table 5 shows that 61.4 million, or 20.4 per cent, of local road funding has been granted to the 22 per cent most advantaged municipalities in the mainland states for 1993-94. These figures, combined with the financial assistance grants, mean that approximately $200 million, or 19 per cent, of federal funding for local government in Australia is allocated to councils, socially measured and socially conceived, least in need. The distribution of road grants in New South Wales, Victoria, Western Australia and South Australia between urban and rural areas creates further inequities. In particular, no allowance is made for local government areas which are classified urban yet contain substantial rural road networks. And even the National Party would be interested in that phenomenon. At Table 6, I give an example in New South Wales where councils in designated urban areas receive much lower per capita funding than rural councils with the same road length. Per capita figures are valid in this instance as they broadly reflect traffic volumes and the relative benefit of road funding shares. Mr Deputy Speaker, the vagaries of urban development and local government boundaries have meant that most urban fringe councils in Sydney, and I represent one at Campbelltown in my electorate, the Hunter and Illawarra, are based on urban areas surrounded by a network of townships and rural roads. The fixed distribution of urban and road funding shares has not been sensitive to this need. It's not been sensitive. Rural roads in urban statistical areas receive no more than 30 per cent of the federal funding allocated to rural roads in rural statistical areas in New South Wales. I pointed out to the shadow minister, a member of the National Party, a very important inequity here. If he wants to support rural roads, he should recognise, he should recognise the funding needs of what have been regarded in the statistical data as urban areas, because there are a number of anomalies. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, strong arguments can be presented for the government to incorporate local road grants into the program of general purpose assistance. This would produce greater autonomy for local government in its expenditure decisions, simplify the grant scheme and resolve several aspects of inequitable funding. If separate local road grants remain, they should, after the expiry of the new agreement uh, resolved by the last Premier's conference, they should be distributed on a per capita basis for each state with a standard funding formula in all states and without artificial distinctions, artificial distinctions between urban and rural areas. I now refer to the findings of some recent uh, reports on road funding. Firstly, the National Transport Planning Task Force in its report in November of last year found that Australia would maximise its GDP by transferring a proportion of road funding from local to arterial roads and from, ru uh, from rural to urban roads. This finding has been, uh, has been supported by the work that Dr Vince Fitzgerald prepared in 1993, uh, commissioned by the Australian Automobile Association. I, read, uh, I now quote Fitzgerald's finding. The historical pattern of investment has led to relative overinvestment in local and rural roads and underinvestment in major urban roads. An economically optimal pattern of investment should result in returns from investment in each category of road being similar. Instead, the results show higher returns from investment in urban roads than investment in local and rural roads. This, of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, should not be a surprise to the House. It shouldn't be surprising that GDP is maximised by a transfer from rural to urban road funding and from local to arterial roads, because this is the way in which the Australian economy has been transformed over the past decade. That is, there's been a major shift in the origins of product, the origins of production from agriculture and mining, Australia's areas of historic reliance, to manufacturing and services industries, mainly based in urban areas. I would seek through tables seven and eight incorporated in Hansard to provide the statistical evidence uh, developed by Dr Fitzgerald well, in his the landmark member seeking 19... Leave to incorporate 19... these tables well, I will at the end of my speech, Mr okay. Deputy Speaker, and I've provided copies to both the minister and the shadow minister at the front table. Let me also uh, address the question of capital works. The government has recent experience with the benefits of capital works funding for local councils. In 1992-93 and again the following year, approximately $350 million was allocated to local capital works in regions with rates of unemployment above the national average. And, uh, these were, by and large, very successful schemes. The special federal grants helped councils clear a backlog of infrastructure projects which were outside the scope of their annual budgets. Councils estimated that the infrastructure constructed under the program had an average annual value to the community of $124 million. Evaluation reports prepared by the Minister's Department also demonstrated the strong and very useful employment effects of those schemes. I believe the government should ensure that part of its overall funding for local government is dedicated to capital works purposes in disadvantaged areas. This would more effectively realise the government's goals for targeting assistance to areas of greatest need and building up the quality of lifestyle services. Only with federal capital assistance can many councils operate beyond the scope of a maintenance authority and actively upgrade the standard of local infrastructure. So I've tried, Mr Deputy Speaker, to outline some principles, some ideas, some concepts Order. based Order. on the equity efficiency that the Minister may find useful in the preparation Order. of the, the national principles in this outstanding legislation. I take it the member is going to seek leave to incorporate the tables in hand. I do, Mr Deputy Speaker. I seek leave to incorporate those Le uh, eight leave tables. Is granted that and the, the member should be made aware that, uh, depending on how voluminous they are, as to whether Hansard can deal with them. I'm aware of that. Okay. okay. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The minister. <coughs> well, Mr Speaker, if I could uh, thank uh, uh, the various members that have contributed to, to the debate, I think. Uh, as the member for Maranoa said, this uh, legislation is uh, not only important, and uh, indeed I think it is uh, legislation in the sense that it opens up uh, a very significant uh, agenda and debate uh, in terms of local government uh, funding. Uh, perhaps that debate is not quite as uh, far-reaching as the member for Werriwa would like to make it, but I think it uh, does provide uh, the basis uh, for a significant uh, shift in terms of uh, local government uh, funding over time 
to greater reflect uh, the dual uh, objectives of efficiency and equity uh, that the member Ferreira regard, uh, referred to. And uh, those principles, I think, are extraordinarily important in terms of any uh, tier of government, but of course uh, they uh, are sorted out, if you like, in terms of uh, uh, balance of uh, forces at a particular time. In terms of the Commonwealth's relationship with uh, local government, it's a relationship uh, that involves uh, a partnership, as uh, numerous uh, speakers uh, referred to, but it's also one that necessarily involves the states who have uh, significant uh, legislative power in terms of local government uh, and who set uh, their own objectives in terms of uh, local government reform. And I think we heard something of that from the member for Dunkley, uh, who, uh, while he agrees with the objective, uh, uh, has uh, very considerable reservations about the means uh, chosen to achieve that, uh, that objective, uh, particularly, I think, uh, the uh, power of uh, the non-elected uh, commissioners and particularly the concerns about uh, the use of state uh, uh, budgetary or fiscal policy uh, uh, to impose targets in relation to uh, local government uh, savings that are achieved at a time in which there are no elected uh, councillors in place. And I think you, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, I don't think in your previous life uh, would have tolerated uh, or felt uh, comfortable uh, with that kind of approach uh, to reform. But we're talking here about what the Commonwealth uh, can do, and I think the Commonwealth uh, can be clear about its objectives. And what this legislation does is it seeks to uh, not uh, tie, and I don't think this is really a serious argument anywhere that we are about to, uh, to tie uh, funding for local government, uh, but that we are about to uh, say we provide that uh, funding, if you like, uh, over a billion dollars apart from the uh, various uh, um, tied grants or special grants that were mentioned, uh, the billion dollars untied, uh, for a particular purpose, because we do recognise the uh, constitutional uh, uh, or we recognise the importance of local government. Indeed, much of what I've had to say while I've been responsible for local government is to say to local government and local councils, you really have been far too unambitious in uh, what you have sought to achieve. Local government in this country has, I think, somewhat meekly accepted uh, the fact that uh, its powers are much more limited than the powers that exist uh, for local councils and other countries overseas. For example, I spent time in the United States uh, and indeed lived there for two years, and I was uh, and uh, my family have lived there since uh, for extended periods of time. And I think what strikes you about local government in the United States is the fact that. Uh, it does uh, have considerable more power and uh, more um, influence, if you like, than uh, local government uh, in this country. And uh, it's a very democratic uh, level of government. It's one in which uh, participation is uh, uh, very vigorous, but it's a level of government that's been entrusted to it, a range of uh, opportunities that simply haven't been open to local government in this country. Now, I think a precondition for uh, local government having uh, greater opportunity in this country is for local government uh, to undergo a process of reform. Now, in part, that uh, is uh, uh, achieved through a reduction in the number of councils, and uh, I don't remember the number that the member for Maranoa mentioned, but uh, it sounded like a lot less than it would have been uh, a year or two ago. And it is true that several state governments have been involved in very significant reform. Tasmania, Victoria and Queensland have all, uh, I think, uh, sought to reduce the number of councils, and I certainly congratulate them for that. I think uh, local government did need to be in the form of larger units. But that's very much a matter for state government. As far as the federal government is concerned, uh, we have uh, uh, provided uh, very substantial funding to local government, I think something like uh, twice the level of funding that's made available by state governments, so relatively more important uh, than state governments. And I think it's not unreasonable that uh, we be clear in what those uh, objectives of uh, what uh, we provide that money for. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this bill, uh, we've tried to make, uh, I think, uh, clear. Uh, what, those, uh, what the objectives are that we're seeking to achieve. 
Now we're moving to a concept of uh, national principles, and we're doing that, I think, for reasons that uh, uh, wouldn't be uh, uh, surprising to the member for uh, for Werriwa. Because what we found when we looked at the uh, bilateral arrangements or the principles worked out with the states uh, is there were extraordinary inequities uh, as between or differences as between uh, states. So that rather than having uh, uh, a, an influence in terms of uh, uh, the uh, principles uh, of uh, equity and efficiency, those kind of principles in the past, uh, what we've seen is a set of uh, uh, principles worked out by state. Uh, uh, states and state grants commissions that uh, uh, differed widely in terms of their impact. And I think it's not unreasonable over time to work towards a much more nationally consistent uh, approach to the way that funds are distributed, and uh, I think uh, that is accepted. It's been uh, suggested there's not been some process of consultation. And frankly, I suppose if there's been any touch of emotion in the debate at any time in which I felt slightly emotional, it was when I was accused of not consulting local government. I have, uh, from the beginning, consulted government, local government uh, extremely widely, speaking to all of the uh, state uh, conferences of local government uh, associations at one time or another. I have uh, spoke to many individual local councils, to shires associations, and uh, what's more, we put out uh, a far-reaching report on financing for local government, or two reports. Uh, both acknowledged, uh, I think, by the member for Maranoa, but reports that are about providing the data on the basis of which uh, judgments might be made about, uh, broadly, the allocation and distribution of funds by local government. Now, following the distribution of, that, uh, of the papers in terms of the Urban and Regional Review, there have been a series of conferences involving uh, ministers for local government, and the RGA has been involved in those, uh, in those meetings. Uh, and I have uh, vigorously defended the right of local government to be present at those meetings. I might say there's not the same enthusiasm on the part of the states uh, for local government uh, to be present and to be fully part uh, of the discussion. The first set of national principles were agreed by the states and the ALG at the April uh, uh, conference of uh, local government uh, ministers. So there's been agreement uh, about the set of national principles uh, uh, that uh, were drafted at that time. The new bill provides that the minister, after consulting the state ministers, must formulate the principles in writing and convey them uh, to, uh, to uh, state ministers. The new principles would then apply from 96-97 funding year onwards. As consultation and agreement has already taken place, the only further process uh, is for me formally to agree the principles in writing and notify them to the state uh, ministers. So there's been a process, if you like, that has involved uh, uh, the ALGA in a very thorough way and state ministers in a very thorough way, and I've sought to honour that. I suppose uh, that doesn't mean that uh, consultation, as uh, someone remarked, uh, doesn't mean agreement, doesn't mean that in the end of the day I can take on board everything that uh, has been suggested to me by the ALGA or the president of the ALGA. But I think, as they uh, would uh, concede or have conceded, we've been very keen to uh, uh, consult uh, very, very closely uh, uh, with them. And I think, in the end, uh, we've tried to come up with something that, uh, uh, that, uh, that they didn't have any fundamental uh, worries about. I think they've got some niggles there, and uh, I think that's uh, understandable uh, in the sense that we are trying to move uh, to a situation of much greater accountability and transparency, not just to uh, the executive but to the parliament, and that's why we'll introduce national reporting and make that report available to the parliament. We'll never ever have uh, better information, we've never had a better information uh, than is available. And I think if uh, the Commonwealth government invests over a billion dollars a year, along with the uh, other funds that we provide, but over a billion dollars a year, it's entitled to get uh, uh, on the table uh, a pretty fair uh, uh, view of uh, how local government is performing. Now, of course, that is, uh, I think people would recognise, is uh, not an easy business, not just a matter of publishing, as I saw in the paper the other day, a uh, league table. Uh, and making judgments about that league table, say, for New South Wales. 
It is a matter of looking carefully at the functions of local government and recognising the, uh, uh, the necessity of uh, making judgments that uh, will often uh, compare very different situations, and so then one has to be sure about uh, comparing like with like. And that's why we've uh, had the Municipal Association in Victoria uh, very hard at work, and I must say cooperatively, uh, doing some work in relation to benchmarking, so that ultimately when we do put more emphasis on benchmarking, it's, uh, the work has been done by local government it's been, uh, and therefore has acceptance from local government. It's worked through in a very thorough way and it's progressively uh, implemented, if you like, so that people have an opportunity to see what, uh, what happens. Now, frankly, I think local government is going to welcome uh, uh, these uh, reforms in practice. They are reforms that are essentially, uh, perhaps uh, the member for Maranoa would say, uh, a little too cautious, and uh, he would agree with the member for Wera on that. But I don't think that the member for Maranoa would want to accept the reforms suggested uh, uh, in a full-blooded way by the member for, Marua, for Wera. So we are gentle about this, but we are gentle about it because we believe the facts will be persuasive. If we can get the facts on the table, the facts themselves will ultimately be very, very persuasive. So I have never said, look, we have to uh, make threats or we have to make suggestions about uh, uh, removing untied uh, grants. We are supporting untied grants. We are enthusiastic about uh, the autonomy of local government. That is why we supported the referendum in uh, 1988. We wanted constitutional recognition, and unfortunately the other side of the House, led by the member for Flinders, uh, who uh, worked himself up into a terrible ladder, and I think did local government in this country a very great disservice. And frankly, I think, uh, as you indicated yourself, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, the issue of recognition of local government is one that uh, in the community there's a great deal of support for. And uh, so I'd like to conclude by uh, thanking the uh, various members for their uh, contribution and uh, assuring uh, them that uh, their, com their comments have been taken on board and that uh, we'll go on with this process of uh, reform over time at a pace that local government can live with, but also uh, in a way that uh, recognises the contribution uh, of the states with whom we need to cooperate if we're able to achieve the kind of comprehensive reforms that uh, the member for Werra uh, no doubt will be pursuing as a backbencher and ultimately as a minister within uh, uh, future uh, governments. Order. The original question was, would this bill be now read a second time? To this, the honourable member for Maranoa has moved as, as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. Uh, all those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The, uh, the question now is that the bill now be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark, second reading, a bill for an act to provide for financial assistance for local government purposes by means of grants to the states, the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory and for related purposes. Order. I have received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General recommending in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution an appropriation for the purposes of this bill. Uh, the House will now consider the bill in detail. I understand it is the wish of the House to take the bill as a whole. Mr. Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move amendments 1, 2 and 3 circulated in my name together. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Member I thank the, uh, the Minister for granting leave. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, <coughs> as foreshadowed in my response to the bill at the second reading stage, I move the first, second and third amendments circulated in my name. One of the most glaring omissions in this bill is the failure to require consultation with local government on the preparation of the national principles for the intrastate distribution of financial assistance grants. This is a breach of the understanding reached between local government, state ministers and the Australian Local Government Association at the recent Local Government Ministers' Conference. Mr Deputy Speaker, the need for the Minister to consult with local government on the development of national distribution principles should be self-explanatory. 
Local government works closely with the states and the Commonwealth on discussions relating with the development, implementation and operation of these principles. And it would be inconceivable that provision for consultation on these issues not be uh, reflected in the bill. It is also a rather strange omission in the light of the government's expressed commitment to consultation and as evidenced in the minister's recent announcement of his intention to develop an accord with local government. The amendment requiring the minister to consult with state ministers and local government before varying or revoking the principles similarly needs little explanation. The bill's silence on the need for consultation in the event of variation or revocation, revocation of the principles may have been a drafting oversight, but is nevertheless one that needs to be corrected. There is also no reason why the bill should not require the minister to provide copies of the national principles to local government as key players in the administration of local government funding arrangements. I commend the amendments to the House. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Okay. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move that Amendment 4 circulated in my name uh, be considered. Okay, that, uh, the government uh, is not willing to accept this amendment. Wish to speak to the member for Maranara. Yes, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I move the fourth amendment circulated in my name. Uh, this bill provides the federal minister with enormous personal discretion over intrastate distribution of federal local government financial assistance grants. In the case of local road funding, the minister's discretion is that the interstate distribution of these funds is completely unfettered. The only limitation on the minister's power in respect of the distribution of general purpose grants is the requirement that the funds be allocated on a horizontal equalisation basis, together with a minimum per capita requirement. While the current draft of the national principles are similar to arrangements already in place, and as I mentioned earlier, have relatively little impact on the current interstate funding distribution, the scope does exist in the legislation for the propagation of principles which substantially alter this distribution. For example, depending on the criteria used, the result might be a shift in the rural-urban split of funding or allocation of funds on a regional basis. There is a real potential that at some indeterminate time in the future, that great big whiteboard will be dusted off and brought back into active service. In the past, an unrestricted power to determine principles has provided the, a federal minister with a role in the disbursement of specific councils of special reserve local road funds. For all these reasons, Mr Speaker, the opposition considers it inappropriate that the principles are a disallowable instrument subject to the full scrutiny of parliament. The government agreed to this arrangement on the at the local government ministers' meeting in October 1994, but has failed to ensure it is incorporated in the bill. The minutes of this meeting clearly reflect this and the other agreements I have referred to today. Mr Deputy Speaker, the intention of the Fourth Amendment circulated in my name accords the national principles the status of a disallowable instrument for the purposes of the Acts Interpretation Act. This provides the Parliament with an opportunity to examine the principles and, if it, if it has concerns about their content, to pass a motion disallowing them. The notice of motion to disallow must be given within 15 sitting days after the principles have been laid before the House. This process promotes transparency in the allocation process and retains some parliamentary oversight of the distribution of $1.1 billion of federal Commonwealth assistance provided annually. I commend the amendment to the House. 
question is that the amendment be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. No ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The ayes have passed. The right of the chair knows the left. I point. Tell us for the ayes, honourable members for Wadden and Riverina. Tell us for the noes, the honourable members for Port Adelaide and Fowler.
Davis and Alan Miles. Order the result of the division is ayes 62, noes 70. The division is therefore resolved in the negative. Would honourable members please resume their correct seats?
Would honourable members resume their seats? It is past 3 p.m. It being past 3 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. Questions without notice. Are there any questions, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I ask the Prime Minister: Is he aware of the view expressed by Professor George Winterton, a member of the Republican Advisory Committee, that if the Governor-General's powers are inherited by a Republican head of state? Since the link with the monarchy would have been severed, the present conventions governing the exercise of the reserve powers might not subsist. What is the basis of the Prime Minister's apparently confident belief that the conventions governing the reserve powers can safely travel from a Governor-General to a President, even though they are not conventions of government but conventions of the Crown? The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the uh, uh, the government uh, would uh, would uh, and the parliament would, by by proposal, then by referendum, uh, make clear in a referendum proposal that those powers uh, now enjoyed by the uh, governor general, so-called reserve powers, would be enjoyed by uh, the incumbent president. In which case, uh, the powers would be undefined. Uh, the alternative is to try and define the powers to say what such a person may or may not do. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the honourable gentleman will agree. Opposite uh, will agree that the difficulty in that is that all of the contingencies which go to the rights and prerogatives of the head of state versus the head of government versus the government. Uh, these questions about the rights of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet in the event, say, of a 1975 type deadlock, all of these sorts of problems would then have to be comprehended in a set of codified, uh, a set of codified arrangements. Uh, and uh, I think they are not capable, A, of being agreed uh, B, and, B, uh, foreseen. So uh, it's um, the, the implication, what's implied in the question, if it's not written down, the power doesn't exist. Uh, and, uh, yeah, no, and, uh, Order. Uh, no but, uh, but the thing is, but, but my point is, my point is, if it is written in, yeah, yeah, if it is written in, it's in, even if it isn't articulated. The honourable member for Patterson. Mr. Speaker, and my question, without notice, is to the treasurer. Can the Treasurer advise the House of the importance of returning the budget to surplus and what would be the consequences of failing to achieve that outcome? The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, in response to the member for Patterson, I can say that uh, clearly it is very important to return the budget to surplus, as the government has uh, announced it will do in 1995-6 uh, through uh, uh, various measures, including significant fiscal tightening and achieving a surplus of $780 million in 95-6 and uh, going out to $7.4 billion by 98-9. Now that's important, Mr Speaker, to take the pressure off interest rates because it dramatically reduces the bond selling task by some $15 billion in 95-6. Uh, the tightening of fiscal policy is anti-inflationary and so it helps us to keep low inflation and it's also, of course, uh, 
the process of uh, rest restoration of budget surpluses uh, means that there is a reduction, a major reduction in public sector dissaving, uh, so a boost to national saving, less reliance on the savings of foreigners and a better balance of payments current account outcome. Now, all this, Mr Speaker, represents uh, classic counter-cyclical policy as well as an attempt to structurally improve our national savings. Now, the importance of such policy uh, can e has even been recognised Mr. Speaker, by the Leader of the Opposition, who in his uh, otherwise uh, extraordinarily unnotable speech, uh, his headland speech on Tuesday night, otherwise known as his Cape Barron speech, said uh, his Cape Barron speech, uh, no, absolutely nothing in it. He did manage to make this commitment, though, Mr. Speaker. He said, uh, uh, with greater economic flexibility will reduce but not remove the need for counter-cyclical for counter macroeconomic policies from time to time. So he uh, therefore said that they could see that there would be a need for counter-cyclical macroeconomic policies, and that's what, of course, the government is engaged in in, in this uh, budget, for the reasons that I've just mentioned. And subsequently, he went on to say, and to preserve policy flexibility and prudent public debt levels. The corollary is that the governments will need to run budget surpluses in the upswing to increase public saving, which is vital to curing Australia's current account deficit problem. So here he is uh, then committing himself to saying that uh, we should have budget surpluses in the upswing to increase public saving, which is vital to uh, addressing the current account. And Mr Speaker, that was the rhetoric, but there's an enormous gap between the windy rhetoric of the headland speech and the actual reality of opposition behaviour. Because, as everyone in this House knows, what the opposition is trying to do in this budget debate is uh, to prevent billions of dollars uh, of uh, deficit reduction uh, from going through. And they are doing that by, by opposing various uh, tax measures in relation to company tax, Medicare levy, building materials, cars, the PAYE remittance and the provisional tax uplift factor. The combined effect of which, uh, in 1996, uh, would be to deprive the government of uh, some $1.5 billion of tax revenue and, uh, in the following year, $2.6 billion. And uh, to change the budget outcome uh, for this year from a surplus of $718 million to a deficit of $827 million and uh, next year from a surplus of $3.4 billion to a, surplus, a much smaller surplus of $816 million, in other words, a surplus which would uh, only be a surplus because of asset sales and not what the government was trying to achieve in 1996-7, a surplus without asset sales. And Mr Speaker, so therefore we see, uh, on the one hand, this uh, commitment in the broad, this uh, rhetoric about support uh, for, uh, for uh, responsible counter-cyclical policy and budget surpluses, on the other hand, an absolute attempt to prevent that happening. Now, that is just nothing more, Mr Speaker, than economic sabotage. Economic sabotage by an opposition who is prepared to say, on the one hand, try to stand on the lofty heights, that we support appropriate policy, we stand for appropriate policy, and policy which is in the interest of the nation. But when it comes to the particular reality of measures before this House, voting time and time again to try to stop that outcome occurring. In other words, it's just complete attempt to uh, sabotage the economy, to make it more difficult in terms of the current account, uh, to make it uh, more difficult in terms of anti-inflation behaviour, and to uh, keep pressure on interest rates. They would like to see those things happen, quite clearly from their behaviour, Mr Speaker. Now, that is just an atrocious position for the opposition to be in. And the Leader of the Opposition wants to sort of go around and stump around the country pretending to be a man of uh, some honour and um, a man who stands for something substantial and there's a real alternative, then surely it's up to him to behave like that and, and not just to make uh, expressions of high-sounding rhetoric. Mr Speaker, when it comes to reality, what we see is an opposition which is simply unprepared to do that. And if they want to argue, Mr Speaker, that uh, the way in which uh, it should be done is through outlays, let me just say this very briefly about outlays. Outlays for 95-6 at 25.1 per cent of GDP are 3.5 per cent of GDP below what they were when we came into office. 3.5 per cent of GDP, less than they were when the now Leader of the Opposition was Treasurer. 3.5 per cent of GDP. Outlays as percentage of GDP in 95-6 are lower than in any year when the now Leader of the Opposition was Treasurer. And outlays are projected to drop 
to 24 per cent of GDP by, by 98.9 uh, from uh, their current 25.1 per cent in 95.6. That is almost 2 per cent of GDP less than in any year when uh, the uh, now leader of the opposition was Treasurer. So, Mr Speaker, outlays are not extravagant. They are tight, but they are very well targeted to those in need. And if the opposition want to say that we should be slashing outlays rather than raising taxes, then that means they have to face up to the fact that they'd be taking uh, amounts away from people in need, from the very people that they now say that they are concerned about. And in respect of battlers, let me just uh, conclude on this point, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition in his speech on Tuesday night revealed all by this sentence. He said, I might add that Menzies would have smiled to himself as I did when after a week of us fighting for the interests of the Australian battler. A week. And that's about how long it is, Mr Speaker. When a poll-driven analysis says, hey, fight for the battle, there might be something in that, then that's what they do for a week. Stand up and say, well, you know, we're here to defend the battle. It wasn't there. That wasn't the reality in government. It's not the reality in anything that's been said by the opposition uh, to this point in time, Mr. Speaker. And what is clear is that it's this government which stands for the people in need, and the defence of outlays demonstrates that. Honourable Leader, the opposition. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I have another question for the Prime Minister, uh, and supplementary to the first question I asked him. And I remind the Prime Minister that my first question was not directed to the question of whether or not the reserve powers should be explicitly spelt out in a Republican constitution, but whether it was possible to transfer from our present constitution to a Republican constitution reserve powers of the Crown and conventions of the Crown as distinct from the conventions of government. And I remind uh, the Prime Minister that Professor George Winterton uh, in the article to which I referred in my first question, said, and I quote, so a Republican constitution cannot simply continue the present constitutional position of conferring powers on the head of state in general terms, relying on the constitutional conventions to govern their exercise. I ask the Prime Minister specifically, is it your intention to include in your Republican constitution a clause a clause Order. specifically providing that the reserve powers exercised by the head of state shall not be justiciable before the High Court. Honourable the Prime Minister. Very definitely, Mr. Speaker. Very definitely, uh, because uh, uh, well, Mr. Order. Speaker, uh, I don't believe that the uh, the High Court should be adjudicating on matters of political dispute. I've made that point over and over again. Well, okay. As soon as you think I've given you an answer, you're grateful for you give me one. <laughs> you give me one. No, no. I've got a simple one Order. for you. Order. That is, and you can tell us tonight Order. whether you think an Australian should be our head of state. Simple enough. Simple enough. I mean, simple enough. Order. You know. Order those on my right. Whether you think an Australian should be Member our head of prospect. state, I mean, Mr. Speaker, it's it's not it's not it's not a complex or outrageous question. Simple enough, isn't it? Whether he thinks an Australian should be our head of state. That's the the central question that the leader of the opposition has to address himself to this evening. Order the member the member yes, for Moringa obviously has been. Well Mr. received Speaker, as a point of order. Standing Order 74 says that we should show respect to the Governor General. The Prime Minister is suggesting that the Governor General is not an Australian citizen, and I suggest that you. No, would, there's you no would, point of order. order. If, if, if the Honourable Member for Warringah wants to be a little clever with taking points of order, I shall also be clever. The Leader of the Opposition, I think the Leader of the Opposition asked a very serious question the Prime Minister was responding. Mr. Mr. Minister. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, no, I've given him an answer on both fronts, Mr. Speaker. I've made it very clear that I don't believe that if uh, these powers are expressly articulated in the Constitution, they will become other than matters and rules of law and will end up being justiciable. And that will mean you'll be asking justices of the High Court to decide matters. Take 1975. 
Was there anything particularly wrong with the supply bill? Was there a technical dispute? Well, of course there wasn't. The opposition of the day wanted to drive the government of the day to an election at the time of its choosing. That was what it was all about. And why would that matter then be? Why would that matter be then put in the hands of McKellar. the Chief Justice or judges of the High Court? And that's the point we made very clear last night. But, Mr. Speaker, let me say these are matters which the Australian public are entitled to think about. It's part of what I call the debate which has ensued from last night's statement, and that's why. I welcome the Leader of the Opposition's questions. But what I do want him to say is where he stands on that core point. Does he believe an Australian should be our head of state? That is a, that is the central point. And let me say, Mr Speaker, no amount of obfuscation or indecision or talking about peoples or constitutional conventions, a sort of black hole that has in it uh, the external affairs power or the power of the Senate and all these other questions will 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 obviate uh, the need for him to say where he stands on the central issue. And Mr Speaker, it's just worth recording again that one of his fellows uh, in, the, in the Premier of Victoria had a few things to say about these things. He said, I think last night's speech, while it won't be agreed by member all, for Melbourne and the member for Wills. won't be agreed to by all, sets a blueprint for a discussion. And he said, um, You've got to understand, a great number of this community are young people who do not have the same historical reference point back to the UK. We have a large number of ethnic community members who have come from, the, from republics, in fact, other sorts of societies. And I think there is a growing recognition that this is an issue that this issue is going to be resolved. Now, he goes on, now, th that will be done through a referendum, through a referendum, and the public, each and every one of us, We'll be able to make our own decision. Well, he's dead right. And he goes on to say, um, he said um, it, that it is only going to be able to really express. This is he got asked about. What do you think, Mr. Howard? Why do you think Mr. Howard is supporting a people's convention? And he goes on to say that um, that this is only going to be able to really express their personal views. They may argue they represent a greater number of people, but finally this is going to be decided by each and every one of us. A convention to me is just another committee. There's not much point calling out 400 people out of a community of 18 million, sitting them down and saying, now what do you think? Now, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker that's precisely what, that's precisely, Mr Speaker, that was the burden of my remarks last night. That, that is, Mr Speaker, that the greatest uh, act of, of expressive democracy here is the referendum, and, and a proposal for a constitutional change must come through this chamber. It cannot be conferred upon any sort of uh, constitutional committee or convention. It must come here. And, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, when, when pressed about this in the past, Order. the coalition Order. have said when asked of them, well, would you accept the results of a so-called uh, convention and put it, put it absolutely to a referendum? Oh, no, no, we'd reserve the right to make our own decision about it. In other words, in other words they're consigning, they're consigning a, a convention to basically a talk shop. And as Jeff Kennett says, I might say very eloquently, very eloquently. Um, you know, there's not much point, he says, calling out 400 people out of a community of 18 million and calling them the people and calling them the people mr speaker mr speaker i think that's 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 as uh, as clear an answer i think as can be given to this uh, this smoke screen i mean mr speaker order let's, mr order. speaker let me conclude on this point order there's only one answer to my question relax. to be answered here whether an Australian person should be the head of state, and no smothering that with the blanket of a convention by the Leader of the Opposition will disguise that question. The Honourable Member for Page. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Can the Minister inform the House of the data released today by the Australian Bureau of Statistics about the Australian labour force? What implications does that data have for the government's Working Nation initiatives? The Honourable Minister for Employment, Education and Training. I thank the Honourable Member for his question, Mr Speaker. And today's Labor Force uh, survey figures confirm in trend terms the continued improvement 
in the Australian labour market. In trend terms, the unemployment rate fell to 8.4 per cent, the lowest since December of 1990, Order. and the trend unemployment Order. rate no. Mr. Speaker, has fallen in every month since, the August, since August 1993. In other words, for almost two years, the trend rate has been coming down. In seasonally adjusted terms, the figures show today that employment fell by 21,400 and unemployment rose by 8 .5 to 8.5 per cent, but the fall in employment this month Mr. Speaker, represents a modest correction from the extraordinary jump of more than 90,000 in April and, I might say, is at the lower end of market expectations. I might also observe, Mr Speaker, for those who are shortly on the other side, that this correction this month is consistent with the recent pattern whereby we have seen very large increases in employment in one month, followed by very small corrections in the following month. That's why the trend, as well as the actual figures, have continued to come down. In fact, over the last two months, Mr Speaker, there has been a net increase in total employment of 69,000 jobs, all of it full-time jobs. I might also observe in terms of the figures today that female full-time employment rose by a further 8,800 and is now at an all-time high. And the participation rate remained at the very high 63.7%. A, very, a, a healthy sign, I might observe, Mr Speaker, of a strong labour market. So all of these figures are consistent with us achieving the working nation targets. It's true that the jobs growth has been slowing, but off huge growth that no one ever expected could be achieved. But what's also consistent when these figures come out, Mr Speaker, is the pattern of opposition response. Because last month, when there was the huge employment growth, they were out there predicting interest rate rises. This month, when we've had a fall that's observed by the markets to be a correction, they're telling us that the rate of employment growth is slowing and we're back into recession. The problem for that side, of course, is that they want to carp and criticise, but they don't want to offer constructive solutions. Where was the reference in the headland speech to employment and training? Was it one? Even in the things that matter, we had a whole chapter devoted to it, but it's dropped off the agenda over there, probably because the shadow minister is incapable of putting the policies together. No policies on employment and unemployment, no commitment to the youth training initiative or working nation, and despite the fact that we've got members of the National Party putting on record in the parliament their support for initi initiatives under the working nation initiative, the member for Lyon. Very perceptive member because he's getting behind these initiatives. They want them supported. But where is their mention on your side? None at all. No commitment to the training wage. Your approach is to cut youth wages. It's to force young people off the dole. And for those who haven't been, man haven't been able to uh, get off the, uh, the benefit, you'll wash your hands of them and refer them to the voluntary organisations. The simple fact of the matter remains, Mr Speaker, that we have created 610,000 jobs in the last two years. We have increased since 1983 the total number of jobs in the economy by 2 million, 2 million jobs and 610,000 in the last two years. John Howard, when he was Treasurer of the Coalition Government, could manage only 262,000 in five and a half years. Get the comparison. Do you understand the difference between our approach on job creation and yours? Ours produces 610,000 in two years, 2 million in the 12 years, and your miserable performance, 262,000 jobs in a whole five and a half years. Well done. Little wonder you can't put a policy together now. I might say, Mr Speaker, I'm told today I will wind it up on this point. Order. Order. I was told today, Mr Speaker, of a conversation overheard in the corridors, a conversation involving the member for Mayo. And it went like this. He asked the person what were the figures, obviously referring to the unemployment figures. The response, they're up. Alexander Downer, that's good. But he's seen saying it's good and he says, no, I mean it's bad. 
Now, we all know how he can change his mind, but the simple fact remains, Mr Speaker, that when it comes to employment, the opposition has no policies. All they've got is hope that the figures will go bad for us. Well, they're not going bad for us, and they'll continue to improve. The honourable member for Gippsland. Mr. Speaker, my question without notice is to the Prime Minister. Will you confirm that any of the estimated three million Australians who hold dual citizenship will be able to be elected to the office of President of Australia? The honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, the qualification I made clear last night: if you're an Australian citizen, you qualify. The honourable member for Morton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications and the Arts. Would the minister inform the House about actions to promote Australian Order. content in commercial television? Would he explain? Order, order, order. Start again. If you've got another question on my left, save it till it's your turn. The member for, the member for Morton has the call. One of the US Federal Communications Commissioners went out of her way to praise Australia for the fact that we're leading the way with many countries in producing quality children's drama on television, and that's something which all of us can be very proud of. The, uh, the new rules, the new standard proposed by the ABA, also provides for a simplified Australian content test, so that will provide some assistance to the broadcasters in calculating their obligations. So what we'll see, Mr Speaker, is the viewers will benefit by more Australian content, and in particular the kids will benefit by more quality Australian children's drama on television. We'll see the program makers benefit by an increase in their production slates, as well as seeing benefits for the broadcasters by the introduction of a simplified system. This, uh, this, this commitment to improving the level of Australian content on television goes side by side Mr. Speaker, with the government's assistance to the film and television industry, assistance to the Australian Film Commission to Film Australia, assistance to, uh, to the film, television and radio school, as well as our commitment in Creative Nation to provide $60 million to uh, initiate a The qualification I made clear last night. If you're an Australian citizen, you qualify. The Honourable Member for Morton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications and the Arts. Would the Minister inform the House about actions to promote Australian Order. content in commercial television? Would he explain? Order, order, order. Start again. If you've got another question on my left, save it till it's your turn. The member, for, the member for Morton has the call. No, you won't. You'll just sit there and listen. The member for Morton. Thank you, Mr. I warn the member for Mayo. My question is to the Minister for Communications and the Arts. Would the minister inform the House about actions to promote Australian content on commercial television? Would he explain how these actions will benefit Australians and help position Australia to take advantage of the broader developments in the communications sector? Is the Minister aware of any recent assessments of the communications revolution, and would he advise the House about the implications of any such assessments? The Honourable the Minister for Communications and the Arts. Mr Speaker, Australia is uh, one of the few countries that can claim to have a very innovative public broadcasting sector through the ABC and SBS as well as a very dynamic commercial television sector, Mr Speaker, all of whom are very strongly committed to producing good Australian content. Yesterday, the Australian Broadcasting Authority released its new standard for Australian content on commercial television, and the new rules will strengthen the Australian presence on our television screens. This new standard by the ABA is the result of intensive consultations with broadcasters, program makers, members of the public, and it, of course, uh, with commercial television being the most influential sectors of broadcasting in Australia, this is a, a very pivotal debate. 
It will help, I believe, Mr. Speaker, by increasing the level of Australian content on television, help make sure that we're continuing to develop and protect Australia's identity as seen on television, and in particular to make sure that the, the shape of kids' dreams in particular are, uh, are influenced in the, the right manner on television. Now, this new standard, first of all, provides for an increase in the minimum annual level of Australian content to 55 per cent, which is to be achieved by the commercial broadcasters by 1998. But most importantly of all, there will be a doubling in the level of new Australian children's drama by 1998. And Australia already has a, very, a tremendous reputation throughout the world for producing quality children's drama on television. We've got series such as The Winners, which has been seen on 82 countries around the world. We've seen Round the Twist on 45 countries around the world, as well as uh, the, the series Lift Off, which has been picked up by the Fox Network in the United States, as well as many other countries. And last week, Mr. Speaker, I, when I was in Seoul for a meeting of APEC communications ministers, one of the US Federal Communications Commissioners went out of her way to praise Australia for the fact that we're leading the way with many countries in producing quality children's drama on television, and that's something which all of us can be very proud of. The, uh, the new rules, the new standard proposed by the ABA, also provides for a simplified Australian content test, so that will provide some assistance to the broadcasters in calculating their obligations. So what we'll see, Mr Speaker, is the viewers will benefit by more Australian content, and in particular the kids will benefit by more quality Australian children's drama on television. We'll see the program makers benefit by an increase in their production slates, as well as seeing benefits for the broadcasters by the introduction of a simplified system. This, uh, this, this commitment to improving the level of Australian content on television goes side by side Mr. Speaker, with the government's assistance to the film and television industry, assistance to the Australian Film Commission, to Film Australia, assistance to, uh, to the film, television and radio school, as well as our commitment in Creative Nation to provide $60 million to uh, initiate a television production fund to, of course, and of course enhance the, the quality of Australian programming independently of these local content obligations. And in Creative Nation last year, Mr Speaker, we also made commitments for new multimedia, $45 million for the Australian Multimedia Enterprise, a commissioning of 10 CDs for the Australia on CD program. So it demonstrates quite clearly, Mr Speaker, that across the board the government is making a very firm commitment to our creative industries. Now, in contrast, in contrast, the opposition, opposition leader's speech, the headland speech last Tuesday, did make some comments on the communications and the arts portfolio. And those comments were made under the headline, The Communications Revolution. So while the government's produced Creative Nation, the Communications Future Project reports, the BSEG report, Networking Australia's Future, which in total would would, would make up documents this thick, Mr Speaker. The opposition's contribution that thick could be. The opposition's contribution is not documents that thick. It's not a series of proposals to help help us creative Australians. It's twelve paragraphs. Twelve paragraphs from the Leader of the Opposition. Is it any wonder we call it point point missing? Point missing the headland speech. And the reason why we say it's point missing is that in those twelve paragraphs the only comment the Leader of the Opposition could offer our creative industries, the, the only offer of assistance the Leader of the Opposition could put forward for our film and television makers and our artists is that he believes the communications revolution will, will be part of the Howard Costello Industrial Relations Laboratory. So all of those filmmakers and screenwriters and, and, and the performing artists and the visual artists, they're going to be inputs to your industrial relations laboratory. Well, if that's not the case, why couldn't you say anything else about our cultural industries other than it gets down to industrial relations? And it's probably no surprise, Mr Speaker, given that the spokesman on communications for the opposition has said that government assistance to the creative industries is a waste of money. It's money down the drain. And the deputy leader of the opposition has said that for the government to have a policy on the arts is a joke. So it's no wonder, Mr Speaker, that we can see that there's no difference between the views advocated by the Leader of the Opposition or the Deputy Leader of the Opposition or their spokesman on communications. They have, they have no commitment to Australia's cultural industries and no understanding of the tremendous possibilities that these industri industries can deliver Australia. The Hon. Uh, uh, leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To bring further focus to the reserve powers issue, my question is directed to the Prime Minister. And I ask, does the Prime Minister accept that his statement last night was nothing less than a complete and absolute vindication 
of Sir John Kerr, who used the reserve powers, which you have deliberately left intact, to sack Order. the most monumentally incompetent government in Australia's history, the Labor government of Gough Whitlam. You were too. Order. Minister. Order. Mr. I Speaker, my right. I ask the Prime Minister, are those who maintain the rage wrong? I ask, will the Labor Party, for a US Prime Minister, apologise to the family of Sir John Kerr Order. for making him the Prime a Minister, social I think he's trying to hear the question. up until the time of his death? Mr. Speaker, I ask the Prime Minister, do you accept? that by not codifying the reserve powers, you have condemned Labor's whole approach to the complex issues surrounding November 1975 to being completely and utterly absurd. At the end of that great century of change in Europe, the 18th century, when the French Revolution came and the great, the great revolution and the great revolution Order. In, uh, Order. and the great revolution Those in the United left. States came with the American War of Independence. Order. And, uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition knows better. And the American War of Independence, where where that uh, fight was led uh, by uh, the first American president, uh, the great soldier statesman George Washington, when the designers of that constitution sat down to. Uh, Sat down, to write the, uh, sat down to write that, write that uh, constitution, they severely constrained the powers of the American presidency and divided it between the presidency, the legislature and the Supreme Court. That is, despite the huge force of the political force running right through that century down to the last quarter of it and winning a war of independence, there was still substantial constraints on American executive presidential authority. No such similar constraints existed in the transfer of powers from the English monarchs to the British Prime Minister and after 1901 to the Australian Prime Minister and Cabinet. But part of the check always was that there would be in the hands of the monarch, in the hands of the monarch, a power to look over the operation of, of the government with this power. In our system, there was another one. That is, because our constitution was written in 1901 and not 1913, after the House of Lords, with the Asquith Lloyd George budget, defeated, defeated the, the House of Lords uh, in uh, 1911 or 1912, Mr. Speaker, defeated the, uh, defeated the. Um, if I had a jelly bean, I'd give you one. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker um, uh, no, I would, Mr. Speaker. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be mean or beastly to him at all, now, Mr. Speaker. Now, if, if, uh, Mr. Speaker, as a consequence of that, and the fact that the House of Lords dared the monarch to appoint so so many people as to render its power to refuse a budget redundant, and the King made clear that he would support the government in the House of Commons, even though it was ruling with a majority uh, um, uh, over the coalition of Irish nationalists. The fact of the matter is what happened was that the power of the House of Lords was broken. Our constitution was written in 1901, and we've ended up with a very powerful second chamber, we implemented in 1901. And we ended up with a very powerful— well, Those on my left. Don't? Order. You an answer, or don't you? Mr. Mr. Order. Mr. Speaker, we ended, up, uh, we ended up with a very powerful second chamber. So there are a number of checks in this system. The powerful second chamber, the powerful second chamber, and these reserve powers, which existed and have been in the hands of, of the vice regal figure, the Queen's deputy, the Governor General. Now, nothing about those powers or the fact that Sir John Kerr had them available to him as the incumbent meant that the powers were illegitimate. What was illegitimate was the way he used them. Was the way he used them. Sir John, what Sir John Kerr did was deceive his Prime Minister by not, by not telling him Order. by not telling him that unless he advised him of an election, 
or could guarantee supply, he would swear in someone he knew the House of Representatives did not have confidence in. That's it. That was his. That was the crime against Sir John Kerr, and uh, or letting the dispute run its course because those of us who were around in 1975 know that if the dispute had gone on a couple again. more days, the likelihood is Malcolm Fraser wouldn't even have been leader of the opposition. That is, that is that there would have been a complete, a complete cave-in in the Senate, a complete cave-in in the Senate, and of course the supply bill would have passed and the whole, the whole matter would have passed. And, and the then opposition may well have won the subsequent election 18 months later, but of course Malcolm Fraser lost that legitimacy he was always looking for, and it was permanently denied him as a consequence. It was also, Mr. Speaker, it was also denied. He was also it was all, that same legitimacy was also denied to Sir John Kerr. And Mr. Speaker, let me say I think that's been a very salutary exercise uh, in what I described last night as one of the checks on a head of state. That is someone who determines upon a course of action he or she knows to be controversial. They need to understand that the action is both warranted and capable of being defended. And if it is not warranted and capable of being defended, then they will have to wear the, appro the opprobrium of public opinion. And uh, that is beyond the other checks, which are that either house, that either house by simple majority, can command a joint sitting to either seek to remove or censure the head of state. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the model the government is putting forward, we're not in any way. There is no link in the question between the existence of the reserve powers and Sir John Kerr's use of them, which makes anybody who argued against Sir John Kerr's use argue that there's, the powers are illegitimate. No one's ever argued that. Gough Whitlam's not arguing that yesterday. He's not even arguing that yesterday. Uh, he, he, uh, he understands, I think, the power, the power which has been conferred upon uh, prime ministers and cabinets in the Westminster system, and he's understood, understood the reserve power which existed in the hands of the monarch, and in this case her deputy. But that in no way illegitimised those powers. What made it illegitimate was the fact that the power was abused, and it was it was abused uh, by a governor general uh, who refused to tell his prime minister what he had in mind. And uh, as you know, I was. I was with Gough Whitlam on the last occasion he saw uh, Sir John Kerr, the very last occasion, that afternoon, and I, let me assure you Order. there was no attempt by him, no attempt by him whatsoever to tell the then Prime Minister what he had in mind. And so he swore in Malcolm Fraser. Malcolm Fraser, Malcolm Fraser then had to wear a, a, a loss of confidence, a lack of confidence motion, a no confidence motion in the House of Representatives. And, uh, and then, Mr Speaker. Order. Uh, the Governor General refused to see the Speaker of the House of Representatives. When, when the head of state got Order. down to refusing to see the, the, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, when he got down to uh, refusing to see uh, the, uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, you knew basically, in moral terms, the game was up for him and has been up for him ever since. Before I call the member for Charlton, the member for Maranoa is making a habit of conversing across the chamber. Can I suggest he reduce his ways? Honourable <coughs> member for Charlton. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, my, <coughs> my, Mr. Speaker, my question is directed to the Prime Minister. I ask the Prime Minister in the context of the substantial and creative initiatives which his government has taken, could he inform the House of the results? Um, of, uh, consultation, of, of, of consultation with uh, and the response to uh, representatives of ordinary Australians uh, in the Australian community. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, I always find this a curious argument that the opposition puts that, uh, that uh, in a representative democracy representation is illegitimate. In a representative democracy, the Leader of the Opposition stated baldly in his headland, so-called headland speech that, that representation is illegitimate. Uh, for instance, he talked about uh, what are the groups, and he, he then said the environment and the ACTU. Well, let's, say, for instance, say that the people who seek to protect the natural environment of Australia had not made their position clear 
over the years, the picture we could paint would be the Franklin River would be submerged under a dam, there would be fewer rainforests in the wet tropics, Fraser Island would probably now have been destroyed, uh, and, uh, and, many other, and many other great areas. Order. I mean, Mr. Speaker, Those I mean, on Mr. My Speaker, I mean, the gall of these interest groups. How dare they express a view about these things? And how dare the government respond to them? You see, uh, how dare the government respond to them? Uh, or, 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 for instance, or for instance, the women's organisations. I mean, I mean, equal pay for equal work, childcare, uh, the maternity allowance, uh, the current Commonwealth focus and policy attentions to violence in the community, and the protection the protection of women against violence. I mean, these are issues which have arisen because of views put by women's organisations around this country. And, uh, I mean, are, are, they, are they an interest group, a rabid interest group, with uh, unreasonable access to the government, groups representing half the population? Shocking. 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 Then we've got the ACTU. I mean, they, they have—this uh, is where, of course, most of the Leader of the Opposition bile has been reserved, not only now but over the years. But haven't we all benefited from the industrial peace, the wage restraint, the job growth and the industrial relations reforms that have occurred over those 12 years? Before the accord, Mr Speaker, under the Fraser Howard work government, working days lost per thousand workers from industrial disputes averaged 590. Since the accord, this number has fallen by 70 per cent. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the Minister for Employment, uh, Education and Training made a point earlier about the, the, the huge multiples of employment growth which have come from these policies compared to, a co to coalition's times. And, and, so for, and so for meeting the government and speaking with the government and joining the government productively over 12 years to have a better industrial relations scene, higher levels of productivity, lower levels of inflation, higher levels of employment growth, it seemed to be on the, on the part of the opposition leader unseemly, an undue, an undue right from another so-called rabid interest group, uh, or the fact that Mr. Speaker, we've got inflation between 2 and 3 per cent when it was at over 10 under him. Or let's say, take some others. ACOS, the Australian Council of Social Services, the Salvation Army, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, the St Vincent de Paul, all these welfare agencies who have shown uh, interest in the plight of, uh, of people uh, in uh, desperate positions, either homeless or, or uh, needing, needing family support. Uh, they come out explicitly supporting all of the ones I mentioned, the Job Compact, to get long-term unemployed people back to work. The job compact described by the OECD a week ago as an, in an innovative, equitable and economically efficient labour market reform. I mean, what a, what a goal. Are they the rabid interest groups the Leader of the Opposition is referring to? Are they not entitled to put a view about, about their constituency as they see it? Or, for instance, what about the National Farmers Federation? I mean, what a shocking hide they had to come to the government and talk about income support for people in, in uh, drought-affected areas. Uh, and, uh, and the government, the government going out listening to them, Order. understanding the problem and removing, and removing the farm assets test for the, support of, uh, for the support of income, which has now gone to 10,000 farm families, or the rural adjustment scheme, which is going to help farms aggregate and allow some people to get off their properties to see we've got more economic units. Or, the, or, or drought proofing farms in the future by measures which will support water uh, and fodder storage. I mean, are these rabid interest groups? Mr. Speaker, it's only someone who has such an elitist view of the world who wants to govern by press release, which was way it, the way it was in the 70s, the way it was under the uh, Fraser Howard regime, where neither business nor labour were consulted where the welfare agencies and the voluntary agencies were regarded as, as so irrelevant uh, that uh, they went on to, uh, they went on to uh, behave in this way. So, Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker when, uh, when you see the Leader of the Opposition come out with this speech, this headland speech, this collection of junk, this collation of rubbish, 
and uh, and and try and put it across order, and try order. and put it across as policy and try and put it across as policy and then attack people as rabid interest groups for having the temerity to participate in our representative democracy. I say, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition is a long way off the mark of the of the uh, thought process of this community and what they require from a representative parliamentary system. Honourable yeah. yeah. Member Mayo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I direct my question to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister will be aware that before 1949 there were five occasions on which a government had a majority of more than two-thirds of the combined Houses of Parliament by virtue of the then voting system. Order. The Prime Minister will also be aware that the Electoral Act can be changed by a simple majority of both Houses of Parliament. What assurance is there in the Prime Minister's Republican proposals that changes to the Electoral Act by a government controlling both houses would not produce the appointment of a president, which would be a blatantly political appointment. The Honourable Prime Minister. I mean, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I mean, let, let's just leave the proposals of last night to one side. And at any stage, at any stage, a government can propose a change to the Senate's voting system. At any stage. So what's, uh, what's the reference to the uh, Republic, uh, for God's sake? Uh, well, well, no, no, order, order. Well, 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 order the, well Member Mr. Mayor, you've Mr. asked your question. Mr Speaker, even if senators were elected at large, say they were elected from constituencies, say they were elected from constituencies, you, you would have a House roughly half the size of the House of Representatives. That's what the Constitution says, doesn't it? That's right. So therefore, so therefore, so therefore, so therefore, uh, so therefore two, thirds, two thirds of the whole, that is, of the House of Representatives and the Senate, is, as far as I understand it, two thirds. And, and uh, therefore, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, maybe I've missed it, but what is the point? If, if the point, but let me make, let me make another point, Mr. Speaker. But let me, let me, let me nail, let me bang the nail right into the wall with this point. Apparent, apparently, in, in, in the implication of the question, he said, the question says on five occasions before 1949, governments could have secured a two-thirds majority. My view is, and somebody said Malcolm Fraser was one seat away securing it in 1975. If community opinion is such that they have entrusted the parliamentary process to one political force commanding a two-thirds majority, that force is entitled to say. Who, uh, who should be, who should be the Order. nominee? Order. Uh, who should be the head of state? And, uh, uh, but, 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 uh, but, but, but the likelihood is, well, why would it? Well, why wouldn't it? Well, why would it not be? If community opinion, if community opinion in the country was so strong for one political force or another, why should a minority with less than a third of that jo joint sitting, with less than a third of that joint sitting? Have the final say then about who should be the head of state. So I mean, I mean, I, I would have thought, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I would have thought that uh, that most of the people in this house believe that when you get the 50% plus one in a democracy, you have some rights. At 50% plus one, you've got you've got some substantial majority support. We're saying more than that. We're saying two thirds. Two thirds of the joint sitting of both houses, and, in a, and, and apparently they're arguing over here, Mr. Speaker, that uh, that apparently they're arguing if uh, if the co if the co if the coalition have had a, would have had two thirds of a majority in both houses in 1975, it would have been dreadful for them to nominate and elect the head of state and elect the head of state and elect the head of state. That would have been a dreadful thing. Well, I mean, I'm surprised they have so so little pride in themselves that they should that they should argue that, or, Mr. Speaker, that they should be so ridiculous as to argue that, so ridiculous and so puerile as to argue that. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there's only one answer we want to know in this house. There's only one question. In the end, whether the leader of the opposition believes. An Australian should be our head of state. That's the key question. That's the central question. Let's get, Mr. Speaker. 
Let's get that right. The rest will fall into place. Goodwill will put the rest into place. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Capricorn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. In view of the budget and your recent meeting with state training ministers, would the minister advise the House of Developments and opportunities for young Australians to gain skills which will assist our industries to be competitive in the global uh, marketplace? Honourable Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for Capricornia for her question. The uh, budget underlined the Commonwealth's commitment to expanding vocational education and training with confirmation of growth funding of $70 million for the Australian National Training Authority in 1996 and a further $70 million for 1997. These funds will go to the states and territories, contingent of course, on the maintenance of their own effort as required by the Andrew Arrangements. As members might expect, ministers from the states and territories were very happy with this uh, when we met recently as the Anti-Ministerial Council. The additional funding for 1996 brings the Commonwealth's total recurrent funding for vocational education and training through ANTA to $640 million. From the beginning of first term 1996, 300,000 students will have a, a place in TAFE. That's 300,000 over and above what the states provide due to the policies of this government. The Commonwealth's total annual increase for 1996 under the ANTA agreement is $380 million and it raises the Commonwealth's share of total recurrent funding for vocational education and training from 7 per cent in 1991 to an estimated 27 per cent in 1996. Since the uh, Prime Minister announced the establishment of ANTA back in 1992, the Commonwealth's funding for growth alone in the period 1993-1997 will amount to more than $1.5 billion. Mr Speaker, when this government came to office, only one in three young people finished school. We had a TAFE system which was in total disrepair and we had a higher education system which was reserved for the privileged few. In recent weeks, uh, members opposite have discovered battlers. But, Mr Speaker, if we ever had a class of real battlers, it was those young Australians who wanted an education when the coalition was in government. Back then, uh, young people were denied the education and training opportunities that might have given them a fair go. And like others, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I, perused the, uh, I perused the Cape Barren scrolls to see what young people in the future might expect under a coalition administration. And I've got to tell you that the, uh, the pickings are pretty slim, Mr. Speaker. There's only one reference, one reference of any substance to education in the Cape Barren speech. And, uh, and that was to what Bob Menzies had to say about his achievements in higher education at his farewell press conference back in 1996. Apart from that, you won't find in 1966, 30 years ago. Apart from, apart from that, Mr. Speaker, you won't find a mention of education in the Cape Barron speech. It's, uh, it's quite clear that the Leader of the Opposition these days has as little interest in education now as he had back in 1989 when he refused the post of Opposition Spokesman for Education because he considered it beneath him. Because he considered it beneath him. Things haven't changed. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, since the government came to office, Australia has witnessed school retention rates reaching three and four. Last year, an additional 90,000 young Australians completed Year 12 due to the policies of this government. And thanks to Commonwealth funding through ANTA, these young people now have a much greater choice beyond school. They have access to training in the skills that industry wants for the workforce of the future. The government recognises that Australia's future lies with its educated and its skilled people. This government has recognised the need to provide access to education and particularly the urgent need to upgrade vocational education and training. Yeah. Honourable Member for Barker. Mr. Speaker, my question is uh, to the Minister of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. I refer to the Minister's decision to ban the Hindmarsh Island Bridge on the basis of women's business. Minister, is Dorothy Wilson telling the truth when she says that women's business in relation to Hindmarsh Island was fabricated with the help of a white lawyer? Are uh, Dulcie Wilson or Bertha Gollan and the other women telling the truth when they support the story of the falsification of women's business? 
Is the letter from the 89-year-old matriarch Laura Cartanieri denying the existence of women's business true? Was her retraction a little later of that letter denying women's business done on her own volition? Why did Doug, Doug Miller say on TV on June the 6th and yet, yet again yesterday, the last thing he said on that radio interview, I think the whole issue of the women's beliefs was fabricated? Why did Sarah Miller say on the 7th of June that the secret women's business was fa fabricated? And why did you wait so long to announce an inquiry which you seem to have done some hours after the Premier of South Australia wrote to you this morning by fax telling you that he had to decide, decided to call his own inquiry that with Royal Commission powers into this appalling situation. The Honourable Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. Mr Speaker, uh, we have a question from the acknowledged cream of the South Australian Liberal establishment, and we know full well uh, the member why he's called the member for O'Connor is not required to comment. <laughs> Mr. You Mr. Speaker, are not required to comment. Mr Speaker, the, the member asks a number of questions and I'll endeavour to answer briefly. As, well, I, well Mr Speaker, I'll endeavour to answer the question as best I can, but some things need to be put on the record. The first uh, thing that ought to be said uh, is that the uh, Premier of South Australia and indeed the Liberal and National parties in this parliament would never dare to treat the spiritual beliefs of non-Indigenous Australians the way that they are treating the spiritual beliefs of Aboriginal people. I think it needs to be understood. I think it needs to be understood, Mr. Speaker, what a horrendous consequence it is for Australian values for a Premier of a state to commission a royal commission with all the draconian powers that that implies into the spiritual beliefs of a number of Australians. And I pose the question, I pose the question uh, to other religious faiths and beliefs in this country uh, how they would feel if a state Premier were to commission a royal commission. Uh, indeed uh, into their spiritual beliefs. This is a very serious matter and goes far beyond an issue involving my portfolio. And I'm sure that a number of people in the government will be saying some things about this in weeks to come. But of course what we're seeing here is a wave of political, uh, politically inspired royal commissions emanating from the Indian Ocean and sweeping eastward across the country. So I suppose we shouldn't be, be surprised. But I have to say, Mr Speaker, that this is a very serious matter, and I am not, in the course of my remarks, uh, going to comment uh, more about that Royal Commission, except to say this, that the Royal Commission, uh, I think, poses great threats uh, to the proper uh, management and administration of government in South Australia. It is very much an abusive process of the executive government in South Australia, and indeed the Prime Minister uh, will be writing, if he has not done so already, to the Premier of South Australia, asking him to think again uh, in respect of this Royal Commission and to cooperate uh, with the, uh, the inquiry I have announced today uh, under proper processes through the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act to be conducted by Her Honour, Jane, uh, Honour Justice Jane Matthews. President of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and the Deputy President of the National Native Title Tribunal. Now, the first point to make about the inquiry that I have announced today is that uh, arrangements for the conduct of this inquiry were put in place prior, prior uh, to the announcement by Premier Brown of a Royal Commission. And it ought to be, it ought to be understood. It ought to be understood. It ought to be, it ought to be, it ought to be understood, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the Those basis on my left, the member for Fisher. It ought to be understood, Mr. Speaker, the basis on which the South Australia, the South Australian Premier, Mr. Brown, and the South Australian Cabinet has purported to call this royal commission. In fact, uh, the Premier wrote to the Prime Minister uh, yesterday about this issue. He gave the Prime Minister of Australia an ultimatum to respond within 48 hours. And the fact of the matter is that that ultimatum, um, that ultimatum uh, was presented to the Prime Minister at 1.45 p.m. Eastern Time yesterday. Now, I spoke with the South Australian Premier this morning <coughs> after the Premier had announced the government's decision in South Australia to establish an inquiry uh, with the powers of a Royal Commission. 
Now, he confirmed to me that the South Australian government's decision in this matter was taken despite the fact that no response had been received from uh, the Prime Minister to the ultimatum. He indicated that he acted on the basis of one unconfirmed uh, media report. And indeed, after discussions with the Prime Minister's office, I can indicate that no such indication, uh, no such statement was made on behalf of the Prime Minister to any media outlet. Now, on the basis of that, the South Australian government is throwing around money uh, like a drunken sailor, issuing, issuing a royal commission with, a, with, the powers, with the powers to compel an Australian Order. to come Order. forward and give evidence about their religious beliefs, an unprecedented abuse of government power. But, Mr Speaker, I want to turn finally to answer the last part Order. of the question that was Those raised by the member for Barker. The member for Barker is trying to hear the And throughout all of this, the fingers of the Liberal Party at the state and federal level are all over this issue. We saw the member for Barker and indeed the member for Mayo come into the parliament uh, yesterday and, and indeed wave this around as if it was some kind of holy writ. The great lie of Hindmarsh Island. The minister will now put and, that in, away. and in fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the two key people who are uh, referred to in the basis of the allegations by the member for Barker are in fact Doug and Sarah Malera. And I'm going to table two transcripts, Mr. Speaker of what these two people said on the public record. I'm turning briefly just to two references to what they said. Mr Doug Malera, uh, who was put forward uh, by the Liberal Party as the, uh, the person who says that there's been a fabrication, yesterday spoke to Keith Conlon on Radio 3AW. And, he's, he's, and Malera, Doug Malera said, quote, yeah, I was a tool in helping it get it, get it uh, uh, brought out into the open now. Well, Conlon says, that's different, isn't it? Uh, if you've got to help bring it out in the open, that's different from fabricating it. Malera, no, I don't believe it was a fabrication. That's the basis of the, that's the, basis of the story. You can all read the rest because I've tabled the document. I've ta no, that's, that's why I've tabled it, because you don't want to think that because something's in the Adelaide Advertiser, it is true. Second, the, second, the second and final part of the transcript I wish to refer to Order. Is, Order. Is, is an interview, interview with Murray Nicholl by Sarah Malera. And the, the interviewer, Murray Nicholl, asks Sarah Malera the following. Let's look at the claim that he makes, i.e. her estranged husband, Doug, that he invented the story. Sarah Malera, yeah. Nicholl, can we have a look at that? Sarah Malera, yep. And, and is that claim accurate? Sarah Malera, no. Well, now, on the front page of the advertiser, says Murray Nicholl this morning, you were quoted as agreeing with what he said. Sarah Malera quoted. Nicholl, sorry. Sarah Malera, I wasn't the writer of it, so I don't say it because I didn't write it. If I wrote it, it would be different. Nicholl, yeah, that, that's OK. I mean, that's why I'm asking. Your name was put up in certain comments in the newspaper this morning on the front page. Answer, well, anyone can do that. Now, Mr Speaker, I conclude my answer uh, in this way. Throughout all of this issue, Order. I have endeavoured, endeavoured at all times to act on the basis of legal advice and be fair to all concerned. And let me say on behalf of all those on the government side of this parliament, uh, we reject absolutely some draconian royal commission into the spiritual beliefs of any Australian. The Honourable Honourable Member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Housing and Regional Development. To celebrate uh, World Environment Day, the Minister launched a major report on how we can make our cities and towns greener places to live in. Can the Minister inform the House why it is so important that uh, we focus on an urban environment agenda in Australia and how this report will contribute to action? The Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister. Order, order. Those on my left, the Deputy Prime Minister has uh, to call. Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the Honourable Member for Dunkley for his question. Uh, few members uh, of this Parliament uh, have a greater commitment uh, to the environment, both globally and locally, than the Member for Dunkley. And he has uh, considerable respect for his efforts. Order, order. Uh, firstly, uh, thank uh, the uh, member for his question because it enables me to uh, mention uh, Green Cities, a report uh, of the Urban and Regional Development Review 
which opens up a range of issues concerning the environment and makes a number of proposals in terms of policy. And I think it's an important report and a report that uh, all members of the parliament uh, would benefit from reading. It's one that the government takes seriously and already uh, both in terms of greenhouse and coastal management the government has taken significant initiatives to pursue issues that uh, touch on the environment of cities. For most people, the issues that are of greatest importance in terms of the environment are those that are closest to them. And so issues of uh, air and water, issues of uh, the quality of the local environment and so on are very, very important uh, issues. But I think also uh, the honourable member for Dunkley draws attention uh, to uh, the methodical way the government goes about developing policy, exposing that policy, and encouraging debate within the community. And I think over time that's meant that the government has been able to produce the kind of significant reforms that the prime minister referred to earlier. But I think it also gives us the opportunity. Uh, to uh, draw attention to the opposition in terms of the absence of statements of policy, not necessarily statements of policy in books, but statements that are clearly set out opposition policy in terms of the environment, and therefore to leave a vacuum that is picked up uh, by members of the opposition who exploit that vacuum to put forward ideas in the name of the opposition that no one in this parliament would take seriously. I refer to the honourable member for Ringa, because only uh, a few days ago in the Australian we have put forward by him, presumably on behalf of the opposition, quite substantial thoughts. He contemplates the sale of telecom, and so the honourable member for Ringa says, "Well, we can start to use the proceeds. We can create," he says, "an environmental army, and we can have that environmental army led by uh, a general, by a commander." by um, a corps commander of high profile. He says, uh, well, it could be uh, the former governor of New South Wales. I guess that appeals to him as someone uh, of a monarchist. Or it could be Dick Smith, or it could be more or less anyone. And then he says, uh, we can use these resources from the sale of telecom to develop a project uh, that would be environmentally relevant. And so he develops an idea we don't know how many environmental projects can be completed with relatively unskilled labour, but chronic problems such as lack of tree cover, weed infestation, feral animals could be solved by enough people with shovels, mattocks, seeds, fencing material, passion bags, whatever. So the honourable member for Warringga steps into this policy vacuum, dreams up an idea worth some billion dollars, suggests that we get a corps commander to organise it and basically has people, the unemployed all around Australia, chasing cats down drains <laughs> to, in, in, the, in the name of some kind of commitment to the environment. Now, frankly, in terms of World Environment Day and in terms of Her Majesty's opposition, we demand something better. But we've been demanding something better for years, and I think the fact that they don't have credibility out there in the community with the voters is not some technical legal issue, but it's essentially because, in terms of policy, they simply don't deliver. The Honourable Member for High Marsh. Order. My Order. My question without notice is to the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Affairs. Minister, through your incompetence, the administration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage has been severely undermined, perhaps irreparably. Entitler put a question, and having thrown the pass at Aboriginal policy for so long, I mean the imputation is uh, most objectionable. What? The the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, um, on the point of order, Mr. Speaker, I mean uh, the uh, the purport of that point of order, and if, if it's upheld by you, is that it becomes impossible for uh, any questioner of a minister to include in that in, in that um, 
uh, question any material which is critical of the minister. Now, if you no. uphold that, no. it'll go beyond anything which has ever been remotely no, no. interpreted order. as part order. of our standing order. orders. No, no. Look, I think. I think the Leader of the Opposition knows that in, in terms of the way in which I have allowed questions to be put in this place, there has been an opportunity for material, whether it be critical or complementary, of people to be put. Uh, I'd ask the member for Home Marsh to start a question again, uh, and uh, I'll listen carefully to it, but uh, I'm sure the minister is prepared to respond. Minister, through your incompetence, the administration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage has been severely undermined, perhaps irreparably. The Narrangiri people have been set one against another. Through all of the High Marsh Island saga, you have avoided the truth. Isn't it true, right. Isn't it true question... Minister, that through the High Marsh Island saga, you have avoided the truth, abused others in a cowardly way, and have now been forced to call an inquiry? Nah, look, look, I, th I think. I think the, the broad nature of your question, I think, needs to be addressed, but to, to specifically level some charges at the minister in that respect, I think, needs to have some fairly careful wording. Now, if you, if you, want, to, uh, if you want to take that further, I offer you the same opportunity under the standing orders, but otherwise I'd, I'd ask you just to simply look at the question's content and to reword it. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move the motion of censure against the Minister for Aboriginal yeah, yeah, yeah. and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The... You can't even get an answer. It's day of seven. Oh, you're overruling Beasley's given leave. Well, leave is given leave. Point of order. Uh, uh, hang on. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to clarify. Speaker. I'll clarify. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, the, le the Leader of the House gave leave if Callis Gallus wants to move this uh, against oh, Order. Uh, he's entitled. Order. Uh, to order, withdraw the Prime, that. The Prime Minister will help the House if you withdraw that uh, comment about the member. She sold the pass on the yeah. Aboriginal order. people on order. every occasion. On every occasion. Thank you. The Leader of the House, we've clarified it, the Leader of the House has said OK and, will, and, and that the government will take it. The Honourable Member for Hindmarsh will be heard under the standing orders. I move that this House. I move that this House censures the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander yeah, Affairs yeah. for his failure to properly administer the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1984 in a fair and just way and through his incompetence, public confidence in administration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage has oh, been severely signed. undermined. Oh, yes. Order. Oh, signed. Order. Signed forms? The Leader of the Opposition, oh, Deputy oh, Leader of the Opposition, oh, is not oh, helping oh, his colleague at the dispatch box. The Prime Minister is interjecting in the most vicious way. Minister, the full May. today you issued a press release which... <laughs> Mr Speaker, today the minister at the table, the Minister for Aboriginal Torres Strait Island Affairs, who is sitting there like a grinning monkey, <laughs> finding all funny. this highly amusing, if you take the order. minister who order. obviously, Mr Speaker, I warn fails... Them. I warn the member for prospect. Name her. Order. The minister who obviously finds Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage such a joke that he has to sit there and grin and laugh at this. Order. Order. Those today, are my right. Today, this minister issued a statement that he will call an inquiry. Can we look at the context in which this inquiry has been called? It has been called after the South Australian government called their inquiry. We now, Mr Speaker, have the ludicrous situation that we have two inquiries into the High Marsh Island Bridge, one from the South Australian government and one instituted by this minister. Mr Speaker, I ask you what it says about this minister's competence that over a year after the original declaration, there are now currently two inquiries mooted into the whole Hindmarsh Island saga. I would, Mr Speaker, the uh, minister was given an opportunity yesterday by Premier Dean Brown to join in and contribute to the South Australian inquiry. He obviously was not prepared to do that. He sent you a letter. Order. This the minister will have his chance. There the was a letter sent to the minister, 
And I stand corrected if indeed he did not receive it yesterday but received it earlier today, inviting him to join in the South Australian inquiry. The minister instead has decided to call his own inquiry. He has, he has agreed that there is a need for inquiry. So there are two things here. The first of all, the South Australian inquiry, and now the minister who refused to take part in that has now agreed that there is a need to be an inquiry. And shall we have a look, Minister, exactly why there needs to be an inquiry and why this censure motion, Minister, has been brought against you and the way you have administered the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act? Mr Speaker, the reason why this minister at the table, the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, has administered this act and brought Aboriginal heritage into disrepute all over the country. And, Mr Speaker, I must just say that that has been one of the worst things that has come out of that, this whole issue, that wherever you go now in Australia, people know about the saga of Hindmarsh Island. And when they talk about it, they say things about Aboriginal heritage. It was all made up, wasn't it? Tell us about it. Now, this is what has happened. The minister at the table, Mr Speaker, has accused me of saying it was all made up. I would uh, remind the minister at the table, Mr Speaker, that I have said all along I did not know what the truth of this issue was. I have never said anything else, and I have sought from the minister a commitment from this minister for the truth. But the one thing that this minister has been frightened of has been the truth from the very beginning. First of all, if we can start at the beginning of the saga, the minister re refused to consider representations from Aboriginal men who disagreed with the business of the um, women's business of Alan Campbell. If this is not to say the will have his whether these representations shortly. were true or not, Mr. Speaker, but these people had a right to be heard, and this is what is essential to this. All people have the right to be heard. The minister at the table had that obligation to these Aboriginal people. He did not see, hear them. He refused to hear them. He was asked by the litigants in the case, the Chapmans, who, washed, who wished to build the marina, six times if he would see them and discuss it. He knew he would but bankrupt them by stopping the bridge, and he knew other marina and residential developments would have been scrapped and that the value of their blocks would have been gone down that $175 million were at stake, and he refused Mr. Speaker, to see that. The point of order is this, that this matter is currently the subject of an appeal before the full court of the Federal no, 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 Court of no, no, Australia. No, no, just a minute. No, no. Uh, Minister. Well, and, and Mr Speaker, while uh, the robust nature of parliamentary debate in Australian public life mm. uh, means that there's obviously uh, scope for discussion of some matters. The issues that the honourable member is now canvassing are matters directly, I believe, within the domain of consideration of the full bench of the Federal Court of Australia. Look, um, I, no, I, yeah, uh, I, I believe there is. I have pertinent information to do with that. To further, deal to the point further to the point of order. Yeah, to further to the point of order. Further to sure. the point of order, Mr. Speaker, it is my understanding that the appeal before the court is on a narrow matter of law, on the description of the Hindmarsh Island area and um, on the nature of the business before the declaration, and that is solely mm. the matter of appeal and does not well, canvass this information. Look, uh, can, I, can I just say to both the minister and, and the member for Hindmarsh, who I, I think are very genuine in, their re in response to this issue, that uh, the question of, of the subjudice principle here is one which I'm very acutely conscious of, and, of, and given that uh, this is a matter that's been put forward, I think, three times this week for consideration as an MPI, I've uh, had a look at some of the issues contained here. Um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to rule on in the parliament. There is a, a lot of information that's out there in the general public about the issue. Uh, the minister has indicated in question time today that there's a, a, an inquiry that he's established. I understand again that there's an inquiry that the South Australian government is intending to, to put in place or has put in place. And to that extent, uh, it's very difficult for me to therefore say what is or isn't subjudice under uh, those various inquiries. Now, I just say to members they want to, in their contributions, provided of course they are mindful of that. 
uh, then they should be careful in what they say so that perhaps some new information which could possibly prejudice uh, the, the court case is not introduced in this place. But as I say, there's so much that's been written on this out there, uh, I suspect that uh, this debate can continue in the way it has. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Very briefly, Mr Speaker, on the Saunders report, which uh, the minister cons was uh, considered, there were con things that Professor Saunders raised herself, the fact that she did not have an anthropologist present, an independent anthropologist. She raised that in her own report, that she had limited time, that she had only spoken briefly to two women and only had the information for one woman, from one woman. The minister knew that. And uh, aware of that, he did not read the 400 representations that were sent to him. And I think we have probably established that, that he did not have time to, that we have gone through the timeline. The Justice O'Loughlin found that the minister did not consider them. The minister keeps, uh, Mr Speaker, referring to um, the judgment of Dr. Uh, by Justice O'Loughlin and saying that he was vindicated. And may I just repeat that. Uh, what the, uh, Justice O'Loughlin said, the minister did not give any consideration to representations at all, and the consequence of these findings is the conclusion that there has been a fundamental failure by the minister to comply with the statutory obligation that he consider the representations before deciding whether to exercise his power. Now that is clear, and yet this minister keeps saying Justice O'Loughlin has vindic vindicated him. So, um, so much for that. He did not. So he did not look at the representations. He did not. He did not consider them. Justice O'Loughlin then overturned your declaration, and that seems to be something we have forgotten. He overturned your declaration, and this is not the first time, is it? The minister at the table has had three declarations overturned. Well, one declaration overturned, and one where he failed to make a declaration. When the, Premier of South Australia, when the Premier of Western Australia didn't want him to, he did not make a declaration in favour of Aboriginal people, and the law overturned that, and the federal court said he had to. We still have the Broome Crocodile, Broome Crocodile case under review, in which the minister's declaration was again overturned. So here is a minister who has three declarations overturned. What does that say about the minister's competence? in administering the Aboriginal Heritage Act. We have Justice O'Loughlin saying in the Hindmarsh Island case he did not read the representations. Post Justice O'Loughlin's decision, amounts of information have come up via the media which this minister has chosen to ignore. At any time, he had the option to say enough is enough. It is time that we got this out of the press, we stopped the harm to Aboriginal heritage, to Aboriginal people, and get this out of the press into a judicial inquiry. But did the minister do that? First of all, we had an elderly lady, Laura Cartanini. She was the supposedly oldest Naranjiri woman and the responsible for the secrets. The minister never sought her evidence. And in fact, when a letter came claiming that Nana Narajiri did not know anything of the secret women's business, it was ignored. It was later accused that this letter was not written by the person claimed, but was a hoax or a fake by somebody else, in fact, uh, Alan Campbell. But did the minister do anything at that stage to settle this question? No. He did nothing. He left it open. Did Nana Cataneri write that letter? Did Alan Campbell forge it? We don't know. The fact that these questions remain unanswered starts to cast this big question over the whole of the Aboriginal heritage issue and puts Aboriginal people against Aboriginal people. You can't deny that. You Secondly, you we have three Naranjiri women go on television. The first of these, the spokesperson, Dorothy Wilson. Dorothy Wilson says she was at the hut, the meeting, where a white lawyer put forward the women's business and she said it was fabricated at that time. Now, what a blow is this to Aboriginal heritage that somebody would say that? Is Dorothy Wilson telling the truth? I don't know. 
but neither does Mr Tickner know. If she is not, then she should be stopped from saying these things because they are harming Narajiri women. But if she is, then her accusations have to be investigated because they are casting aspersions on the whole of Aboriginal heritage around Australia. What does the minister do? Absolutely nothing. He doesn't investigate it. He washes his hand of it. Like Pontius Pilate, it's got nothing to do with me. Let the Naranjiri women tear themselves to pieces. That's all this minister does. He has allowed these women to be branded as outcasts and liars. These women who came forward, the minister has said nothing to defend them. He hasn't listened to them, and he's allowed these Aboriginal women to go unheard by the official channels. That is how much respect this minister at the table has for Aboriginal people. Order, order, order. The member for this Hyman has now the been in the papers so for, well, for over a year Not at this stage. <laughs> we have had the women that um, the, the minister clear. has ignored. We then have questions about the anthropological evidence. We now have a public fight about whether the anthropologist who appeared for the Aboriginal legal, legal movement in South Australia was well enough qualified to give evidence, what was her role as she supported the women, and indeed then we had the leading South Australian anthropologist, the head of the South Australia's Museum of Anthropology, Philip Jones, saying that the whole thing was not true, that from his experience it just did not exist. He debunked the whole thing. Now, at that stage, I would have thought, if nothing else, the minister, you would have said, look, enough is enough. Aboriginal heritage has suffered. I, as a minister, have, had, have a responsibility to look after Aboriginal heritage and make sure that these accusations do not go on time after time after time. But this minister ignored that too. No reference to it. It has circulated right round Australia. So Hindmarsh Island is now infamous in the whole of Australia, and people all over Australia are now casting doubt on Aboriginal heritage in their own areas. Legitimate Aboriginal heritage is being questioned on the basis of what happened in Hindmarsh Island, what this minister, the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, could have stopped so much earlier on. We then have Douglas Miller, who went on radio, and I must, I think, get the quotes because the minister, who has not been entirely honest in his quotes, quoted today from what um, Mr Milliner had said in his interview. But he stopped short, didn't you, minister? Didn't the minister? I will table them, but first of all, let me read them. The um, transcript of the Channel 10 News on June the 6th, 1995, Doug Miller said, and I quote, I think the whole issue of the women's beliefs was fabricated. The minister did not quote that. He chose to quote from a 5AN interview the following morning. Now, I would put to you that if this minister was doing his duty, he would properly finish the quote. But he stopped early on in his quote. And I will read, Mr Speaker, to this House the, the final end to the interview that the minister read out. And the final end goes, Douglas Miller, that women's business is all fabricated. Codlin, the women made it up? Miller, yes. That was the end of the interview the minister read out in read question out? time. He admitted that. You are dishonest. Order. You didn't read that. Order. You can tolerate someone who tries, but so not someone who Those are my left. What a fraud. Deception keep, by omission. Keep your outrage under control. It's we then have speaking. member for Hindmarsh. We then have Douglas Milliner's wife, Sarah Milliner, one of the key people in this issue. And yesterday morning, Sarah Milliner was quoted 
in the advertiser that it, she was quoted in the advertiser that it was all fabricated. It was an extensive interview. It covered one whole page almost and over the page of the advertiser. It was written by Colin James, who already has a Walkley Award. Now, the minister has said this wasn't true. Sarah Milliner later went on the radio, and indeed, it was a very confused report that she gave on the radio. I would be, if I was asking, if I was the minister, saying, "What in the world is going on with this Aboriginal community well, that the poor women are being subject, saying one thing the other day, one day, retracting it halfway the next? Isn't it time that this got out of a media circus and I, as minister, protected Aboriginal people?" But that's not what the minister has done until forced into it by the South Australian government. From the very beginning, the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Affairs has played this game as a political one. He has used it to vilify me in Aboriginal communities and for direct political game. He has suggested to Aboriginal communities that it is I who have denigrated Aboriginal beliefs, and yet he has not produced to those communities one statement to suggest exactly what I have said or in any way to show this. The only person who, has, who should be attacked in this for his failure to protect Aboriginal people, it is the minister. Yeah. The minister has, there have been serious charges in this case. The minister has avoided them, ignored them, and he has wiped his hands of them. And because of the minister's actions in this, Aboriginal heritage in Australia is now in disrepute. The Narajiri women are separated. They are fighting amongst themselves. And the only person who can take responsibility of this is the man who failed to find out the truth, the man who failed to call an inquiry earlier, the man who should resign, the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Yeah. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? The Honourable Member for Barker. Speaker, and reserve my right to reply. The Honourable Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. Well, your <laughs> I might actually do that one day, start another speech later. Mr Speaker, uh, having been furiously thrashed uh, with a feather by the member for Hindmarsh, I must say uh, uh, many of my, uh, my remarks uh, will not only respond to what the Honourable Member for Hindmarsh has said, but indeed canvas other matters of criticism that the opposition have levelled at me over recent days. Might I say that much of what we are discussing in this motion have already been uh, canvassed uh, in, uh, in debate uh, recently in this House. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the first point that I would like to make is that my obligations as the Federal Minister are to administer a piece of legislation that is uh, passed by the Parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia and the responsibilities that I have under that legislation are indeed onerous. Uh, they uh, require me uh, to act impartially. They require me to act uh, prudently. They require me, in the case of uh, a, uh, an application for a Section 10 declaration to protect Aboriginal heritage, to commission an independent report. And in fact, my track record shows that in choosing the uh, independent reporters under the legislation that the people I choose are very much arm's length from me. They've included the former Liberal uh, Minister Fred Cheney, former Supreme Court Judge Hal Wooten and of course Professor Saunders herself. I should also say that not only is it my responsibility to uh, weigh up uh, what are sometimes competing interests in the administration of this heritage legislation, but it's also uh, my responsibility uh, to protect Aboriginal heritage. And indeed, the case of Brotho and Tickner in the federal court uh, placed very strong obligations on me as the federal minister uh, to protect that heritage. Uh, my role under that legislation has been consistently to try and find common ground wherever that can be found between uh, Aboriginal people and some uh, developers who might be proponents of a particular development. And indeed, the track record shows that in relation to the Broome Crocodile Farm, I attempted to achieve a mediation there. It wasn't possible because of the West Australian government and their intransigence on this issue. In the case of the 
the protection of the Todd River and the issue of a declaration there to pre prevent the construction of a dam. Uh, I had attempted tr to try and secure agreement between the Northern Territory Government and Aboriginal people, and of course that came to a rather bitter end with the now legendary Max Ortman uh, in the bed of the Todd River. But I say these things, Mr Speaker, because my administration of the Act is under criticism in the motion, this very political uh, motion, lacking in substance, but, but moved by the opposition. So it is important, I think, that I make some threshold remarks about the general administration of the Act. Can I also say, as I've said many times before, that the federal legislation is legislation that is only effectively used as a last resort. That is, when state or territory legislation is inadequate or is inadequately applied. Can I turn now to the question of the Hindmarsh Island Bridge and the application that was made to me for heritage protection? Because in this case, as with all other cases, I uh, chose someone to commission a report who was totally at arm's length from me. And Professor Cheryl Saunders is, of course, an eminent Australian academic. Uh, the professor has been regrettably subject to, uh, I think, very unfair uh, and very damaging criticism uh, by the Leader of the Opposition and, indeed, uh, by other uh, members in this House, uh, Mr Aldred. And uh, I think, uh, as the Federal Court said uh, in its judgment in relation to the uh, case uh, in relation to Hindmarsh Island, that she is a person uh, of very great integrity indeed and the government rejects absolutely the slurs that have been made on her. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm not going to canvass the detail of matters that is uh, currently before the federal court. I mean, call me you know, a conservative lawyer if you like, but I st still have some regard for uh, the, the uh, judicial process, and I don't intend, I don't intend to uh, go into a whole range of issues that are in fact before the court. But let me make it clear that the attacks that have been made on me uh, in the course of the last two weeks have all been issues which have been the subject of a, ju a judicial inquiry. I'll repeat that. The attacks on me in relation to the, my administration of the Act concerning Hindmarsh Island have all been the subject of judicial consideration almost without exception. And let me tell you the kinds of issues that have been raised in the media and trotted out by uh, the Shadow Minister and the member for Barker, the member for Mayo and indeed the Leader of the, oppos the, leader of the Opposition Connor. himself. Pardon? No, no, no. The member for O'Connor, the member for Hindmarsh, <coughs> was heard in absolute silence, as the, will be the minister. The, the first, the first, and, and that's why, and that's why uh, I think it's fundamentally important, if the media are going to write about this issue, that they read the judgment of Mr. Justice O'Loughlin, because while that judgment uh, ultimately came against me on limited procedural points, uh, the arguments trotted out by the coalition were indeed trotted out, were argued in detail in the federal court. It was said, for example, that the fact that I issued a declaration for 25 years, uh, contrary to the initial advice from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, uh, was somehow an abusive process. Rejected by the court, Mr Justice O'Loughlin said the decision was for me to make, and indeed I followed uh, the report of Professor Saunders on that issue. Uh, for days on end, we had only some sections of the media trot out the argument about some alleged impropriety concerning the tops of faxes being cut off. Well, anyone in the gallery who wants access to the transcript of the federal court can come to my office and get it, and you'll see that all these issues were raised in direct detail before the federal court. I mean, I've been subject to the most extraordinary uh, judicial consideration in respect of this matter. Um, the very uh, layout of my kitchen at my house was the subject of evidence given before the court. And of course, the end, it was. And the end result of all this, of course, the, the, His Honour uh, did not uphold the assertions that were made. It was suggested because the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission had given some advice to the applicants about uh, matters within their responsibilities. That this showed somehow that I was biased or some impropriety on behalf of ATSIC, expressly rejected by the Federal Court of Australia. It was said by the coalition and you know, by a number of other people in the media and, and written up, might I say, uh, in the case of Mr Easdown, almost exclusively without any attempt to try and contact my office. I mean, page two stories in major selling tabloids uh, damning me without even the courtesy of a phone call. I mean, you know, I mean, 
uh, in my public life, uh, I have an op obligation to uphold certain standards, as do members of the House. Uh, I would have thought the most fundamental code of, aspect of the code of ethics of a journalist was to get the truth right. But it was said that I had, in some way, in a number of uh, things, prejudged this matter because I had had a draft declaration prepared. Again, a matter expressly considered by Mr Justice O'Loughlin in the Federal Court, who in fact found that it was a prudent course of action uh, to adopt. It was said that because I took uh, action on behalf of the taxpayers of the Commonwealth of Australia to investigate whether the Commonwealth would incur any liability, that somehow or other that was an impropriety. Well, again, Mr Justice O'Loughlin uh, said that that was a proper course of action for a minister to take in the interests of taxpayers, and so it goes on and on and on. Now, Mr, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, um, what I regret is uh, most of all is, is not the, the damage that the coalition campaign has done to me, um, because uh, I have never had. Let me. I have never. Well, let me just say I have never had in all my years, and there are many of them now in public life. I have never had uh, such warmth and such a show of support, not only from my colleagues in the Australian Labor Party but from people I care about in the Australian community, including the leadership of churches, uh, the leadership of community groups of great repute in, uh, throughout uh, indeed Adelaide and South Australia, uh, not only people in the trade union movement, but fair-minded Australians who, who respect uh, the way in which uh, this matter has been conducted. And let me take this opportunity to thank each and every one of those many people who have expressed that great support to me in the course of the last, uh, last couple of weeks as this campaign by the Coalition was mounted. But again, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, right uh, to today and indeed yesterday, uh, I have uh, dealt with this matter with the utmost propriety. Let me say categorically that the decision to commission a further inquiry under the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act by Her Honour Justice Jane Matthews, President of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and Deputy President of the National Native Title Tribunal. The decision to undertake that inquiry was categorically taken before uh, any suggestion of any inquiry or decision on the part of the South Australian Government to conduct uh, an inquiry. The decision was mine. I took the initiative, and the reason I took uh, that initiative, to be very blunt, and this is the saddest part of all, of this issue that uh, I became convinced that the coalition would continually uh, seek to use and to fuel uh, great division on this issue, uh, that they would continue to inflict great damage on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They would continue as a calculated campaign uh, to try and discredit Aboriginal people and the heritage process. Now, in my Order. remarks thus far, I have responded Order. in a very considered way in respect of a number of uh, process matters that have been raised in the course of debate. Uh, let me say, uh, in respect of um, uh, the politics of this, that no one ought to be under any misapprehension what is driving this process. I mean, what we're seeing here is the Adelaide Order. establishment uh, using every trick in the book, including a royal commission into the spiritual beliefs of Aboriginal people in South Australia, the Adelaide establishment using every trick in the book to strike back uh, at people who at least in some way contributed to the political demise of the member for Barker. Now that's what this is all about. This is the absolute core of the issue. And we know indeed why the member for Mayo uh, is playing such an active role in this process, because he too is another wounded soldier of the Adelaide establishment, another fallen soldier. Uh, who indeed his, his own transgressions in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs uh, of policy were indeed the very reason uh, why he lost the high office that he once held. This is, has been from day one a political campaign of the coalition in which the Liberal Party has been uh, deeply involved. Its fingerprints are all over virtually all aspects of this grubby exercise. Now let me say in relation oh, to the inquiry that's been called, uh, I will be dealing uh, with that matter, uh, as I always do, in a proper and prudent manner. It will be an arm's length inquiry uh, from me. Uh, it will be an open and transparent inquiry. 
it will be conducted fairly. Uh, all those who have any possible interest uh, in the subject matter of this inquiry uh, will be able to present their views. Uh, but I do say this, that in the interests of good government in South Australia, uh, the Premier of South Australia uh, should, in fact, not proceed, not proceed uh, with the Royal Commission that he has already Order. announced. And the Prime Minister will be writing to Premier Brown, uh, impressing upon him the concerns that the Commonwealth has about his foreshadowed uh, course of action and urging that the inquiry, the Royal Commission, uh, with power to compel people to give evidence about their spiritual beliefs, virtually unprecedented in Australian public life, uh, not be proceeded with, and that the South Australian government cooperate with the Commonwealth Order. in respect of its inquiry uh, to end this matter uh, once and for all. Now, Order. Mr. The Honourable Members for O'Connor and Leichhardt. Mr Deputy Speaker, I earlier on tabled two transcripts in respect of radio interviews uh, given by two people uh, who were referred to in the Adelaide Advertiser and elsewhere as having claimed that beliefs were fabricated. And I did that in order to uh, hope that the media, who haven't uh, really had the opportunity to peruse these transcripts in detail until now, will at least set the record straight, and that includes the Adelaide uh, Advertiser, uh, because uh, it seems to me that much of what has been written in recent days uh, about uh, the issue of Hindmarsh Island has been based on uh, really an, a lack of awareness about what the Federal Court has said in respect of this matter and indeed uh, without the, the close scrutiny of a number of, uh, of clear rebuttals of allegations that have made, been made by the Coalition. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, let me conclude, if I can, uh, with a plea to the Opposition. And I think at this particular point of time uh, it's one that will not be heeded. But can I say that eight months after the promise of the Coalition Policy on Aboriginal Affairs, uh, we still have a total absence of any policy. And I will Order. urge the Coalition, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, to stop playing Order. politics with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, to stop using Order. Aboriginal Affairs as a party political football, uh, to review your policy and to do so uh, with the good grace and decency and in the interests of this country to move to the greatest extent towards cross-party cooperation in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. Now, that's not going to happen overnight, Order. but it ought to Order. in the interests of the, the nation. The Minister's time has expired. The Honourable Member for Barker. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Look, this censure motion is about uh, whether or not this minister should resign, and I'm saying that, as the advertiser in, in, in Adelaide said this morning, he should resign. And it is time that uh, there's been a bit of shouting done about this matter in this chamber in the last few days. Uh, but I think there are some very quiet issues that I would like the minister to address. Now, he has said he has always sought to come try and bring together the parties, the Aboriginals and others in this matter. I think just I might uh, read out to you uh, a media release that Mrs. Wendy Chapman put out some days ago. Now, I have not spoken to the Chapmans, my office, my office has, but I have not spoken to the Chapmans until yesterday. Until yesterday. And, but I was reminded of this when I picked it up off my de desk because Mrs Chapman says in the six months before he banned the bridge, on six separate occasions we requested Mr Tickner to, for, to meet us to hear our case. Despite his own ministerial department advising him to meet us, he ignored us. He ignored us. Now, Mr Tickner, she says, strenuously resisted our lawyers' attempts to attain, obtain copies of all relevant documents in the court case. And I said here in this place yesterday that on three occasions, three occasions discovery was attempted, and something like six or more occasions there was a freedom of in information request, and on almost all those occasions—not all, but almost those, all those occasions— it was resisted. And of course, in the end, uh, in some matters, his adviser said Mrs Ta Chapman uh, gave evidence, which she did, that some of the relevant documents had been destroyed. Now, two weeks ago, and this is the point I want this minister to address, which he has never discussed, and that's, this has nothing to do with the court case, this has nothing to do with the federal court appeal. Two weeks ago, the most serious allegations imaginable but were made by, that, by some people by some very senior and very delightful people 
that the women's business was a hoax. And they had to make a very serious decision whether they were going to sta stand up and say so in the face of their Narrangiri people. Have you, have you talked to them? I mean, has the minister talked to them? Of course he hasn't talked to them. He's had anybody ring them up from his department and say, look, you know, I mean, you've come out and given evidence, you've come out and given evidence that wasn't there before. Nothing to do with the court case. New evidence. People who, who are retiring, quiet, people who don't uh, take the public, public eye. No, you have not. No, the minister has not. And why not? Because it has obviously put a hole in the declaration he made. And when you look, when you look at that Sa Saunders report, and I don't think Cheryl Saunders, Professor Saunders, did a very good job, but I'm not accusing her of, me of much because I'll tell you why. She didn't have all the information. She did not have all the information. And I've raised this two or three times in this place. Why was it that the only woman the only woman that was used as an original source of the women's business, that is Nana Laura, 88-year-old last year, perfectly healthy, known to the minister, had a letter in his, in, his, in his hands, in his office, known to the minister's staff as being the only source, original source of this women's business information, was still alive last year and she wasn't asked. Now look up. Why don't you look up and face this question? She wasn't asked because Professor Saunders didn't know about it. She didn't know about it because, obviously, Doreen Cartnieri, who is obviously central to this whole thing, much quoted in the, Sa in the Saunders report, didn't tell her. Or if she did tell her, then Professor Saunders did a worse job than I think she did. And I don't think she did a very good job. But one of the reasons why she didn't know was the minister had her name in a letter, only person alive, others have been, others have been dead for 12 or 15 years, and she was never, and her name was never told to Professor Saunders. And after the minister read the report, in the 30 hours he had to read the report, he knew, or his advisers knew, that her name never appeared in those 56 pages, and none of your staff went to check. So the whole of the basis of the women's business, if it were true, had one central source alive. Ever asked by anybody? Answer? No. Why not? Ever checked by anybody in your staff? Why not? No. Don't know. Why would, why, would, why would we know? I think the reason is that this minister had made up his mind of the general direction. And you know why he made up his mind of the general direction? Because he had a couple of letters. He had, that was one of them. One of the letters he had was one. The other one came from the first meeting, which was really quite seminal in this whole matter, which I raised the other day, and that was its sort of first public genesis, if you like. Which, which was on the 9th of May on Hindmarsh Island, and at that meeting, 15 women were asked by the Lower Murray Aboriginal Heritage Committee to come down there and solve a problem for them. Now, what was the problem they had to solve? Mr. Neil Draper, not not Nelly Draper, not a woman, a man, <coughs> Neil Draper, had just co completed a report for the South Australian government, and that report was not going to be good enough. That was their dilemma. That's what they told these 15 women. That report wasn't going to be good enough to get the bridge, the bridge ban, which was their objective, to get the bridge ban. So they said to the women, the women you have to do something. And they brought Doreen Cartonieri down to the meeting from Adelaide, and she said, I know the answer. I know the answer. The answer is that that's where all our, our ancestors' babies were aborted when they were got pregnant by white men. And so they wrote a letter. They wrote a letter to the minister, the first part of a letter, and they took it to the other side of the island where other people were, including the Aboriginal lawyer for the Aboriginal uh, Legal Rights Movement for South Australia, Tim Woolley, and he said to them, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. So another part was added to the letter later in the day. And what do you think that said? That was straight sentences out of Mr Neil Draper's report, a man. Mr. Ne whole sentences. And that was sent to the minister. Now, You'd think that anybody who was really cognizant of the fair result would have twigged that here was, were sentences nothing to do with women's secret business, but have come out of a, a report written by a man. So after that, of course, with those two letters, one from Doreen Cartonieri saying uh, on the 12th of May, uh, the, the other one came on the 9th, the one on the 12th of May saying, you know, I've been aware of women's business for, for, for a long time, but I've just become aware recently of the exact place to which it refers, and referring to the three sources, two of whom are long dead and one still alive. Uh, then he appointed Cheryl Saunders, a woman, 
of course, a woman, I'm not criticising that, to have a look, look into the women's business matters. Now, he has never, these, these matters aren't part of this court case. The court case is a, in a federal court, is a federal court appeal about procedure and whether the process was taken, took place correctly. And as one of my colleagues said to me, what ought to be addressed is, did that meeting take place? What happened at that meeting? What were the facts surrounding that? And did that meeting take place there on High Marsh Island with men, with men guiding the direction of the conversation? And that brings us, of course, to Doug Miller up, because he was there. And I have to back up the, the shadow minister who, who, who just put a, a, a hole through the, the veracity of this minister's uh, argument, or lack of it. The last thing that Doug Miller has said in a six-page interview, in a long interview with Keith Conlon on ABC Radio yesterday morning, and, 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 and false staff at the table tried to obfuscate this thing yesterday by, by reading stuff from early on, but the last things he said were this. Question from Conlon, and I think you said it last night that you were the person who invented the story. Do you stand by that? Miller, yes, okay. If you want to, I tried to avoid this, but if you want to say that, I did invent it. Okay. Miller then goes on to say, let everybody in South Australia know that I was the one, I was one of the instigators who created the story to stop the bridge. He wasn't asked to say that, he asked, volunteered that of his own information. So Conlon then says to him, What's that got to do with the understanding of women's business on Hindmarsh Island? Miller says the women's business is all fabricated. The women's business, the last thing he said, that's well, not the last thing he said, Conlon then said to him, the women made it up? Miller, yes. You want to talk any more because I'm getting sick of talking to you, says Miller. That is the end of the interview. So at the end of the whole of that stuff, six pages, he has asked the seminal question he said, yes, I fabricated it. So don't try and come in here and tell us some other story. Now let's look at a couple of other matters. Wendy Chapman says that, and, and I might say one more thing about Doug Miller. He was he was the central applicant in the in the uh, for the bridge ban. So you, one 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 has to recognise this. So last thing from Wendy Chapman. On the 10th of last year, Mr. Tickner made his bridge ban and was brought, and brought, has brought down the whole crushing power of the Commonwealth onto my family based on his half-baked investigation. A few days later, our company went into liquidation as a result. Now, that's so much for you getting the people together, you know, the Aboriginals on one side and the others and, 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 and the white people and the de developer or investor on the other. So much for you getting those people together because she says she tried six times to get you together and you, and, 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 and you, wouldn't, and you wouldn't come to it. And I know I was amused when you said a minute ago that uh, you know some something about uh, this. Oh uh, yes, uh, spending money like a drunken sailor. You said, "Well, my goodness me, as I understand it, the cost of your whole operation, the cost of your whole operation, will probably cost the Commonwealth millions, maybe tens of millions in the end, of dollars." The Saunders inquiry, 250,000 is the estimate for the Saunders uh, uh, inquiry. Aboriginal applicants, legal costs, 100,000. Court case being judge, court staff, court costs, Mr. Tickner's costs, Aboriginal residents' costs, etc., 600,000. Full court appeal, 250,000. Minister's office internal costs being Sue Key's time and other staff, 100,000. ATSIC costs, 300,000, and so on and so on. Until, but moreover, all, on top of all of that, of course, is the loss to the developers. The loss to the developers. Now, I don't believe that these developers should be chosen over anybody else. But what is absolutely paramount is that this minister and a minister in this position who has the chance to make a declaration must make a declaration when he can get as close as possible to the truth. And what we now have is a whole lot of information which shows that what he may have thought was the truth, I think he was part of the conspiracy. I think, he, I think he was part of the. I mean, maybe unwilling, maybe unwilling, too stupid to know any better. But unwitting and unwitting, too stupid to be any better. But the fact of the matter is that when, when, you, read, when, you, read, when you read that Saunders report and knew that only four women said they knew anything out of 1,600, is it? Is it 2,000? How many? 
women, that those people claimed, and then there were other people who disputed, disputed the thing since then, you should have known better. Now, I might also say that on the subject, the other subject that I want to raise is when you, when you take somebody's asset away, I mean when you acquire their, their asset, not quite the same as, a, as an acquisition of land, why do you as the government, with all the might of government, and the, and the minister in, in charge of government business uh, was, was alluding to this, this that, that my, my use of, of documents. I'll tell you why I use those documents. I mean, forget about the secret documents, because we might find that the secret documents have got as much authenticity as a promise from the Prime Minister inside them yet. Absolutely. That could be possible. That's the point. That's the so my use of these documents was because I knew, I knew that this minister had not given up on discovery all the documents he should have, he should have given up. And when I got those documents, it was patently obvious that he hadn't. Patently obvious that he hadn't. But let me, but let me ask, let me ask you. We talk about responsibility. There were 400 pages of representations came to you. 400 pages of representations came to you. And one of the people who made a representation, uh, Mr Ian Webber, known to a lot of people in this room, been on government inquiries, head of them for the Labor Party and for the Liberal Party and other people, uh, chairman of Maine Nicholas, he got a letter from ATSIC saying, do you mind, uh, we've got an FOI uh, application, do you mind if we spread your financial details around? So he wrote to Professor Saunders and said, how is it that ATSIC has got a copy of my private representations, which I wrote to you, should, are only for you and the minister? Or words to that effect. Or words to that effect. So Professor Saunders said, I don't know. I don't know. I sent it to the minister. Now, I mean, I know, I know that there has been a change of arrangements from ATSIC, but there were 400 pages of representations. And, and not only that, when. when <laughs> When, when uh, the, the thing comes through, the letter comes through, the ATSIC letter says, well, we'd like to hear what you say, but we're not sure that we'll take any notice of it, even if you object. So all of his, rep his private business is going to go any to anybody who puts in an FOI. Now, as it turns out, that <laughs> FOI was probably from Chapman's lawyers because they wanted to see what the, the, the representations say. But if we, so we, we, we talk about, as this minister does time and time again, about handling pr things properly, he has not handled things properly. He has not gone into depth in this matter, and I think that he should resign, as, as the advertiser said this morning. And, and, and it's no good coming along with your own, with your own little inquiry again after a telephone call Order. from the Premier of Governor South Australia. Parker's time has expired. The question is a motion moved by the Honourable Member for Hindmarsh be agreed to. The Honourable Leader of the House. The House should not accept this. They should not accept it for its content and it not, should, should not accept it for the motives behind it. We've gone to motive for some time now in these, in these debates in the Chamber because this is about the fourth or fifth time that we've had one. And uh, as we've gone into them four or five times, these things have always been consistent elements of it. There's been a constant seeking without evaluation by the opposition of the information that is before them. They hear one thing and they rush to this chamber with a censure motion on the, uh, on the, uh, the Aboriginal Affairs Minister, and then usually a day or so later, when a bit of political prudence sort of indicated to that you wait, you get a repudiation of that proposition. And then you find out something else, you come rushing into the chamber with an, with the, regarding yourselves as having yet another document or yet another statement that demonstrates the rectitude of your position. again. You leave it without leaving it alone for a day or two to let, to let people dwell on what has been presented and let them dwell on what is alleged to have been said by them. You, uh, you race in here and you find some other reason on, that, on the basis of that unsubstantiated claim to attempt to censure the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. On every single occasion, including this one, and every single occasion, including this one, the so-called facts on which you have based your case have been muddied or repudiated outright, every single occasion. And it all stems back to the first occasion. The first occasion you ran on this was not about your concern for the developers. You opposed the construction of the bridge. You were commercially stupid. And, uh, it's, uh, and it's not because you think that it uh, bankrupted the people who are concerned, they are in receivership before Mr Tickner got anywhere near the particular decision. So that was the second piece of falsification, I might say, in the, uh, the remarks that you made. That wasn't a matter of concern to you. 
you thought you had an opportunity based on the fact that by accident a series of documents turned up in your office, not just the odd letter, but an absolute trove, a chest full of documents that were the entire legal case of the Commonwealth, not politics, the entire legal case of the Commonwealth. You picked all of that up, you raced into this place, and then, frankly, you fibbed and deceived about those materials in this place. You made accusations against the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Why you cannot, why you cannot stand and move motions in this place? You can get other people to move motions, but why you cannot, you cannot, but you nevertheless persist in doing so, is that your hands are so sullied by your initial performance. Mr Speaker, the honourable member's hands are so sullied by his initial performance as, uh, as far as this is concerned that he has no credibility, no capacity to speak in this place. And I, always, I always had some vague respect for that, uh, that former uh, Nazi uh, minister Speyer on one ground only. When he was released after years of dissension after being justifiably jailed for his heinous role in World War II, he was quizzed as he came out of jail. And the question was put to him by a journalist. What do you think about the latest Russian threat to our security? And his response to that was, with a political record like mine, why would you ask me for an opinion? Well, with a political record on this matter, like the honourable member for Barker has, why would anyone want to know his views? Because his original presentation was tainted, and tainted in the worst possible way for somebody who sought to stand up before the Governor General and swear an oath of office as a member of the Executive Council. A level of, 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 of frittering around, frittering away a, uh, a set of, uh, of documents put before him which should have been taken straight back to the office. Now, I'm not absolutely certain. Like Senator Vanstone. Like Senator, Senator Vanstone copped a similar trove. What did Senator Vanstone did? She handed it back. She didn't rock around the place trying to take advantage of what had been, what had been put before her. Uh, and you alone have managed a performance like that. With your political record, why on earth would anyone want to know what you think about this matter at all? You ought to be getting somebody else in, uh, in, uh, on the opposition side, if you must persist with these resolutions, to get up and do the job. Now, your leader may be trying to re rehabilitate you on this because he's got a pack of non-entities on his front bench, and you at least once had a reputation. You at least once had a reputation in the public. And, uh, and uh, it was a good reputation in the public. And uh, it's not surprising that uh, the Leader of the Opposition, with such a bunch of non entities on his front bench, would want somebody who once had the reputation you had on the front bench. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, that you, on this matter anyway, are disqualified to speak, though you persist in doing so. What you have now persisted in, and I want to dwell on this to some extent, is the question of this Royal Commission. Let us understand this Royal Commission. There has only been one other, to my recollection, Royal Commission organised on what might be regarded as a religious matter, and that was the uh, Royal Commission to the Church of Scientology. And there was at least some argument at the stage as whether or not they were going through bad, uh, were, were purporting uh, to be a religion, while in fact what they were involved in was, uh, was doubtful psychological practices. That was the issue of the day. So it usually had that rationale uh, behind acts that were associated with banning them. In this case, this is a royal commission simply into spiritual beliefs. It's not a royal commission into the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, his department or his handling of the issue. It's not a royal commission into that. There is, there, no royal commission in South Australia is empowered to investigate that anyway. And as far as I can see, Dean Brown has not been stupid enough in this uh, unprincipled act on his part to attempt to do something that is not within his power to do it. What he has done is target with star chamber powers 16th century investigative powers, which is what royal commissions have, a group of women's religious beliefs. That is what he is doing. He is using a royal commission power which is generally used to get at uh, illegalities, corruption, at, uh, at manifest failures of public policy. It's not into public policy at all. It is into a group of women's spiritual beliefs. You talk about the whole might of the state and the chaplains. You talk about the whole might of the state and a court case, which are run routinely anyway on appeals against this or that government decision at any point of time, a court case where rule, normal rules of evidence apply, where rules related to hearsay apply, where there is some level of discipline in what is put before them. You contrast that 
the imposition of the state in that circumstance, with the putting in place of a 16th century star chamber to investigate the religious beliefs of a group of women in South Australia. This is an act of infamy that will go down into the records of, uh, of, of white and black relationships in this country for many, many years to come. And you are part of it. You are part of that process which has produced this act of infamy. Now, ultimatums to prime ministers by pipsqueaks uh, suggesting to them that they've got 48 hours to respond will, at the end of the day, produce a foot firmly planted between their buttocks. But nevertheless, 48 hours was uh, the suggestion that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Premier of South Australia had the prime, suggested to the Prime Minister that before he put this star chamber in to women's beliefs, and Aboriginal women's beliefs in South Australia, before he put that star chamber in place, he said to the Prime Minister, over that 48 hours, uh, you perhaps would like to consider what you would intend to do. As it is, what he was running along with, as the Prime Minister for Aboriginal Affairs has foreshadowed on many times, was his preparedness at, uh, at the completion of the judicial process that is currently underway to see a further judicial process in, instigated into not the women's beliefs per se, but into the way in which the determination was made and the grounds on which it was made. It's, it's something relevant, in other words, uh, to the issue of the day, as opposed to targeting them and their religious beliefs. He went, not on 48 hours, I mean, he might have anticipated what ought to be a prime ministerial response to, uh, to, such, to, to that, and he shot from the hip, went charging out, and stuck that royal commission in place. Stuck that royal commission in place. We now have a totally infamous situation. A totally infamous situation, as I said, where that, uh, where that has been. Uh, we now have a royal commission onto the religious commitments of a section of the Australian people. And uh, now it doesn't matter to the Liberals opposite because they have that Midas touch, as I said yesterday. That Midas touch, they can, sing the, they can say the words, but they can't sing the song. They cannot, whatever they might say, when, they come down, when it comes down to dealing with issues that relate to Aboriginal affairs, they have a Midas touch of failure. They have an absolute Midas touch of every time when they're actually brought up to the mark, what comes out is vicious racism. Vicious racism, and uh, that vicious racism is reflected here in, that, uh, in the only inquiry outside that Church of Scientology process, the only royal commission on religion ever in Australian history. Now let us persist with some of these grounds on which they base. It's not a religion. It is not order. a religion. Order. The women's Aboriginal order. beliefs order. are not order. a religion. Order. Well, all right. Now let me, uh, Point of order. Mr. The, the uh, Honourable Leader of the House, wait just for a moment. Uh, as a matter of clarification, I said the Royal Commission's not on order. religion. Order. Now you're introducing debate. You can use yes. other forms of the House to the clarify the position is. later. The Leader of the House. Now let me let me go into some of these statements that have been made because all of this that you have chosen to feed off is related to uh, the, uh, the statements that are alleged to have been made by the various by the Millers in particular. And the Adelaide Advertiser ran that uh, vociferously, and you quoted them again uh, the, in the course of your remarks. So the honourable member for Barker quoted them again. Let me go through the comments today of Sarah Miller on all of this, and she is obviously a person being torn about by it. She had this to say about her former husband's views on whether or not it was fabricated. And it says, on weakness, she, she was asked uh, uh, when. She's given a quote from her husband. What do you think of that, said Nicol, the interviewer. Miller discussed it. Why? And her remarks say, among other things, on weakness. It's time to back off because there is no way he would know about women's business. Number one, he would not know about business. I lived in the same house as him and he wouldn't know because I wouldn't degrade myself by telling him. And he goes on. Nicol again. He said that you got carried away with the whole thing and got caught up in it. That's not so. So you stand by your claim that the stories are not invented. I stand by everything that happened, the right way, not the silly way, Burundi way. He goes on and says, uh, 
The, uh, so the information that has gone to Robert Tickner in the first place is accurate. The women's business material is accurate. Originally, yes. She goes on. Uh, look, Nickel. Look, let me take you back. I have to keep coming back to this because it's turning out to be the central issue, whether you like it or not. That it's the woman's business. Now, there's no way I can ask you what it is. I simply ask you again. Doug's claim that the story about women's business, that the bridge stop was invented specifically to stop the bridge, is that accurate or is it wrong? That's absolutely stupid. That is a ridiculous thing I've heard. How can we not say things? We are Nanjari women. How can we be true? That's silly. That's not be true. That's silly. That's silly. That man's got no qualification to say that. Goes on. Well, originally, let's look at. Uh, so the uh, uh, he uh, uh, right. Oh, we're getting down to small bits and pieces, Nickel. I think the major issue still remains, doesn't it? Whether or not the women's business exists. You say emphatically that it does. Of course, of course. If I don't, I don't. I want to know what qualifies a man to say. Now you had one quote at the end of a report, which in fact started off with Doug Miller saying it wasn't fabricated. Now you have that. Five repudiations of the notion of this person whose evidence on which you've been relying. Five repudiations that the story is uh, is fabricated. You had a bit too to say about. Um, uh, the uh, academic Cheryl Saunders and what you actually thought of the academic Cheryl Saunders and uh, what you of course have to deal with when you look at what the academic Cheryl Saunders had to say about this is Justice O'Loughlin's view of Professor Saunders in his federal court judgment. He said she performed her tasks professionally, dispassionately and with competence. I reject the aspersions which have been cast on her and the manner in which she's performed her duties. That was the view of uh, Justice O'Loughlin, as far as Cheryl Saunders was concerned, and her performance in this regard. Why did he arrive at his determination? Because you make some, something of the determination. Well, it goes to technicalities. One of the things that the judge believed, evidently, was that Mr Tickner should have read the secret women's business. That was the judge's view, and the minister has quite rightly contested that view. Uh, given his understanding of the sensitivities of Aboriginal women to men reading their materials or, under, or knowing their materials, a decision which he, which I think is a, perfectly, a position of perfect integrity as far as the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs is concerned, he said, I will not do that. I will not do that. And he said, well, you should have done that. So Mr Tickner quite sensibly said, well, I appeal. I appeal on that particular proposition. That doesn't reflect badly on him. That doesn't suggest that he is incompetent. It just suggests he has a disagreement with the judge about what level of sensitivity ought to apply to women's business in, consideration by, in, in their consideration by men. That's all. That's all. So uh, really, this, 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 is a, this is a concocted motion which covers the most serious impact on the civil liberties of Australian citizens in the creation of this Royal Commission. You deserve no credence for it. I move the motion be put. The question is that the motion be put. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think no. the ayes have it. No. Noes have a division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion should be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and those to the left I point. Tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide. Tell us for the noes. The honourable members for Wannan and Riverina.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 71, no 60. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion moved by the honourable member for Hindmarsh be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. No. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the honourable member for Hindmarsh be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Point tell us for the ayes, the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina. Tell us for the noes, the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide. And the members for Karangamite and Braddon were a bit lucky. Order. The result of the division is ayes 60, noes 71. The division is therefore resolved in the negative. Would honourable members please resume their seats. Honourable Leader of the House. 
based on the notice paper. I have one personal explanation from the honourable member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We'll just get a bit of quiet for you. Members, please resume their seats or leave the chamber. Member for Goldstein. Mr. Speaker, I seek to make a personal explanation. Your claim has been misrepre misrepresented. I do. Please proceed. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've now had an opportunity to read the Hansard of the comments of the Minister for Employment, Education and Training in question time yesterday. In relation to myself, the Minister made the following comment. He doctors every document that comes from my department. Unquote. Mr Speaker, this is a very serious charge and one which is totally untrue. I have never altered any document received from his department, and I ask the minister to withdraw this baseless allegation. The honourable member for Taney has a question for me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as Minister for Communications and the Arts, the member for Dobell has answered 74 questions on notice. But to answer them, he's on my arithmetic taken an average period for each question which exceeds the 90-day delinquency-free period allowed under Standing Order 150. The Minister has 14 questions outstanding, two since the 3rd of May 1994, a period of more than a year. Another of the 14 is question number 2128, which I asked him more than 90 days, 90 days ago. Would you please write to the Minister under the Standing Order and ask him to amend the error of his ways? I will write to him under the Standing Order relevant to the particular question at hand, and I would hope the Minister has taken note of your comments about uh, other questions. I present the Auditor General's Audit Report No. 31 of 1994-95, entitled Efficiency Audit Defence Contracting. The Honourable Leader of the House. Motion to authorise the publication and printing of the report. Leave is granted. Leave is granted. The Honourable Leader of the House. I move that one, this House authorises the publication of the Auditor General's Report No. 31 of 94-95 and two, the report be printed. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, papers at table was listed on the schedule circulated honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. I move that the House take note of the following paper, Implications of Australian Defence Exports Government Response. The honourable member for somebody. <laughs> Fair enough. Move the debate be adjourned. I move the debate be adjourned. The question is: the motion be agreed to? All those that opinion say aye. The country now think the ayes have it. Uh, order. I have received a letter from the honourable member for Hindmarsh proposing a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the failure of the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs to properly administer the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1984 in a fair and just way. Mm -hmm and his failure to consider all evidence before him and for bringing Aboriginal heritage into disrepute. Sounds familiar. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise from their places. She's not here. She's not here. She's not here. Oh, well, then lapses. the motion lapses. Um, the Honourable Leader of the House, a special adjournment. Uh, yes. The, uh, I'll move the House at... Uh, it's rising adjourn until Monday, 19th of June, 1995, at 12.30pm, unless the Speaker fixes an alternative day or hour of meeting. All those in favour say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. No, me. Messages from the Senate. Okay. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate has passed a bill for an act about privileges and immunities of certain overseas missions and for related purposes and transmits it to the House of Representatives for its concurrence. Uh, the clerk. First reading, a bill for an act about privileges and immunities of certain overseas missions and for related purposes. The Honourable Minister for Ministry Services. Speaker, I present the explanatory memorandum to this bill. Mr. Speaker, I move that the second reading be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We have another message from the Senate. Who said they weren't passing legislation? Thank you. The, Senate, uh, the following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate has passed a bill for an act to make consequential amendments relating to the Overseas Missions, Privileges and Immunities Act 1995 and transmits it to the House of Rep Representatives for its concurrence. 
Honourable the Minister for First reading. Oh, the clerk, sorry. A bill for an act to make consequential amendments relating to the Overseas Missions, Privileges and Immunities Act 1995. Honourable the Minister for Administrative Services. Speaker, I present the explanatory memorandum to this bill. And, Mr. Speaker, I move that the second reading be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye to the country. No, I think the ayes have it. Order. I have received messages from the Senate returning the following bills without amendment. Qantas Sale Amendment 1995 and Defence Legislation Amendment 1995. Clark, or is it me? I've got I've got an aircraft noise here. Is there is there? Order, I, received a re uh, I have to report that the main committee has resolved that further proceedings on the aircraft noise levy bill 1995 be conducted in the House. I present a certified copy of the bill. The Honourable Minister for Administrative Services. Mr Speaker, I move that further proceedings on this bill be made in order of the day for a later hour of this day. The question is that that motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I have, re have to report that the main committee has resolved that further proceedings on the aircraft noise levy collection bill 1995 be conducted in the House. I present a certified copy of the bill. Honourable the Minister for Administrative Services. Mr. Speaker, I move that further proceedings on this bill be made in order of the day for a later hour of this day. The question is that that motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, I report that the Meat and Livestock Industry Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee. A Governor-General's message recommending an appropriation has been reported and the bill has been agreed to with amendments. I present a certified copy of the bill together with a schedule of the amendments made by the committee. Um, I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. There being no objection, I will allow that course to be followed. The question is that the amendments made by the main committee be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill as amended has been agreed to. The Honourable Minister for Administrative Services. We ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. Uh, the question is the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading. A bill for an act relating to the Australian meat and livestock industry. Time out. Having a change. Order. I have to report that the Australian Meat and Livestock Quotas Amendment Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Duty Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Duty I, Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Meat and Livestock Quotas Act 1990 and for related purposes. I have to further report that the Meat and Livestock Industry Legislation Repeal Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee. A Governor-General's message recommending an appropriation has been reported and the bill has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The bill has been agreed to. Minister. Deputy Speaker, I ask leave the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I Minister. move that this bill be now read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading. A bill for an act to <coughs> repeal certain legislation relating to the Australian meat and livestock industry and for related purposes. Order. I have to report that the Beef Production Levy Amendment Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand that it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. 
The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I ask leave of this House to, bill move, has been agreed to. move the third reading forthwith. Lord, the question uh, is leave granted. Leave is granted, Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third time. Well, the question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Beef Production Levy Act 1990 and for related purposes. After a report, the Livestock Export Charge Amendment Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. If the country no, I think the ayes have it. The bill has been agreed to. Minister. I ask leave for the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Oh, thank you. Be leave is granted. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading. A bill for an act to amend the Livestock Export Charge Act 1977 and for related purposes. I have to report that the Livestock Slaughter Levy Amendment Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. The Minister. I ask leave of the House to move the third leave reading granted. forthwith. Leave is granted. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third well, time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Livestock Slaughter Levy Act 1964 and for related purposes. I have to report that the Cattle Transaction Levy Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. The question is that this bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Minister. I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forward. Leave granted. Leave is granted, Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to impose a levy on certain transactions and other dealings involving cattle and for related purposes. I have to report that the Cattle Export Charges Amendment Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand it's the wish of the House to consider this bill forthwith. The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to, Minister. I ask leave of the House is to leave move the third Le reading. Leave is granted, mm -hmm. Minister. I ask leave of the House. So I move that this bill be now read a third time. question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Cattle Export Charge Act 1990. I have to report that the National Residue Survey Administration Amendment Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. Uh, is it the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith? It is. The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Minister. I ask leave of the House to move the third is leave reading granted? forthwith. Leave is granted. Minister. I move this bill be now read a third time. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading. A bill for an act to amend the National Residue Survey Administration Act 1992. I have to report that the National Residue Survey Cattle Export Levy Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand that the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. The question is that this bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? Yeah, leave is granted. I move this bill be now read a third time. Lord, the question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to impose national residue survey levy in respect of the export of cattle from Australia. Order. I have to report that the National Residue Survey Cattle Transactions Levy Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand it's wish the House to consider the bill forthwith. Therefore, the question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Minister. I ask to move the third is reading leave granted? Forthwith. Leave is granted. Minister. I move this bill be now read a third time. question is, is this bill be now read a third time? All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to impose National Residue Survey levy in respect of certain transactions and other dealings involving cattle. I have to further report. Wait for it. 
that the National Cattle Disease Eradication Trust Account Amendment Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee, a Governor-General's message recommending an appropriation has been reported, and the bill has been agreed to with amendments. I present a certified copy of the bill together with a schedule of the amendments made by the committee. I now understand that it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. Therefore, the question is that the amendments made by the main committee be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill as amended has been agreed to. Minister. I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Yes, leave. The, uh, Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question time. is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the National Cattle Disease Eradication Trust Account Act 1991. I have to report that the Primary Industries Levies and Charges Collection Amendment Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to with amendments. I present a certified copy of the bill together with a schedule of the amendments made by the committee. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. That being the case, the question is that the amendments made by the main committee be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister, I ask leave. Oh, this bill has been as amended has been agreed to. I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Leave must be granted. Yes. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Reading a bill for an act to amend the Primary Industries Levies and Charges Collection Act 1991. Finally, I have to report that the Exotic Animal Disease Control Amendment Bill 1995 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. I understand that yet again it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. Therefore, the question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. Minister. I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. The uh, leave is granted. Minister. This bill be now read a third time. Well, the question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Exotic Animal Disease Control Act 1989. The Honourable Member for Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I present the 23rd report from the Publications Committee, sit sitting in conference with the Publications Committee of the Senate. Copies of the report are being circulated to honourable members in the chamber. And I ask leave of the House to move that the report be agreed to. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The honourable member for Patterson. I move that the report be agreed to. The question is that the report be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Next order of the day, Local Government Financial Assistance Bill, further consideration in detail. Right. Right. Order the question. Order. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Maranoa. Speaker, I move an amendment five as circulated by name. Uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, I move the fifth amendment circulated in my name. Uh, now, this amendment circulated by name relates to the requirement the minister report to Parliament annually on how councils have met these objectives specified for them in the bill and on other matters related to the administration of the legislation. This will include the extent to which the funds have been allocated on a horizontal equalisation basis and on the performance by councils of their functions, including the efficiency and provision of council services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. The Australian Local Government Association and the State and Territory Ministers believe the government has breached a firm undertaking that any reporting arrangements are to be made to the local government minister's conference. The federal government had agreed that reporting on council's performance would be dealt with under the auspices of the regular local government minister's meetings. 
rather than to Parliament in the first instance. There has been no agreement on the form which the report should take or on the detail of the benchmarking arrangements to be implemented. These issues were to be the subject of further investigations by the officials and advice to the next minister's conference, which is going to be held next year. My amendment and the opposition's amendment requires the federal minister to consult with relevant state ministers and local government in the preparation of the report to Parliament. Mr. Speaker, I expect uh, this will resolve many of the concerns raised about the reporting process and ensure the minister honours at least the spirit of the undertakings he has reached with the other levels of government. I understand the minister is prepared to accept the first, second, third and the fifth amendments I have moved, and I thank the government for accepting those amendments and seeing uh, some sense uh, in the amendments and agreeing to the position of the opposition on those amendments. So it's certainly pleasing to see that it's acknowledged that there is need for continued consultation with the third sphere of government in this country, and uh, he holds that as a matter, of, as we do on this side of the House, uh, as, a, as a great concern. I can only ask that he reconsider his opposition to the provision according the status of disallowable instruments to the national principles and the intrastate distribution of the financial assistance grants. Parliament must be allowed to scrutinise the distribution of these funds and the minister should honour the agreement he struck to allow this scrutiny to occur. Mr Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, I do want to thank uh, those members on this side of the House and the other side of the House for their valuable contributions to this bill. Whilst we had some differences of opinions, I think the, the debate was a fruitful one and I think some of the content of some of the members' speeches was certainly one that we should all uh, take note of and read, obviously, in Hansard, but they were certainly valuable contributions. And also, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to thank the assistance that we have had from the clerks in the preparation of our amendments. I do want to thank them because so often I think they get overlooked uh, by this House in the preparation of uh, the day-to-day -day running of this House and also the preparation of those amendments. And I do want to thank the clerks for their help and I notice the clerk responsible in this occasion is here in the House on this occasion. I thank the House. Well, I uh, thank the honourable member for Maranoa for his comments. But he was worrying me when he was straying back to his Fourth Amendment. But it is, the question is that the amendment be agreed to, and the amendment is the amendment number five, the Minister for Admin Services. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I've always been a passionate supporter of the Fifth Amendment. And, uh, <laughs> uh, more importantly, the, the responsible minister has been overwhelmed by the sweeping uh, logic of uh, the Honourable Member for Maranoa and accepts the amendment. Order. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. For the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that this bill, as amended, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill, as amended, has been agreed to. Is uh, the minister? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister? I move that this bill be now read a third time. Order the question that this, that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to provide for financial assistance for local government purposes by means of grants to the states, the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory and for related purposes. At this stage, I think I say the chair will be resumed at 6.30 p.m.
The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to declare certain bills as cognate bills. This leave granted. Leave is granted. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I declare that the following bills are cognate bills. Passenger Movement Charge Amendment Bill 1995 and Passenger Movement Charge Collection Amendment Bill 1995. The Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day Number 5, Passenger Movement Charge Amendment Bill. Motion for second reading. The Mr. The Deputy Speaker, Secretary. I move that these bills be now read a sec I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this bill, together with the Passenger Movement Charge Collection Amendment Bill 1995, known as the Collection Bill, completes the package of legislative measures introduced last year following the government's 1994 budget initiative to replace the existing $25 departure tax with a $27 passenger movement charge to fully offset the cost of customs immigration quarantine processing at Australia's borders and the cost of issuing short-term visitor visas. This bill clarifies the, the treatment of travel involving Australia's external territories and brings the status of departures to installations in Area A of the Australia-Indonesia Zone of Cooperation, which undergo customs and immigration processing into line with that of, in the Customs Act 1901 and the Migration Act 1958. Financial impact statement. The amendments proposed in this bill have no direct financial implications, and I commend the bill to the House. The Passenger Movement Charge Collection Amendment Bill 1995, Mr Deputy Speaker, together with the Passenger Movement Charge Amendment Bill 1995, the, known as the Charge Bill, completes the package of legislative measures introduced last year following the Government's 1994 budget initiative to replace the existing $25 departure tax with a $27 passenger movement charge to fully offset the, cost, the cost of customs, immigration and the quarantine processing at Australia's borders and the cost of issuing short-term visitor visas. The legislation passed by the Parliament last year as Acts numbers 146 and 159 in 1994 set the new rate of charge at $27 in respect of departures from Australia after 1 January 1995. At the time that legislation was being considered by the Parliament, the Government also made known its intention to commence negotiations with international air and sea passenger carriers to have them collect the, the uh, PMC as part of their ticketing arrangements, thereby removing the need for departure tax stamp booths at international departure points. Negotiations with airlines are in their final stages, and the airlines' representatives have given their, uh, given their in principle agreement for the airlines to enter into arrangements to collect PMC from passengers departing after 1 July 1995. For the first 12 months of the new collection regime, when the airlines will still be establishing collection procedures, the PMC stamp booths will remain at international airports to ensure that those passengers who have not prepaid the PMC as part of the price of a ticket will, will be able to pay before departing Australia. The airlines understand that at the end of this transitional period, the booths will cease to operate and the, and the airlines will assume sole responsibility for PMC collection. A further arrangement will be negotiated with the airlines for the long term. As part of the new collection regime, this bill will replace the existing 24 narrowly defined categories of exemption from PMC liability with 12 broadly defined categories of exemption, both to facilitate collection of the PMC by airlines and shipping companies and to clarify the operation of the new collection scheme. In particular, item 4 of the schedule to the bill provides that a person departing from Australia will not have to pay the $27 PMC in relation to his or her departure where that person is under 12 years of age or a traditional inhabitant of the Torres Strait travelling in connection with traditional activities or a member of the Defence Force of another country or that person's family who departs from Australia in the course of their duty on a military aircraft or ship or the crew member of an aircraft or ship or a member of their family or a crew member who is being repositioned or a passenger who is in transit or departs Australia after entering the course of an emergency or other circumstance beyond his or her control or a foreign diplomatic or consular staff member or a passenger on a cruise type journey which involves multiple departures from Australia <laughs> where the PMC has already been paid in respect of a previous departure during the course of that journey or a person travelling to Area A of the Australia-Indonesia Zone of Cooperation in the Timor Sea in accordance with the Timor Gap Treaty. This final category has been included as a consequence of the amendment of the Charge Bill to treat departures for installations in Area A in the same way as departures for other countries as both require customs and immigration processing. Persons departing in connection with petroleum exploration activities have been exempted from PMC on the same basis as ship 
and aircraft crew members, namely that the departure is undertaken in the course of their employment. The measures in the charge bill clarify the treatment of travel involving Australia's external territories and bring the status of departures to installations <laughs> in Area A of the Australia-Indonesia Zone of Cooperation in line with that in the Customs Act 1901 and the Migration Act 1958. Financial impact statement. The direct financial impact of the measures proposed in this bill are expected to result in the following increases in, to revenue in present dollar values. One, redefinition of transit passengers increased for 1995-96 of $1.5 million, two, abolition of various exemptions increased for 1995-96 of $300,000. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. The question <coughs> is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for O'Connor. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, just as a matter of um, a procedure, um, I feel that this Secretary may not have moved that the second bill be read a second time, and I'm inviting him to do so just in case he failed to do so. Yeah, um, just been informed hmm? he doesn't do that until the order has been called on. Uh, so that's not so necessary the in the second reading speech. Order, as usual. Fine, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have yeah. to bring the bill back at some time because it had not been properly moved. Now we can deal with both the bills. Thank you. Uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, the opposition uh, does not oppose this measure. It, as has been described, is a measure that uh, has actually been dealt with in the parliament previously, other than for the time of its implementation, uh, when, of course, uh, the government originally proposed uh, to commence this process of uh, airlines uh, collecting these fees on the 1st of January 1995, which at a time was a time that uh, would have uh, uh, been completely impossible for the airline industry, in particular, uh, to uh, make the necessary adjustments to their ticketing procedures. <clears throat> it would appear, in fact, that uh, notwithstanding that it was the coalition who uh, forced the government to change from the 1st of January uh, to the 1st of July, uh, that there is still some doubt as to the capacity of the airlines to transfer on this date, because we note that we're going to maintain uh, the, um, uh, the booths for another 12 months. And uh, that, of course, will be at substantial cost to the revenue, which is uh, not mentioned in the uh, financial impact uh, statement associated with the second reading speech. Uh, on the other hand, I assume that they're taking the point that uh, the matter has already been uh, is already a matter of cost, and uh, uh, will uh, will just continue as such. But uh, whilst we thought it appropriate that the airlines be given six months, uh, I'm sure we'd question why they has to be another proposition over 12 months. Uh, many of us would be aware that it is a fairly simple process in many other countries where uh, you approach the, um, uh, the, the departure counter and check in with your luggage and they say to you, the tax is so and so and you pay it on the spot. Now obviously the preferred position is to have uh, the amount of money paid. It's easier for the, uh, the client if it is included in the charge when you uh, a purchase a ticket, uh, but it would appear to me that uh, the second option would be uh, to collect it as people check in if they fail to do so, which might be a good reason why the booths are not required. It's clearly a very expensive matter, and for a long time I think the government avoided this very sensible decision because of threats of industrial action relative to those operating in the booths. We've apparently got over that, but uh, one might wonder if it's the need uh, to service the community or some deal has been done uh, that another 12 months be paid uh, for something that would appear on the face of it to no longer be necessary. But uh, we uh, will leave that maybe to the, the second parliamentary secretary to explain. Uh, as has been uh, uh, mentioned, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, uh, the bill uh, in particular uh, deals uh, with, with the uh, procedures to impose this charge and to require the airlines to uh, collect it. And uh, I guess the most other notable thing about it is that uh, there has been a reduction in the number of people who are exempt from the charge. There used to be 24 categories, and now that's been reduced to 12. The minister, uh, the secretary, did list those in his second reading speech, but I'll choose just to refer to them briefly, uh, quite properly. Children under the Years of 12, uh, age of 12 years, and uh, traditional inhabitants of the Torres Strait, <coughs> which uh, is apparently the result of a treaty we have with people whom I thought were Australians, 
but uh, if there is such a treaty, we have a responsibility uh, to honour it. Members, the Defence Force uh, is uh, probably a simplification. Uh, where they're, they're, these are the members of the Defence Force of other countries uh, is quite appropriate and is undertaken in the course of duty and is on an aircraft or ship of a defence force. So that uh, would be quite appropriate uh, in every rega uh, regard. And of course, spouses and children of such defence members are also exempt. Uh, crew members of ships and aircraft departing Australia on that ship or aircraft, spouses and children of crew members travelling aboard the same ship. Uh, positioning crew members, uh, that is passengers or ships or aircraft to depart from Australia in order to become crew members or on that or another ship or aircraft. This category of passenger would include, for example, uh, airline personnel who travel on an aircraft as passengers from Sydney to Honolulu and then took over the crew of, as crew of the aircraft on the Honolulu to Los Angeles leg of the journey. And again, uh, that makes um, in infinite good sense. Transit passengers are another group who will not impose the costs on, the, on the Australia that for which these charges are raised. Emergency passengers, that is persons who arrive in Australia because of an emergency on board their ship or aircraft. Passengers on board cruise type journeys that involve multiple departures from Australia where the charge is already being paid with respect to a previous departure. Diplomatic and consular representatives and members of certain international organisations. And finally, passengers who depart for Area A of the Australia-Indonesia zone of cooperation in order to, to prospect for petroleum or undertake petroleum operations. Uh, the um, point that I started to make uh, incorrectly at the beginning of those, that list uh, was the reference to defence forces. Of course, Australian defence forces uh, who are travelling on official duty will no longer be exempt from the charge. And uh, this, of course, uh, raises the question. I guess it's simpler, uh, but it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, it's purely a round robin uh, of payments, very similar to the way uh, the government applies uh, the fringe benefit tax to itself. And I'm not really sure if it's a good idea, but uh, as one who has a portfolio interest in the uh, Australian Defence Forces, I'm wondering if there is an appropriate refund coming uh, from this particular charge or whether it's just another backdoor way of reducing outlays on defence. And I've got a feeling it might be the second, and of course the uh, parliamentary secretary should have a substantial interest in that, considering uh, the makeup of his own constituency, and I trust he will be making representations to see that uh, the amount of money involved is refunded as it's supposed to be with fringe benefit tax, where again, as I now understand it, a full uh, <coughs> recoup of uh, fringe benefit tax levied are not necessarily uh, repaid uh, to the Defence Department. The bills will also tighten the exemption category relating to transit passengers, and this is expected to raise an additional $1.5 million in 95-96. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have no further comments to make on the bill. As I said, primarily it's a bill that's been uh, introduced uh, or the matters have been dealt with by the parliament previously. Uh, we think it uh, is a sensible uh, proposition that uh, uh, this so sort of collection should be uh, used. It uh, is much more convenient to passengers and uh, it should represent an administrative saving uh, to the government, which is worthwhile, with no substantial cost to the airlines involved. Uh, nevertheless, I do make the point again that in the circumstances of us extending the um, uh, the start-up date by six months in previous legislation uh, that I'm surprised that it's thought necessary to maintain the booths for another 12 months. I think that should be monitored because I can assure uh, the parliamentary secretary that uh, people don't enjoy running from one place to another to get those stamps on their tickets and uh, they will be demanding of the airlines that they provide this service much quicker than that. And uh, it would be very, very silly to find ourselves in a situation where we're manning booths all around Australia and practically nobody's using them. Thank you, Mr Deputy. The question Speaker. is that this bill be now read. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Fadden. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's not my intention to delay the House tonight because uh, this uh, bill has um, been before the House previously. Can I just say, though, that uh, the history of this particular charge had its genesis in 1978 
with a recommendation of a $10 departure tax, which was designed to fund tourism promotion for Australia. We know the history that's gone on through that, but what I find interesting is that since 1978 there have been a number of us who have been uh, uh, standing by the original recommendation that was made that uh, while a $10 departure tax should be imposed, it should be collected by the airlines. And I'm glad that after a, a brawl of some 17 years that finally the airlines are going to collect the charge for us. And as the previous speaker said, we get rid of those dreadful cages, which are quite frankly, I think, uh, one of the greatest turn-offs that we have to present to international visitors who are coming to Australia. It, there is a, a change in the nature of the charge as well, of course. The uh, $27 now is very much a passenger movement charge, whereas the original concept of the $10 departure tax, which was designed initially to promote tourism, ended up in general revenue. At least now we have a, a true system of, as, of user pays, and uh, I appreciate that. Can I say that it's always a little bit of a worry when uh, these charges are tucked away, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we do monitor the rate of payment uh, on this particular charge. Once you do get a hidden charge, uh, it is possible to uh, have it increased by stealth, and the one thing that we don't want to do, of course, is to make ourselves non-competitive in world terms. And uh, we're not there yet. I mean, in fact, the passenger movement charges in a place like Heathrow in, in, uh, in London are much, much higher than they are here. They're about £40. Pounds. And uh, indeed, if you go through Europe and the United States, which also have passenger handling charges incorporated in the price of tickets, Australia is about an average. But we must be absolutely sure that we don't let that get out of hand. Because we are seeing a tremendous increase in the number of people coming to Australia, and we are seeing a moderate increase in the number of Australians going overseas, so the revenue that is coming in is quite considerable. Can I say, too, that with the projected growth that is going to happen, there is going to be an awful uh, strain put on some of our infrastructure. And uh, earlier today, of course, we were talking about uh, uh, the proposals about the de future development of Kingswood Smith Airport and Sydney West Airport. That's only one area where the strains are going to come. In my home state of Queensland, of course, uh, we are seeing enormous growth in Brisbane Airport, which is one of the fastest growing airports in Australia, and indeed in Cairns and in Coolangatta. And uh, when the privatisation process is duly over, I'm sure that uh, some of the first moves that are going to have to be made is to make sure that we have the capacity to be able to handle the number of international visitors coming through those gateways. Can I also say that uh, in terms of the passenger handling charges, while that might help in a direct sense, the government is also going to have to look at what they might do with the infrastructure uh, behind uh, the airport, and I refer to things like hotels. We have an amazing situation happening in Australia at the moment where, uh, in a city like Brisbane, it is almost impossible to get a hotel room where, during the week, uh, the major hotels are reporting 100 per cent occupancy rates, 85 per cent of weekends. It's a similar situation on the Gold Coast. It's a similar situation in far north Queensland. And we've got a real difficulty because the developers are uh, saying that, unfortunately, with new hotels and even with the loadings uh, that are going into those hotels, uh, they don't stack up economically. And I would hope that uh, uh, one of the things the future governments might do is, some, is, is to look at some way that we can encourage uh, further investment in the hotel industry, because if we don't, we're just not going to be able to handle the volume of traffic that is out there potentially to come to Australia. But I welcome the changes to the method of collection. I welcome the fact that this is now a, a true user pays principle, and I welcome the fact that after 17 years the airlines are finally going to collect it. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, the member for O'Connor commented that airlines should collect at the time of checking in. Uh, this course of action has not been taken as airlines do not currently have the cash collection or handling facilities at airport check-in counters. Uh, setting up such a system and, uh, for the first 12 months would be a considerable cost to the airlines, and while they are making their best efforts to collect at the time of sale of the ticket. As the booths that currently have the necessary collection facilities, maintenance of the booths for 12 months to protect the revenue uh, to be collected is a reasonable compromise, and I'm sure that uh, most uh, members would agree with that. With respect to his second comment about the, uh, about the Defence Forces, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, uh, I don't know what he's getting at there. Australia's deployed one battalion of combat troops since Vietnam to Somalia since 1972. It's now 1995. We send some students overseas to various courses. We have deployed a few people to Cambodia. 
and Rwanda and Mozambique, if you're suggesting to the House that this additional charge of $2 extra per departure tax is going to impact on the defence budget, you have no credibility at all. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, whilst I support the, uh, the uh, submissions made by honourable members, I just wanted to make that point so far as the defence forces are concerned, of whom I am continually vigilant. The question is that this bill be narrowed. No, no you've, 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 had your, you've had your go. The honourable member for O'Connor, and we won't have a debate now. We'll put the bill. The, the question, order, order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading: a bill for an act to amend the Passenger Movement Charge Act 1978 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading? The Mr. Honourable Speaker. the Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. The, the Honourable the Member O'Connor. A third Briefly reading, Mr. because there seems to be some differing point of view, and uh, mm. I'll take it uh, that I'm a fool if the notes provided to me are wrong, but I will read again the notes provided to me on the issue of whether the Australian Defence Forces are now confronting an additional what I would consider substantial cost to their expenses. I'm told the bills will eliminate a number of exemption categories that were available under the old system. For example, members of the ADF travelling on official duty will no longer be exempt from the charge. Now, not the $2, the, 20, the $27. They will now pay the $27, and I assume from that advice that I receive here that they previously paid nothing because they were exempt. And of course, if uh, the parliamentary secretary doesn't believe there is a fairly significant movement of people, I'm not talking about battalions going overseas. They're more than likely going to go on a, uh, an air force jet anyway. I'm talking about the people as part of our defence operation who travel back and forward to England and to other countries, uh, be it on the business of uh, uh, buying or being involved in bringing back ships and other things, or go there on training. I was uh, at a dinner last night with a young uh, Air Force person who is just being transferred to England, and presumably the ADF will now pay $27 per ta departure tax. Now, it's not a huge deal. I just made one point which I would have thought the um, uh, the parliamentary secretary would have had some interest in considering his constituency, and that is that whatever the amount of money is that's being taken from the ADF, that it be given back. And if you don't believe in that, I'd welcome you saying something about it. The submission made by the honourable member is quite spacious. I addressed these issues in my uh, second reading speech. The fact is, they'll now pay the $27. All right, all right. I take it that that's your winding up speech. Too. You, you, order, order, order. Look, let's have a bit of order here. Honourable Member for O'Connor, I take it you're finished. Parliamentary Secretary, I take it that you're finished. Right, OK. Uh, the question now is that this bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Passenger Movement Charge Act 1978 and for related purposes. Uh, the clerk. Order of the day number six, Passenger Movement Charge Collection Amendment Bill, motion for second reading. The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Speaker, Secretary. I move that this bill be now read a second time. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Passenger Movement Charge Collection Act 1978 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading? Um, the Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Passenger Movement Charge Collection Act 1978 and for related purposes. The clerk. Next order of the day, aircraft noise levy bill, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by the honourable member for Hume. Order, I, before the debate is resumed on this bill, I inform the House that in the main committee this bill and the Aircraft Noise Levy Collection Bill 1995 have been declared cognate bills, and an amendment to the motion for the second reading of this bill has been moved by the Honourable Member for Hume to omit all words after that with a view to substituting other words in the term circulated. The immediate question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for 
Isaac, sorry, Isaac. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I have a great deal of concern about this bill. Um, it seems to me that uh, it's been designed to solve a problem, a problem at Kingsford Smith Airport in Sydney. And in fact, if one reads the uh, explanatory memorandum, uh, it becomes quite clear because, in fact, uh, it goes through a criteria and talks about uh, the method by which airports can be declared. And uh, in fact, if I read uh, a section of this, it says, at this time, only Sydney Kingsford Smith Airport meets these criteria. Now, I've got to say that I have no difficulty with the concerns of people um, with airport noise. And, uh, in fact, I listened to the contribution uh, from the member for Watson, who's in the chamber at the moment, and others who live in the area and uh, had raised the concerns about the additional runway and, and the concerns of the people uh, in their particular electorates. But what uh, does concern me a great deal is that when one looks at the level of noise that uh, is being emitted in and around the Sydney airport, um, the noise contour levels have been based on projections to the year 2010. Now that, um, in the first place, gives me a great deal of concern because uh, when I compare the levels of noise there to the noise that some of my constituents are facing at the Moorabbin airport, um, and noise levels that are being faced this day, not in the year 2010, um, then I have to raise a couple of questions. Firstly, um, when we look at the uh, noise levels and the noise contour levels that are set out by the government in this for, um, for in fact, schools, uh, we have a level of 20 to 24. Now, I have a school, Parkdale Secondary College, that's in uh, my electorate that is in a flight path of uh, one of the runways at Moorabbin, that is in fact in a contour level above that and is going to get absolutely no benefit whatsoever out of this piece of legislation. If the legislation was set up to look after airports across Australia, I'd be prepared to, to look at it and accept it. The problem that I have, of course, is the, um, that it's not. And uh, why can't the people of Moorabbin uh, be taken into consideration this be with this? Because uh, in this particular piece of legislation, we've looked at jets as being the basis upon which um, which the levy will be uh, applied, and we've looked at it uh, on a number of categories of jets: uh, on the 747-400, the 767-300, the 737-400, the A300 and the BAE 146, and frankly, uh, as the uh, member for Fadden raised earlier in this debate, I've got a few concerns about it being applied to the BAE 146 because it's one of the quieter aircraft um, around these days, and in fact a, a lot of its design work was done to enable it to get into airports uh, uh, at all hours of day. And uh, in fact, uh, it does in any other part of the world except uh, under this uh, legislation that's before the House at the moment. Now, when you go back to uh, the type of aircraft that are flying into Moorabbin, they don't fit these categories of the jets. They are smaller aircraft. In many cases, they are older aircraft. They fly in at a lower altitude. They fly out when they exit the airport area at a lower altitude. They're therefore, uh, because of their oldness and their slowness in speed, over the houses for a longer period of time. I heard uh, some comments in the debate about uh, 60 aircraft an hour flying over, over Sydney, uh, Sydney's population. I mean, we've got at Moorabbin one of the largest uh, air traffic uh, patterns in the Southern Hemisphere as far as small aircraft go. Uh, in fact, you can have up to two. We've had up 220 plus aircrafts per hour. You know, I really do have to raise the question that whether if this is being done in the interest of all people in Australia, um, whether in fact the uh, considerations are being taken for, for people at other airports other than Sydney. And if it's only being taken in consideration for the Sydney airport, then one has to raise the question whether this is being seen as a political solution for the population around Sydney Airport and just for Sydney to solve and pacify the people in electorates of the Labor mates 
or whether in fact uh, um, they have even given consideration to anybody else uh, in the country with respect to this. Now, I have to, say, uh, have to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that if you go back to the report, the uh, House of Representatives Select Committee report on aviation noise in 1985 and look at the noise contour levels around airports. I mean, there were high levels of noise around Sydney Airport at that stage. Um, we had uh, in the 25 to 30 category area 22,708 homes that had been listed. There were in the 30 to 35 category uh, 7,863, and in the 35 to 40 noise contour level, level uh, 2,242 houses, and over 40 noise contour levels. 565. I mean, that was in 1985. Ten years advanced, all of a sudden we're seeing the government taking an interest in uh, noise contour levels, and only for one airport. It does sort of smell a little bit, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It smells of, uh, of an interest in one particular airport and not consideration for people in other areas. Now, I'd have to say to you that that I would have obviously some concerns. Um, about levies being applied on some of the aircraft that would fly in and out of Moorabbin. I think they're paying a reasonable contrib contribution in uh, other pieces of legislation that have passed before this House in past times. But it, um, it seems to me that if we're looking and talking about considerations of, of people in this community, then it must be taken into account um, that people in, air in airports such as Moorabbin are being substantially disadvantaged. The legislation will not provide at any stage, unless we have a, a mass uh, input of jet aircraft into Moorabbin, for consideration of these um, uh, noise contour levels to be taken into account, mm. uh, for, for people to be compensated. And I haven't looked at the houses. I mean, there's 250 plus houses that are affected uh, between the 25 and uh, 20 and 25 level of contours, and above that between the um, uh, the 25 and 30 odd level. There's uh, some 50 odd houses affected at Moorabbin Airport, um, but the one that particularly concerns me is the high school, at a level currently a level at a level of noise contour that is in fact uh, fitting into the category that will be taken into consideration at Sydney Airport, misses out totally for any consideration. Now I would have thought that the students at Parkdale High School have just got just as much uh, or should have just as much importance in allowing them to complete a good education with uh, the appropriate amount of insulation to the school as would any of the schools in Sydney uh, but this piece of legislation doesn't uh, allow that sort of insulation to occur at that school now we're not looking at uh, small amounts of money mr uh, mr deputy speaker i mean when you look at the uh, at the amount uh, Originally it was $180 million, it's up to something like $260-odd million now. I haven't got the specific piece of paper in front of me, but um, it's a considerable amount of money that's going to be put in to look after this problem. And uh, I would urge the government uh, to look at what in fact they're not doing for electorates other than those in Sydney and say to them that I can see absolutely nothing in this piece of legislation except a cynical exercise to politically look after Labor members of parliament in this place and Labor seats for the next election. I can see absolutely no other reason for this piece of legislation. If there was another reason, then the kids in the schools in my electorate would be protected uh, in the manner that they're going to be protected in Sydney. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm uh, pleased on this occasion to follow the uh, member for Isaacs because uh, the uh, contribution that I want to make in the very brief time available to me is very much along the lines of uh, the uh, comments that he made. I support the bill, but I don't uh, think that it goes anywhere near far enough. The legislation uh, effectively only applies to jet aircraft, and I happen to uh, uh, represent an area of Australia which uh, abuts an airport called Parafield in South Australia. Parafield happens to be 
the second busiest airport in this country in terms of takeoffs and landings. The reason for that is that in the 1980s the uh, state government uh, established their uh, or agreed to the establishment by a private organisation of uh, a, uh, an aviation college, which is day by day becoming busier and busier and more successful. And the outcome for my constituents, or many of my constituents, has been absolutely horrendous. The problem that they have is certainly equal in terms of the impairment of their uh, enjoyment and amenity of their houses. The enjoyment of the amenity of their houses is equal to that suffered at people, by people in the uh, Sydney area suffering the uh, result of aircraft noise at Mascot. The difference is that uh, with light planes at Parafield, it is a constant drone. Boom! About every two minutes, one minute, they get this constant drone all day. And this is a, an absolutely horrendous uh, problem for people, particularly people who uh, are elderly or people who, uh, who uh, are shift workers, and although there are curfews, there is very little let up. Weekend, public holidays, on it goes. And uh, I certainly don't think it's good enough to uh, have legislation that simply concentrates on Sydney Airport. We should have had legislation that protected constituents across the nation, regardless of whether they, uh, they are uh, affected by Archerfield or Moorabbin or Parafield or wherever else. And uh, I certainly would urge the government to uh, take seriously this plea. The people that I represent are mightily aggrieved by this. They feel that uh, their uh, rights to enjoy their houses in uh, the manner in which they expected to be able to enjoy them have been taken away from them by the establishment of the Aviation College. And I think that uh, it is urgently necessary that we do something to relieve the pain and suffering that these people uh, have been afflicted with. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Bradfield. Uh, McPherson. McPherson, McPherson. Did it be speaker? That contribution really was quite typical of the contributions we've had from government members, including the member for Watson and the main committee earlier today. And it really it really is quite hypocritical. I mean you are the government. You are the government. I mean this is your legislation. Now, well, well if, you, if there's a problem with it, and, and that's our point, that was, the, that was the member for Isaac's point, and it, it's my point, it was the member for Fadden's point, is that this is lousy legislation. Now, you, you're, 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 you're bringing it before us. Now, the, Mr. the member for Watson, uh, in his contribution to the May committee, made, made, right, a, pa right. made a pathetic attempt. And I, I know I, I, he was jumping up and down, he was red in the face, made a pathetic attempt to deflect from himself and his colleagues any blame at all for the current situation around Sydney. Now, I, I want to, he, he knows that that's not the case. In fact, he and his colleagues are entirely responsible for the situation that exists at Sydney Airport at the moment. Well, he tries to blame us for the third runway. Where was, where was he voting when the legislation was approved to go ahead with the third runway? He was over there voting for it. Voting for it, and he, and he tries and he tries to shift the blame. The fact is that he and his colleagues that he mentioned, Mr. Punch and Mr. Brereton, and the minister, um, get up and got up and ranted and raved about why the third runway shouldn't be built. But when it came to a vote, they voted in favour of it over on that side of the house. And so the, the, it's, it's hypocrisy for, for them to, to talk that way, as the member for Watson, Chief Government Whip, did in the main committee earlier today. As much as it's hypocritical for the parliamentary secretary who happens to have an electorate that's affected by aircraft noise to come here and talk about the inadequacies of this legislation when he, he represents the government. Well, let him come. Well, I assume that it, he's not going to have any more the courage of his convictions than the member for Watson did, or any other members here do, and that is vote against the legislation. Of course, they won't vote against the legislation. It's not good legislation, and that's the point that you, that's the point that we're making here in this debate. It's it's your fault. It's your fault. It's a minister's fault that we have this problem at Sydney Airport. 
It's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the minister for it's the current minister's fault simply because the arrangements that have been put in place in respect to Sydney Airport suit the Labor Party, and the member for Isaacs made that point. They suit the Labor Party, and that's why we've got this problem. Uh, and I dispute what the member for Watson said, and I took, I took and still take a lot of interest in airports. That there was any any understanding that that there was any understanding that the east-west runway was to be shut down. There was not. And that's a decision that you've made subsequently. And, our, and, and clearly, the part of the solution to this problem is the reopening of the east-west runway. It's, quite, it's, it's ridiculous the sort of flight paths that are in place there. You only have to go from Canberra to Sydney now any number of times uh, and have to land into the south. You go almost halfway to Brisbane to land at Sydney when you're travelling from Canberra. And uh, clearly, that's because the east-west runway has been closed down. And that has caused the problem, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That the closure, of the total closure of the, that east-west runway, is a blatant political act. And the problems that are caused now by the by the parallel runway, by the thrusting onto that runway, of all of, of all of, of all of the problems that are created by it, are people who didn't have aircraft noise at all before. And you, can't, and you can't say to them, well, the airport was there before they built their homes, because that's not the case. They didn't have that aircraft noise before, and the fact is that it could be minimised substantially for them if the east-west runway was, was reopened. And, uh, and that's really the answer to that problem. And, uh, and, I've, and, I, and I won't let them get off that easy with trying to shift the blame from themselves for the fiasco and for the minister for the fiasco that we now have at Sydney Airport. It's absolutely on your shoulders, and you can't, and you can't get out of it at all. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, um, like the member for, that spoke before from the government, the parliamentary secretary, also have, an, have a noisy airport in my electorate, and uh, so therefore I want to make a few remarks about it. Um, and, uh, the Coolangatta Airport is a very busy airport indeed, and um, unlike uh, Parafield, which the parliamentary secretary is referring to, um, it's uh, busy not only by virtue of light aircraft movements, which I agree with him, are often as intrusive for local residents as, as uh, jet aircraft or turboprop aircraft. Light aircraft can be intrusive for people, and that's certainly the case with people at Parafield and Bankstown and Moorabbin and most of the secondary airports where there are a lot of training, flight, a lot of training flights going on. Uh, and that's a complaint that I get from residents who live around Coolangatta very often. It's not always the movements of the heavier aircraft that affect them, but it's often light aircraft um, because of their persistent droning, and as the parliamentary secretary said. But, um, I want to know. Well, two, let me make a couple of points. Ask a couple of questions. I don't know if there's anyone here who's intelligent enough to answer them. I don't, who's, who's, going to, who's going to answer the questions um, with the greatest with the greatest respect with the greatest respect to the chief government whip and the other parliamentary secretary? I suspect I'll be wasting my time asking the questions. But um, the, the fact. The, but let me try. Let me try. Um, the fact is, to answer to some extent the previous questions, there is a mechanism in here whereby other airport, airports can be brought into this system. Um, the legislation actually says that if an airport is a qualifying airport at the commencement of this act, the minister may place or must place a notice in the Gazette, etc. etc. So, so I guess the question for those of us who have airports affected by aircraft noise is what, what do we have to do to qualify them? And I understand, let me sort of at least partially answer the question as I've, uh, as I've managed to find out so far, is that, um, that you have to have some noise amelioration project uh, in place for your airport and then, uh, then of course it can become a qualifying airport and then aircraft landing at that particular airport uh, will then be levied and uh, then, then, there'd be some, uh, then there would be some uh, compensation for people who are affected by aircraft noise. Um, let me say, uh, Mr. S Mr Deputy Speaker, I, uh, I have some concerns with the whole principle of this levy. I mean, besides the fact that it's in place to, simply to suit the Labor Party with its uh, situation at Sydney Airport, it really does add, of course, and it's intended to add, to the price of tickets. Um, and uh, air, air, airplane travel in this country is already expensive enough, and uh, I, I must say that I object to that mechanism. Um, and you, I suppose you'll get up and tell us it's the great user pay system and so on. But I object to the mechanism of it. In my view, the FAC, which the member for Watson 
tipped very heavily on this afternoon. The FAC could pick up the tab for it, or the government could pick up the tab for it. But I'm concerned if, in fact, we move to have Coolangatta Airport qualify as an airport uh, for this process, that that will add to the cost of uh, tickets to Coolangatta, and that's obviously not in the interests of the airline uh, of the uh, tourism industry. So I have a problem, I must say, with the whole fundamentals of this, doing it that way. I'm very concerned about aircraft noise at Coolangatta. My constituents know how much I've done to help with that problem. And I have. I've taken a very active interest. We've changed approach and departures to Coolangatta Airport. We've had the 727 aircraft, which was the, the main offender, totally, well, virt virtually banned from Coolangatta except in exceptional emergency uh, circumstances. So I claim, and my, and my constituents know, that I've done a lot to lessen the problem of aircraft noise at Coolangatta Airport. And I monitor it. I mean, I go, I talk to the to the to the, uh, to the tower. I go down and watch what happens, and I ensure that they that they are complying with the noise alleviation procedures which have been introduced. Uh, and that is that we have aircraft depart and arrive as far as possible over the water. That they remain over water as far as possible when they're arriving, and that they depart over the water as quickly as possible when they depart. I still think. Uh, there's a, there's a problem with some noisy aircraft uh, during the night, and uh, I've argued, in fact, for some sort of a curfew at Coolangatta Airport. The government, uh, the minister that I, two ministers I've taken that up with, haven't been prepared to accept that. Um, there is a need for some aircraft movement during the night. We get our newspapers early in the morning, and, and that's uh, some the aircraft that bring those in uh, different aircraft from time to time. Some are noisier than others, and we need to have our newspapers. But there are freight movements during the night that we really don't need, and I don't think need to come into the night. So I'd still argue, in fact, that there needs to be a partial uh, curfew at Coolangatta Airport, and I'll continue to pursue um, that matter. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the problem with noise at Coolangatta is still a very very serious one, and if we take um, the government's intentions in respect to Sydney Airport, then there would be every argument, indeed, for making Coolangatta a qualifying airport um, as far as uh, this levy is concerned. But let me make the point again, because I, I mean I don't want uh, I don't want the price of travel to Coolangatta to go up. So I object to the, I object to the principle of levy. But if we can find the money, I certainly. Uh, want to do something for the local residents, but not, not by virtue of this mechanism. You see, I'm in, a, I'm in a between a rock and a hard place on this particular one, as you can see. Um, but uh, in 1983, we had 86,000 aircraft movements to Coolangatta. By the year 2010, that will have doubled to 160,000 movements. As I said, we've had the 727s thrown off Coolangatta. Um, and in fact, though, with quieter aircraft, uh, the, the, the problem is being improved, but obviously with these additional aircraft movements, the cumulative noise is having an impact on residents. And we've already admitted, we've already seen the effect of cumulative noise from even light aircraft can be very intrusive. So although we've got quieter aircraft in the newer generation aircraft, the 37400s, the, the, the later versions of the 67s, the Airbuses, um, the fact is that we're going to have to put up with uh, an increasing number of movements between now and the year 2000. And I want to point out that even the 1993 ANEI, the noise index, actually shows that there are some homes surrounding Coolangatta now that are in the greater than 35, in the greater than 35 category. And these are the ones that are, that are designated or believed to be suitable for industrial use only light industrial facilities in the area should be insulated. Now, we've actually got some homes in that area, and uh, we have, in fact, uh, quite a number uh, of homes, um, in, certainly in the greater than 30, and, uh, and the fact is that, uh, for that reason, aircraft noise is a problem now, but it's going to be an even bigger problem um, uh, in the year 2010, and the Australian noise exposure forecast for that actually shows the situation to be very much worse, where I have a considerable number of homes that will be, uh, at that particular time, in the over 35, uh, a significant number in the 30 to 35 A and E, F, and, uh, and a greater number again in the 25 to 30. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, my, my point is that Coolangatta Airport is a major problem as far as noise is concerned. 
Um, it's a very busy airport. It's becoming busier all the time. And uh, for me, as uh, the member in whose electorate the airport actually half balls, the border between New South Wales and Queensland goes through the middle, um, it, uh, it remains uh, something that I need to be very concerned about for the future, as far as uh, my constituents are concerned, both my present and future constituents. Um, and I do, as I say, take a very active interest. It's no use saying to the people in this area um, that uh, the airport was there first. I don't think that's ever been a valid argument in my view. Um, the fact is that uh, many of the homes surrounding Coolangatta Airport have been there for a very long time also. And um, the point is that when people bought those homes, many of them bought them many years ago, the airport was a small airfield and uh, air aircraft noise was not, not a particular problem. And now, of course, Coolangatta has become uh, Australia's, uh, one of Australia's busiest airports. It's a very popular uh, of course, destination. It's the gateway to the Gold Coast and the uh, beautiful Gold Coast and the Tweed areas. Now, then, of course, it's, uh, it, Coolangatta Airport is a very different proposition now um, to what it was uh, some time ago. So, look, I just say to the government, I don't have much sympathy for this legislation at all. Apparently, some government members don't have either. Um, I think our, our contribution on this side has been along the lines that we believe the thing is, is largely flawed, that it's a bit of, a, it's a bit of a, a, an, a, an attempt to fix up Labor's problem with Sydney Airport. They're doing it by adding to the cost of airline travel in this country, and I don't think that's a good thing. Um, and uh, in the end, I hope that uh, the people um, around uh, that travel on aircraft will come to realise just what a mess of Sydney Airport has been made by this government. The, Im the immediate question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, the question now is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose a levy on the landing of jet aircraft at certain airports. I understand the wish of the House to consider this bill in detail. Um, is that agreed to? Yes. yes. Um, the question is that uh, the honourable member for Hume. Hmm? Huh? Agree the question first. is that, the, that this bill be agreed to. The honourable member for Hume. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I rise uh, this evening uh, to uh, move uh, an amendment um, circulated in my name under the Aircraft Noise Levy Bill 1995. Uh, and for the purposes of the House, I'll just ring, read out that amendment. Clause 6, page 3, lines 3 to 6. Omit paragraph B, substitute the following paragraph with B, if the amount applies in relation to a landing made in a later financial year, 110 per cent of the amount that was provided for by regulation in relation to a landing in the immediately preceding financial year. Now, that is our amendment that I now move, Mr Deputy Speaker, and to explain it, because if you just read the amendment you wouldn't have the faintest idea what it meant. Um, uh, to explain it further, the, the whole purpose of this uh, bill that we've been debating since uh, this morning in the second chamber, and uh, my colleagues uh, uh, have just been uh, debating uh, in this uh, chamber this evening, is designed to raise money to pay for the insulation of houses surrounding uh, Sydney Airport, and uh, a very substantial amount of money in the order of $200 odd million dollars and um, in order to, uh, to facilitate the raising of that money, the government has introduced this Aircraft Noise Levy Bill 1995, which will be the vehicle through which the monies to pay for the insulation of these houses around Sydney Airport that are so adversely affected by the government's totally dishonest and incompetent handling of the second parallel runway at Sydney's Mascot Airport. The, um, the vehicle to raise that money is this bill. Now, the government is proposing that at the completion of each financial year that the levy per unit be increased by 10 per cent. Now, this is a, an amendment that we are making. Our amendment uh, that we have just moved uh, affects the way in which this 10 per cent increase is to apply. Now, for example, 
as I understand it, the government has indicated that the maximum levy that will apply for this year coming up is $180 per unit. And we heard earlier this morning in the second chamber that the government intends to actually apply a unit of $155. Uh, so the government then proposes in the second and subsequent years to increase the levy by 10 per cent. Now, where we have a difficulty is they propose to apply the increase on t at 10 per cent on the maximum levy that could have been charged rather than the actual levy that was charged. And so in the case that we're discussing, the actual levy that could have been the, the levy that could have been charged would be $180. So a 10 per cent increase on that would be $18. The actual levy that the government has announced that will be charged is $155. And so a 10 per cent increase on that would be $15.50. Now, what will actually happen is that the government will apply the 10 per cent increase to the maximum levy that could have been charged. In other words, the $18 uh, increase will apply rather than the $15.50 increase. Now, the significance of this uh, becomes uh, greater as the compounding effect of this uh, occurs year by year. And of course, it must be remembered that, uh, that uh, aircraft won't be just charged for one unit; they will be charged for several units. And so, our amendment is designed to minimise the increases that will be imposed on the industry uh, as each year goes by, by uh, ensuring that the 10% increase is applied to the actual levy rather than the maximum levy that could have applied in that particular year. And we believe that this will save industry, the aviation industry, the tourism industry, passengers travelling, business and so forth, a considerable amount of money uh, by ensuring that the minimum increase will apply each and every year. So that's the rationale behind our decision to put this amendment and uh, I, I urge the House to support this amendment, Mr Speaker. The question is the amendment be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no.